What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If Zoro Was Reborn in JJK as Toji's Son. Part 7. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Join my membership to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Blink, blink, unable to trust his eyes for a moment, Jito froze on the spot. As soon as he regained his senses, he moved close to the wooden bars. Ah, thinking he was going to harm them, the two girls squeezed their eyes shut and cowered. Seeing their small hands trembling, Jito bit his lip and stepped back. Crunch, Zoro broke the wooden bars of the jail with his hands. Jito took off his school uniform jacket, leaving him in a white shirt. Flap, Zoro wrapped the two sisters in Jito's school uniform jacket. The sisters looked up at Zoro with stunned expressions, silently observing his cold, indifferent face. It's okay. Who are you? I'm Zoro. Zen and Zoro. That's Jito Suguru. Three villagers appeared along the passage. Jito looked at them coldly and asked, What is this? What do you mean? These two are the cause of the incidents in the village, aren't they? Deep furrows formed on Jito's forehead. These two children are the cause. Yes. These two are not right in the head. They keep saying the sacred area feels bad, or that they've seen monsters there, making ominous remarks. The first villager, a young woman, spoke vehemently, spitting as she talked. Jito's eyes narrowed. These children, are they sorcerers? Without taking his eyes off the villagers, Jito sent a small curse, shaped like a serpent through the bars, and placed it in front of the sisters. Ah, the two girls, who were looking at Zoro, turned their gaze to where the serpent curse was. They were indeed sorcerers, both of them. A middle-aged man spat in front of the jail. Their parents were the same kind of monsters. Talking to thin air? Saying you shouldn't call the sacred area by its name. Isn't it because of those two that such ominous events keep occurring in the sacred area? That's not true. According to the records reviewed in the car, disappearances and deaths had been occurring since 1998. It seemed unlikely that these two children were born before 1998. The village chief clenched his teeth. You just don't understand. These two are monsters. Just yesterday. Because of these monsters, my only granddaughter got injured. That's because she. Shut up, you damn monsters. Are you trying to ruin our village by wearing a child's skin? No matter what you say, I won't be fooled and will protect the village. Fwoosh. One of the two candles in front of Jito flickered violently as if struck by a strong wind, though both were similarly half-melted. Be quiet. Whoosh. A mighty, formless energy radiated from Zoro, spreading outwards. Jito felt a crushing pressure momentarily suffocate him. Thump rolling. The two candles in front of Jito, shaken by the vibration, fell to the ground and went out. Thump, thump, thump. As Zoro's intense aura reached the three villagers, they simultaneously rolled their eyes back and collapsed unconscious on the floor. The two girls who had been holding each other also fell unable to escape Zoro's energy. This is bad. Zoro caught the two falling children. The energy did not stop with just knocking out the two children and three villagers. It continued to spread throughout the entire village. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Like a very mild earthquake, the floorboards vibrated. Crack, crack. The surface of the wooden bars of the jail slowly crumbled and fragments fell off. Like windows shaking in a typhoon, the bars faintly vibrated. As the oppressive atmosphere dissipated and the vibrations ceased, Jito fixed his gaze on Zoro. Zoro, you? What did you just do? Zoro furrowed his brow in confusion at Jito's question. Then, looking back and forth between the unconscious villagers and the sisters behind Jito, he realized what had happened. Did it manifest? Conqueror's Haki. A type of Haki that can render people overwhelmingly weaker than the user unconscious, known as Conqueror's Haki. Typically, only those with the qualities of a king possess Conqueror's Haki, which unlike the other two types of Haki, cannot be acquired, it must be innate. Those born with it are about one in several million. Even among those born with it, not everyone can use it. The manifestation of Conqueror's Haki depends on the strength of mind and body, so even a person possessing it might never manifest it, and could die without ever doing so. When someone uses Conqueror's Haki for the first time, even the person who manifested it may not know they've used it. 
It's impossible to control who it affects or when, and often people who had no intention of harming others get involved. Just like now, I'll have to apologize later. Zoro carefully laid the two girls down comfortably. Jito pressed Zoro for answers. Tell me straight. Did you do all this? Yes. Then why these two kids? I didn't mean to knock them out too. It was just that he couldn't control it because it had been triggered unconsciously. Zoro looked at the fallen villagers and twisted his mouth. Scum, but they got lucky. If they hadn't been knocked out, he certainly would have drawn his sword and cut them all down. Some would have lost limbs. Or perhaps only a few would still have their limbs attached. Zoro averted his gaze. No matter how despicable, slicing up and killing those who are unconscious leaves a bad taste. Even though he felt like ignoring the aftertaste and just slicing them up right now Zoro kept his head cool. I shouldn't kill them. If Zoro killed all the villagers now, even if the truth came out later people would say that the punishment was too harsh compared to the crime committed. I can't let them be treated that way. They had to live and pay fully for their sins. Thoroughly. To do that, he first needed to deal with this village. Resolved, Zoro spoke to Jito. Let's call the police, Suguru. Such a village should not exist. A man with a scar stitched across his forehead was observing several police cars parked at a crossroads through binoculars. The police appeared to be sleepily gathering the day's villagers and loading them into the police cars one by one. Approaching the village would have involved several risks. So he was assessing the situation from here. Nevertheless, he had a good enough grasp of what was going on. He stroked his chin and hummed, calling the police. It was an unexpectedly straightforward approach. If they had gone on a rampage killing all the sorcerers, Zoro would have been designated a death penalty target in the sorcery community, and Jito Suguru, who would have shielded Zoro, would have been marked the same and eliminated. It would have been fine if Jito Suguru had rampaged. Becoming a fugitive, even a first-class sorcerer wouldn't last many years before being hunted down and killed by other sorcerers, and the curse technique he used was quite powerful. It was worth considering. Either way, that scenario was now dissolved. He shrugged his shoulders and cleanly erased the plan from his mind. He wasn't particularly disappointed. If he had been disheartened by every failure, he wouldn't have made it this far. Over a thousand years, he had continuously planned, acted, and failed. Anyway, more gentle than expected. Given that he was lenient towards a criminal father, he had thought perhaps Zoro couldn't recognize evil as evil. He had even prepared for the possibility that Zoro might ignore the abuse of children he hadn't met before. But that didn't seem to be the case. Is this an extension of the familial affection he shows his sister? Or perhaps it was sympathy for the weak, an inability to tolerate injustice. Either way, having such vulnerabilities wasn't necessarily a bad thing. The more gaps he had, the easier it was to exploit them. But it's a fine line to tread. Considering he cared for his killer father, he wasn't someone for whom justice or goodness was an absolute standard. He keeps defying predictions. He smirked. Really? What is it? So strong at such a young age. Not a vessel of Sukuna, nor a descendant of the heavenly restriction with zero talent, nor born with a technique comparable to the Six Eyes or anything similar. A power absolutely forbidden to a non-sorcerer in this world's laws. Is he a curse mimicking a human? No, if that were the case, Satoru Gorjo, who had faced him numerous times, would have noticed. If it were a curse, it couldn't have restrained its nature for six years. Once it had the power, it would have killed everyone, family or not. Even if it were a new type of entity, Satoru Gorjo would have known. While he was abroad, he had diligently searched for similar entities, but to no avail. Is it because he's the child of the descendant of the heavenly restriction? The descendant of the heavenly restriction is one who escapes the causal forces of talent. Ah, yes. Suddenly, he thought of someone entangled in the powerful causal forces of talent, a girl with black hair braided into a single braid, whom he had casually met once. He quickly drafted a series of plans in his mind, seriously reviewing them. It wasn't highly likely, but if he had been obsessed with likelihoods, he wouldn't have pursued such goals in the first place. Shall we try to make use of him? Since the descendant of the heavenly restriction escapes causality, and this guy also possesses an absurdly powerful force beyond the causality of talent, it might just be possible to prevent the assimilation of a growing entity. Well then, shall we write a scenario where the prince saves the princess? He lightly loosened the thread on his forehead and moved forward with a spring in his step. It was quite enjoyable. It was snowing. Zoro was looking out of the hospital window. The roof of the neighboring house, covered in snowflakes, was gradually being blanketed in its original color, white. Three children were huddled together on the hospital bed. With the two girls in patient gowns resting their small heads on his lap, Zoro sat cross-legged as they slept soundly. Normally, multiple people shouldn't lie on a hospital bed, and even guardians shouldn't climb onto the bed with patients. 
However, the two girls were extremely afraid of being separated, and they became very anxious and trembled if anyone approached when neither Jito nor Zoro was nearby. Thus, Zoro had no choice but to sit on the bed where the two were lying. The girl with the darker hair called up. Zoro recalled the names of the two he had heard earlier. As expected, they were sisters. The one with the darker hair color was Hasaba Mamiko. The other was Hasaba Nanako. Mommy Mamiko murmured in her sleep. Zoro looked down at them and silently pulled the blanket a bit higher over Mamiko. He turned his head to look at the door of the room. It slid open, and Jito entered carrying a bag full of something. Zoro Zoro put his finger to his lips with a shush, signaling for silence. Realizing the situation, Jito closed his mouth and approached quietly. Zoro wrote in the air with his finger on the bed. Ash, what were you doing? Jito wrote back in the air with his finger. Ash talking with the assistant director. The assistant director accompanying them this time, Shikinji Masato, had been involved in the sorcery community for quite some time and handled the case somewhat mechanically but rationally. Shito, massaging his throbbing head, recalled what Shikinji had said. While it's possible to heal them instantly with a reverse technique by asking Ms. Yeri, we first need a doctor's diagnosis. Child abuse is often disguised as discipline. Cigarette burns, bruises on the face and body, fractured legs, malnutrition speaking with the doctor. It seems all are textbook symptoms of child abuse. So, prosecution is possible. I'm not sure how many villagers will be charged, though. As you might know, this country does not prosecute unless guilt is certain. Fortunately, a majority of the villagers confessed. They claim these two children were the cause of the recent deaths and the curse. To the police, that will sound absurd, so many will be charged. Administrative measures will also be taken to prevent them from approaching the children. By the way, did you purify the curse suspected of causing the death incidents? I understand you might want to look away, but you must go with Mr. Zenin and take care of it. With many villagers likely to be prosecuted, if we leave the curse, it will feed on their negative emotions and grow stronger. Then, the curse might reach special class and target other villagers as well. You need to become desensitized, Mr. Jito. If you want to be a sorcerer for a long time, need to become desensitized to what? To the harm sorcerers suffer at the hands of non-sorcerers. Because of ignorant fools, do I have to keep watching as my colleagues and juniors get hurt and die? For how long? I never expected non-sorcerers to recognize or reward the efforts of sorcerers. Suguru. But for the reasons of seeing, the fighting. If this is how they're treated in return Suguru, poke. Zoro poked Jito's forehead with his finger. Snapped out of his reverie, Jito looked up at Zoro. Facing Zoro's calm grey eyes, Jito unconsciously unclenched his fists. Mem mem. The children, stirred by Zoro's voice, opened their eyes. Suguru quickly softened his expression and said, Did you wake up? Sorry about that. It's okay. It had been a long time since the sisters had slept on someone's lap. Mimiko looked back and forth between Zoro and Jito her eyes sparkling with curiosity. Should I call you Mr. Zenin, Mr. Jito? No, that's a bit too formal, isn't it? It feels a bit much to hear from kids who are only about 10 years younger than Jito even Zoro isn't much older than these girls. Zoro and Jito exchanged glances. What was that about talking to the assistant director earlier? Nothing. It's not important. Hum, Zoro grinned slyly. You're hiding something. Is he using mind reading? Jito glared at Zoro for pointing it out so bluntly in front of the kids. The sisters looked at Jito with wavering eyes, and Jito relaxed his expression and sighed. Just. We originally came here with a purpose. He was vague, but Zoro understood he meant the curse they hadn't purified yet. I'll go alone. You stay here. Technically, the mission was assigned to me. You're just support. So if anyone goes, I should go alone. That's not happening. Sending Zoro alone was like asking to be grabbed by the collar by Toji. Shito became serious, and Zoro shrugged. Then there's no helping it. The problem was the children. They seem to have already grasped the situation, their eyes welling up with tears. Are you going somewhere? We have something we need to do. Will you come back? Jito bent his knees to meet their gaze, and spoke in a gentle voice. Of course. It's just a quick task we need to handle. I'll ask another uncle to watch over you. And just in case, I'll leave something to protect you. Jito then took out a female curse with a torn mouth. Among the subdued curses, it was the least grotesque, although it would show a ghastly appearance if it fought, and looked more human-like. Nanako looked at Zoro. When their eyes met, Zoro spoke bluntly. I promise, I'll come back to you. Jito, who had rarely seen Zoro make promises, looked a bit surprised. But not fully grasping the significance, he continued with a smile. Is there anything you want? I'll buy it on the way back. Nanako mumbled and then spoke softly. Come back soon. Jito hesitated, then responded affirmatively. Yeah. Looking down at the arms covered with yellow, 
blue and red bruises, Jito's heart felt constricted. He couldn't be sure what the right answer was. Jito stood absently inside the village's stalactite cave. The cave was beautiful enough to be a tourist attraction, if it weren't located in such a secluded place. Belong. White stalactites sparkled as they caught the light from the flashlight Jito was holding. However, he wasn't really taking in the scenery. Boom. The right half of a curse, composed of stalactite, and its left half resembling a human, was sent flying into the cave wall by Zoro's slash. The stalactite part of the curse broke apart, but it promptly got up and regenerated its half-body. The curse raised its hand. As it lowered its hand, the sharp stalactites in the cave fell all at once. Bang, 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 bang. With a whoosh, a giant squid curse appeared and knocked the falling stalactites away from above Zoro's head. I didn't need to be shielded. With this level of power and speed, it was possible to avoid even getting grazed by the stalactites and simply walk through the rain of stalactites. Tap, tap. A few small fragments of stalactite fell on Jito's head. Zoro frowned, seeing this. It seemed like Jito was not fully focused on the fight. Shy, 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 shin. Plea, 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 please. R R R R no, it's BBB because of you. It's because of you the curse, emitting a strange voice, wrapped white energy around its stalactite arm. Sensing the energy and strong malice with his haki, Zoro looked frustrated, so indecisive. It was a mixed, ambiguous feeling. Zoro had encountered a special class curse that could erupt spikes before, and this one felt like a downgrade. A bit of thought, but that was all. Flash. The curse fainted a charge at Zoro, then suddenly turned towards Jito. Zoro shook his head dismissively. Idiot. He should have just run away instead of attacking either side. Sigh, 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 sir. The curse made a strange noise as it lunged toward Jito. Coldly, Jito's eyes met the curses, as if he wasn't troubled enough already. This is annoying. Crunch. Jito grabbed the curse's arm and ripped it off. Climbing on top of the fallen curse, Jito slammed his fist down on it. Clang. The shoulder part made of stalactite shattered. Again, Jito raised his fist as if entranced. Clang. Bang. Crash. Smack. Jito, his body enveloped in energy, relentlessly pounded the curse. He pummeled every part, whether made of stalactite or not. Observing traces of Toji's hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques in Jito's movements, Zoro thought he had learned well. As the curse collapsed, exhausted and unconscious, Jito stood up from atop it. Although martial arts was his hobby, this was the first time he had beaten a curse to death with his fists. It was inefficient and messy. Zoro sheathed his sword and said, You seem preoccupied, Suguru. Was it that obvious? It shows. Jito was slightly slower in his responses than usual. If the disparity in skill between Jito and the curse hadn't been so great, being mentally elsewhere during a fight would not be good. If you have doubts, cut them off and come back. Nothing is weaker than an attack filled with hesitation. Hearing Zoro's words, Jito rubbed his forehead and sighed. If doubts could be cut off just by wanting to, would they even be doubts? But saying this, Zoro would probably reply, I can cut them off. No, perhaps there shouldn't have been any doubts in the first place. Thinking too deeply isn't his style. You're simple, Zoro. That must be nice. Ha! Huh. Never mind. Jito reached toward the fallen curse. The unconscious curse transformed into a black, round bead, which Jito grabbed. Gulp. Jito swallowed the bead. The sensation was like swallowing a rag used to clean up vomit a repulsive sensation crawling down his throat. Watching this, Zoro asked Jito, taste good. Jito hesitated. It was the first time Zoro had asked such a question. Why do you ask? If it's tasty, I might try some. Mad absolutely not. Jito jumped. It's awful. Horribly awful. It tastes like vomit itself. Plus, a curse's body is highly toxic. If you eat it, you'll die. Just getting close to a curse could harm a non-sorcerer, let alone eating it. It's abnormal for a human like Toji to swallow curses nonchalantly. A non-sorcerer would die. Oh, really? That sounds painful. Zoro promptly gave up the idea of eating a curse. Then why do you eat it? I have to do it this way to control the curse. Only by forming the curse into a bead and swallowing it does the subjugation complete. Zoro frowned. Is that okay? Tastes like vomit. Must be disgusting. Jito fell silent for a moment before finally saying, It's okay. It doesn't seem like it. Logically, swallowing such things every day couldn't possibly be okay. If it were Luffy, he would undoubtedly be bouncing around yelling. It tastes awful. Every time he swallowed. Moreover, Zoro, while not as perceptive as Luffy or a gourmet chef, could still sense emotions to some extent with his observation haki. That's how he knew Jito was lying. Jito sighed. It seemed nothing just passed by simply. Zoro, are you really not using mind reading? You just made it too obvious with your lie. Having been colleagues with some of the greatest liars in a previous life, Zoro calmly recalled the face of a long-nosed friend who constantly spun obvious lies. If you're tired, you can rest. 
How old was Jito now? 15. If he was 15, that's the same age Chopper was when he first joined the crew. That made it clear just how young Jito was. Of course, Chopper was a reindeer, so this was considering human age equivalency. Jito, looking tired, flicked off pieces of stalactite from his school uniform. Everyone is working hard. I can't be the only one to rest. Gorjo, Shoko, Yaga, Meimei, Yuterm, and many other sorcerers. Even Toji, whether stronger or weaker than Jito, was working hard. You've become a sorcerer too. It was absurd to think that Jito alone could rest, especially when even a much younger Zoro had started acting as a sorcerer. The higher-ups wouldn't just let him be. Zoro shrugged. I don't really think of myself as a sorcerer. And I'm doing this because I want to. He wanted to fight and become stronger. But in this world, particularly in this country, public safety was too stable, leaving no opponents for a non-sorcerer. That's why Zoro had stepped into the sorcery world. I kind of like the classic sorcery texts anyway. If he hadn't liked it, no matter what anyone said, he wouldn't have done it. It's not like he didn't have the power to refuse. If Zoro had said he didn't want to be a sorcerer, Toji would have definitely respected his wishes. But it didn't seem like Jito was practicing sorcery because he wanted to. At least not now. Jito rubbed his forehead as if tired. Is what I want important? It's important. Whether a pirate or a marine. Those who were uncertain in that aspect didn't last long. What if I say I don't want to be a sorcerer? It doesn't really matter to me. Zoro wasn't particularly on the side of sorcerers or non-sorcerers. He had personal connections with a few sorcerers. But that didn't mean he represented all sorcerers. Even if you quit being a sorcerer, you're still you, right? That wouldn't be a reason for Zoro to cut ties with Jito. Unless Jito turned into a malevolent non-sorcerer who began to harm those around Zoro. Jito chuckled softly. Despite feeling absurd, there was something comforting about the situation. Doing whatever you want. Did Toji teach you that? No. Even before he met Toji in this life, Zoro had always done things his own way. Before meeting Luffy, when Zoro was wandering alone in the East Blue, he didn't hunt civilians like a pirate would, but he also didn't dedicate himself to vanquishing evil like a marine driven by justice. Catching pirates and handing them over to the marines was just for the money. He had no particular sense of performing good deeds. It was not without reason he was called a bloodthirsty demon in the East Blue. To the unaware civilian, it might have seemed like he was indulging in slaughter without purpose. Zoro never cared what anyone called him, though. Jito was different from Zoro, who occasionally helped people. What Jito sought was not personal strength, but a correct form of society, where helping the weak was a means to achieve his goals. The problem was that he indiscriminately labeled the broad category of non-sorcerers as weak without clearly distinguishing between those he should save and those he should not. That's why it's hard. Zoro didn't save all the weak. He only saved the weak who were not enemies. If the weak were enemies, he wouldn't treat them harshly, but he wouldn't let them obstruct his path either. Jito hadn't considered the possibility that non-sorcerers, defined as weak by Jito, could become enemies of him and his fellow sorcerers. That's naive. Non-sorcerers may be weaker in personal combat than sorcerers, but physical strength is only one of many capabilities. There are countless ways to harm others without resorting to physical combat. Since the existence of sorcerers must not be revealed to non-sorcerers, sorcerers can't just indiscriminately use magic to knock down non-sorcerers. Suguru, you said an ideal society is about survival of the weak, right? And those weak are the non-sorcerers. Think about whether that's really the world you want. Just because they're non-sorcerers doesn't mean they can't harm sorcerers and you care about sorcerers more than you think. Even if they're not exceptions like Zoro or Toji, there are many ways non-sorcerers can harm sorcerers. Especially in an era where non-sorcerers far outnumber sorcerers, and their level of weaponry can compete with sorcerers' magic. Jito is not someone who thinks the strong should be sacrificed for the weak to live peacefully. He's kind. Moreover, Jito was concerned about Zoro, and thought the treatment Zoro received was unfair, not to mention the injustices and hardships his other colleagues faced. After listening quietly, Jito suddenly asked, So, what kind of world do you want, Zoro? Me? Zoro blinked. I haven't really thought about it. Ah, there is one thing, Zoro said seriously. I wish there was no legal drinking age. To have to wait until you're 20 to drink. It's like they're mocking us, is that all? Don't you have any other goals? I have a goal. To be the strongest. And what after you become the strongest? Well, then I'll probably find a new dream. Because a person's dreams never end. Do what you want, Suguru. I don't want to say that absolute freedom is always good. But right now, Jito seems too suppressed by his own ideals. It wasn't just that he was overwhelmed by their weight. 
he seemed to doubt whether these were really the ideals he wanted. Think it over carefully, Zoro added. World affairs are often too complex to be strictly categorized in one way or another. Good and evil, black and white, strong and weak, enemies and allies. Many people live somewhere in between, and their choices can change over time. There aren't many who are completely one-sided. Just because someone is good doesn't mean they are always good to everyone, and the same goes for the evil. An overwhelming strong person can lose to a seemingly insignificant weak one, depending on the compatibility of abilities. Allies can become enemies, and enemies can become allies. Luffy managed to turn them all to his side. That was a difference between Luffy and Zoro. Zoro wouldn't save someone just because they were objectively good if they were an enemy. But Luffy would save anyone he liked even if they were enemies, and ultimately turn them into allies. Good people, evil people, the strong, the weak enemies are lies. All of them. That's why Zoro was the captain, and why he was the pirate king. He ended the raging old era and ushered in the dawn of a new era. Like Luffy, Zoro possessed the conqueror's haki. But he did not have Luffy's knack for indiscriminately drawing everyone in. Probably Jito didn't have it either. That's why you have to choose whom to save. Whatever choice he made, Jito would have to bear the responsibility himself. Zoro advised Jito, who was lost in thought. Don't just talk to me and decide, talk with Satoru and others too. That white four wouldn't know what Jito was pondering unless told directly. Let's head back. The kids are waiting. Jito nodded, took Zoro's hand, and led him out of the stalactite cave. Zoro suddenly asked, what about wrapping the cursed beads in rice paper or seaweed before swallowing? Would it still be disgusting? Or maybe coating them with sugar? Caught off guard by the suggestion he'd never considered, Jito responded a bit bewilderedly. I've never tried that. Give it a shot. It must be tough always eating something you hate. Jito chuckled softly, his expression easing. All right, I'll try that. It was the moment Zoro's tumultuous first mission came to an end. When Zoro and Jito returned to Nanako and Mamiko's hospital room, Toji was waiting at the door. Father, Zoro, Nanako and Mamiko, those little ones' names, right? They're sleeping. The steady breathing coming from inside the room made that clear. Jito asked Toji, how did you know to come here, sir? The assistant director called. It was natural for the assistant director to contact a parent, especially since this was the first mission for a six-year-old sorcerer and it had turned into an unexpected situation. Thanks to that, Toji had quickly decapitated the curse, left all the cleanup to the assistant director, and rushed here at full speed. Toji crouched to meet Zoro's eye level. Any injuries? None. Toji nodded, but he quickly scanned Zoro with his green eyes, slightly anxious. After confirming that there was nothing unusual, Toji stood up and turned to Jito. Thank you. It was the first time Toji had thanked Jito. Jito shrugged. I didn't really do anything. Not true. You led the way didn't you? Ah, that's true. Suguru, you? Honestly, Zoro, your sense of direction is at the level of a thousand curses. With April approaching and Zoro soon to start elementary school, there was concern about whether he'd be able to find his classroom. Jito was sure Toji shared that concern. Toji crossed his arms. I've heard roughly what happened. The villagers of the mountain village were abusing those kids, stupidly thinking they were responsible for the acts of a curse. You discovered it, reported it to the police and they all ended up in handcuffs. You went back to decapitate the curse. Jito nodded. Toji's green eyes dimmed slightly, then looked down at Zoro and asked, Do you think it was intentional? What? That this was said as your first mission. Jito's eyes widened, then his face twisted in anger. Don't tell me. The higher-ups knew about this case and assigned Zoro this mission. It's not certain yet. Those old heads are so empty. It could really have been a mistake. It's possible they really didn't know anything, and assigned Zoro's first mission here by accident. When Toji first became a sorcerer, his potential threats were dealt with by mixing first-class or special-class cases with fourth-class ones, even though he was a fourth-class sorcerer, of course. Now Toji primarily handled first-class and special-class cases. But occasionally, the upper echelons really thought they were sending him a fourth or third-class case, and instead sent a first-class one. Not just once or twice, but three times. At first, he thought they were trying to mess with him, but it turned out to be a genuine mistake. How absurd that was when he found out. It was only because it was me that I was unharmed. If it had been a real fourth-class sorcerer, they would have been dead without a chance. Toji didn't make a big deal out of it with the upper echelons. He just made a hefty sum off the mission's success fee. After all, it hadn't been particularly dangerous. But Zoro was different. Even if the type of mission assigned was a mistake, the elders were the ones who assigned the mission to Zoro. While Toji was away on a mission, they assigned it to Zoro. 
who was only six years old. Even though Zoro wasn't hurt, Toji had no intention of just letting it slide what the upper echelons had done. Absolutely not. Shito's face showed a bit of disbelief that the people leading the sorcery world could do such a thing. It might not have been the upper echelons. That's possible. If someone, whether the upper echelons or not, deliberately sent us here, what were they aiming for? To harm Zoro. Zoro and Toji scoffed at the same time. Just releasing a nearly first class curse to harm Zoro. If that were the case, they would have prepared something of a special class. And they would have made sure you couldn't follow either. Then why Zoro thought for a moment. If there were planners behind this, what was their purpose? A nearly first class curse. Not one with unique magical techniques. But rather a downgrade from a special class curse Zoro had previously faced which they would have known Zoro could handle without any trouble. Especially with Suguru there too. The goal wasn't to kill or physically harm either of them. If that had been the case, there would have been much stronger or peculiar curses involved. Something immune to slashing damage, for example. Then the answer was one. Zoro voiced his hypothesis. It seems like they wanted to see our reaction. Our reaction. How we would react when we saw Nanako and Mamiko. Whether we would get angry. If so, how much, whether we would try to help them. And if we did, how? Things like that. Understanding your opponent is a key factor in determining victory or defeat. Zoro knew that much, of course. However, he would never leave a child in danger just to gather information. Shito looked through the small window in the door at the sleeping children. Just for information, they left those kids to suffer like that. That's annoying. Toji grimaced suddenly, feeling a sharp sensation of energy. As he activated his haki. He felt the energy swirling around Jito, intensified by anger. He wasn't usually one to lose control of his emotions. It must be the anger, or perhaps something had been building up. Do you want to come along? Where are you going? To the upper echelons. He intended to warn them never to assign missions secretly to Zoro while he was away again. But before that, there was one thing Toji wanted to ask Zoro. Zoro, yeah, do you like the classics? Well, in a way, yes. There were many interesting characters, and it wasn't boring. Reading the faint enjoyment on Zoro's face, Toji said, Good. If that's the case, he couldn't completely blow away the upper echelons. After all, the sorcery headquarters is the higher authority over the sorcery classics. And if they were completely dismissed, even a young Zoro could be designated as a rogue sorcerer. Maybe I should just negotiate to adjust the level of the missions. Missions once a week, no solo missions, no missions involving personal interaction, no special class cases, and the right to refuse missions. At least these conditions. Feeling a rising sense of anxiety, Toji clenched and then unclenched his fist. If I had my way he would prefer that Zoro not be given any missions at all. He wished Zoro wouldn't have to capture curses or rogue sorcerers. At least not for the next 10 years. But that would not only cause a conflict with the headquarters, but Zoro probably wouldn't like it either. Seeing Zoro smiling even while bloodied after being struck by Gorjo's powerful technique, Toji knew. For Zoro, combat was part of life and a source of joy. Toji, who focused on merely ending lives regardless of strength or weakness, method, or outcome, was very different. Zoro had grown tremendously through the process of fighting and enjoyed it. If Zoro had been weaker, Toji might have put everything on the line to stop him, but even Gorjo's powerful attacks couldn't beat him. Toji could no longer simply protect Zoro. He had grown too much too soon. Suppressing his turmoil, Toji said, Let me know if you need help anytime. That's fine, just tell me where the upper echelons are. It seemed necessary to see for himself whether they were really behind this incident. Shito raised his hand. Can I join too, sir? Go ahead. I'll call Satoru too. I told him to call me if anything about blowing away the upper echelons came up. That guy too. It looks like there's going to be quite a disturbance at the headquarters. Toji's lips twisted into a wry smile. Zoro followed Toji's lead to the top floor of the headquarters building, where the upper echelons were located. As the door slid open, three members of the upper echelons were visible. The upper echelons each had their responsibilities, so it was unusual for all the major executives to be present in the headquarters building at the same time. Therefore, today, only three of them were in the building. Zoro scrutinized the three individuals and then asked, Are you the upper echelons? He had expected them all to be at least as skilled as Suguru. However, they all seemed less capable than him. Zoro's expression soured slightly. One person sprang up and pointed aggressively at Zoro. You, where do you think this is? The voice, initially bold, diminished as the speaker saw Toji enter. Zoro frowned, reading the clear fear directed at Toji. What a disappointment. As he watched one of the sorcery world's elders avoid Toji's gaze while dripping with cold sweat, Zoro thought to himself. These were supposed to be the leaders of the sorcery community, yet their caliber was disappointingly small. Zoro frowned. They might have had strength, 
but they didn't even seem to have any guts. Not that reckless bravery is always good, but if you're a leader, you need some unyielding will for others to follow you. Is that why no one follows them? Looking at the classic sorcerers, they didn't seem to be actively opposing the sorcery headquarters, but they also didn't seem very loyal. Considering the headquarters was supposed to be the higher authority over the classics, they really aren't very inspiring, neither in strength nor in insight. They didn't care about Zoro and only showed fear towards Toji which gave a good indication of their level. It seemed they didn't consider Zoro a significant threat despite previous reports of him single-handedly defeating a special class curse. Zoro tilted his head. Are these guys really behind the incident? They seemed too unaware of Zoro for that. As they murmured Gorjo, who had received a call from Jito, entered the room with a long stride. Yo, I have arrived. My apologies. Following Gorjo, Jito entered the room politely. One of the Kama members of the upper echelons frowned. Gorjo Satoru. And that's the first class sorcerer, Jito Suguru. How dare you come here? We wanted to know something. And depending on the answer, they might have business with the old men. Gorjo's gaze, barely visible behind his slightly shifted sunglasses, was piercing. Zoro glanced at Gorjo, noticing an expression he rarely showed. What about the first mission assigned to Zoro? Was it intentional? Gorjo asked, half-jokingly. The reactions from the three upper echelons varied. One scowled, another stuttered as if caught, and the third blinked, seemingly clueless. Gorjo turned to the elder who had reacted. You there? Do you know anything? What? I know nothing. Can you swear to that truth? Such nonsense. Honestly, it would be better for you to speak the truth. Don't forget there's someone here who's even more reckless than me. Hearing that, the elder's expression turned towards Toji. Although Toji showed no change in expression, his presence alone seemed to frighten the elder into speaking. I was just trying to protect that child. Gorjo's eyes widened in disbelief, and he let out a soft wire. I can't believe it at all. This. The elder bristled at Gorjo's remark. Jito tapped Gorjo on the shoulder as if to calm him down. Jito, equally as incredulous as Gorjo, continued. Could you please continue explaining? What did you do to protect Zoro? Unlike Gorjo's blunt manner, Jito's polite tone prompted the elder to clear his throat with an arrogant voice before continuing. Does it make any sense for a young non-sorcerer child to subdue a special class curse alone? That child is just a normal non-sorcerer, and surely the curse died due to some other variable. What? All he is doing is deluding himself into thinking he did it. All I did was show him what a real sorcerer's mission looks like. Gorjo let out a scoff. Cheeto's poker face was about to crumble. Toji's lips twisted. He knew it would be something like this. Non-sorcerers have their own world as do sorcerers. It would be a disaster if non-sorcerers were in the sorcery realm. Curses are not something they can handle. Getting him out quickly is in the child's best interest. Gorjo massaged his temples. So you're saying, since Zoro wants to be a sorcerer, and he made it seem like he subdued a special class curse on his own, you gave him a harsh mission intentionally early on, to make him realize the reality and leave the sorcery world. It seems that Jito was assigned to accompany him in case Zoro got hurt, and Toji would go berserk. Set up, you say. It's not exactly like that, ah, uh, enough. Don't bother explaining. Because stupidity is contagious. Gorjo moved away from the Elder. Why don't they understand? The old order that only sorcerers could combat curses, had been shattered with the appearance of entities like Toji and Zoro. Then they should accept it. Why continue denying reality? It's been months, not just a day or two. Unlike Gorjo, Toji wasn't as shocked. The sorcery community wouldn't accept Toji, who could annihilate the Zenin family, much less a young, ordinary non-sorcerer like Zoro. Did you know there were two sorcerer girls in that village being abused by non-sorcerers? What? You didn't know. Cheeto felt like he was going insane for another reason. He would have been less shocked if there had been a grand conspiracy. This man really knew nothing and had no thoughts on anything. The first assignment for a six-year-old child was chosen with the thought, he'll probably run away with this. Stop it. The person who had frowned earlier interjected. It turned out fine, didn't it? It didn't turn out fine. What exactly is the problem then? Did they fail to subdue the curse? Did they fail to rescue the sorcerer children? Did that non-sorcerer get hurt? He had hoped for the latter but didn't show it. The sorcerer girls can grow up and eventually enroll in the classics on their own. And if that non-sorcerer child turned out to be helpful in subduing the curse, then the same applies when he's old enough to enroll in the classics. It was clear they were on different wavelengths. Understanding why Gorjo was so frustrated with the upper echelons, Jido rubbed his forehead. Toji remained stoic, but he realized something else. 
That bastard. He knew what was happening in that village. Toji's insides twisted. Knowing all that, he let Zoro witness such a thing. Why? Was he trying to let him run amok and label him as a renegade? That's nonsense. Zoro wasn't the type to act rashly on emotion. I won't say there's nothing to criticize about this man's actions, but that doesn't absolve you of your guilt for barging in here recklessly. From next time, if you oppose the headquarters like this, you will be punished accordingly. It sounded like false equivalence, but ultimately, it was a defense of the upper echelons. They didn't talk about punishing the upper echelons, but they did talk about punishing Zoro's side. Leave. All of you. If something like this happens again, I won't let it slide under the authority of the headquarters. Zoro silently looked at the man, then turned around. From behind, the elder's voice followed him. I don't know what end you aim for, but reaching it will be impossible. It's because of your immutable nature, he said with a slight sneer. Zoro, with an eerily calm grip on Toji's arm, spoke plainly. Never engage with them, father. They're not worth it. Toji's icy green eyes met Zoro's. Only Zoro saw the flash of murderous intent in those green pupils disappear. Zoro left the room. Following him, Toji, Gorjo, and Jito also left the room. Gorjo, linking his fingers behind his head, asked, So, what's the plan now? If there had been a plan, there could be something to confront. But if it was out of ignorance, there was hardly anything to say. Stupidity isn't a crime serious enough to merit death or dismissal. After a moment of silence, Zoro spoke. I need to grow stronger. To make the upper echelons increasingly irrelevant, it would be difficult to oust them through force. It might be possible to kill them all or incapacitate them for battle. But it was currently difficult to gather the personnel to fill the vacancies in the upper echelons. With the already heavy load of missions on existing sorcerers, it's impractical. Reducing the number of sorcerers further, would just impose an immense workload on the remaining ones. It could be a viable option if we completely disregard the sorceress circumstances. Zoro glanced at Jito, who looked profoundly shocked. But that's impractical. Whether liked or not, the foundation of the sorcery community is the sorcery headquarters. Overturning it without having any alternative in place would only invite greater chaos. Toji, slightly anxious, asked, how will you grow stronger? By killing curses. Among the options available to Zoro, that was the fastest way to gain recognition in the sorcery world. Toji reacted sensitively. Why do you have to do that? Because that's what I know how to do. Zoro was a swordsman to the bone. He was adept at cutting down others. He wasn't particularly eloquent or intelligent. Unlike Luffy, he didn't have the power to attract people of all sorts, whether enemies or allies. Naturally, he mostly resolved things with his sword. Tell them you love them. Just like Shia had instructed Zoro, words were necessary. However, they don't fundamentally change situations. Words gain proper meaning when accompanied by actions. I told Suguru to take a break. Then, shouldn't I create an opportunity for him to actually take one? Not just for Suguru, but for Satoru as well. What Zoro did best was lessen the burden of his friends or colleagues by cutting down their enemies. He was confident in his ability to cut better than anyone else. He had once been the world's greatest swordsman. From now on, I'll accompany them on their missions. You're going to work with us. Unlike Gorjo's interested expression, Toji grimaced. Do you know how many missions those guys handle? I don't plan to follow them on every mission. Gorjo and Jito handle several tasks in a day. Zoro couldn't follow them around and still take care of Megumi and Sumiki. A careful balance was necessary. Maybe once a day that's ridiculous. Once a week. Isn't that too infrequent? That frequency of missions wouldn't be helpful to anyone, Zoro thought. Sensing Zoro's feelings, Toji said, you're at an age where it's normal not to be of any help. If that's the case, those guys aren't adults either. Damn the sorcery community. It was the first time Toji was outraged by the reality that labor laws were disregarded. But they aren't six years old. That was true. Zoro thought for a moment and then compromised a bit. Every two days. Every three days. I can't compromise more than that. Toji cut him off firmly, and Zoro realized Toji wouldn't budge further. Zoro firmly said, if something's off, I'll follow them no matter if it's three days or whatever. Toji didn't oppose that. He knew well that Zoro's instincts were sharp. Toji sighed deeply. Why did Zoro take such a liking to those troublemakers? Well, I suppose, considering he even treats someone like me as his father. If they weren't father and son, they surely would have clashed. Objectively, Toji was definitely not the type of person Zoro liked. Yet, Zoro accepted Toji as his father, as family. Whether it was because they shared blood, or for some other reason, wasn't clear. So, it was possible that Zoro could also become close with Jito and Gorjo. After all, he had accepted Toji. 
If I tell you not to do something because it's dangerous and I'm worried, will you listen? No. I thought so. Toji couldn't outstubborn Zoro, so Toji had to follow. It was a rather strange relationship for a parent and child, but what of it? Toji placed a large hand on Zoro's head. Zoro's head, displaying a prominent question mark, was slowly patted by Toji. Do as you wish. Zoro could love and care for anyone he chose. He could aim for whatever goals he wanted. Just don't get hurt. That was always Toji's only wish. I'm strong, father. I know. But being strong doesn't mean you can't get hurt. Listening to the conversation, Gorjo's eyes sparkled. So Zoro will join us on missions now. Not all, just some. Yep, of course. But what if those guys complain like this time? Zoro grinned slyly. Is there a rule that says a sorcerer or non-sorcerer can't follow another sorcerer's mission? Gorjo grinned back. Nope, there's nothing like that. Right. In reality, sorcerers busy with their own tasks typically don't have time to follow others on their missions, and non-sorcerers, unaware of sorcerer's existence, rarely necessitate such a regulation. But what of it? Heh <laughs> heh heh. Seeing Satori laugh cheerfully, Jito started to scold him, but ended up chuckling along. Jito, can't you join me on my missions? I might be assigned different tasks than you. Assigning another sorcerer to a special class sorcerer's mission was inefficient. That's why special class sorcerers usually coordinated only with assistant directors and rarely with other sorcerers. Being so strong that you don't need office help makes one a special class sorcerer. Of course, even if Zoro was as strong as a special class sorcerer, he would likely still need to cooperate with others. Cheeto had to grab Zoro who was trying to head in a different direction. Three of them were walking the same way, and Zoro alone was veering off. It was a talent in its own right. Jito looked at Zoro and chuckled. Zoro, your decision to follow other sorcerers' missions is a good one. So, make sure to refuse solo missions from now on. You'll definitely get lost. With a tone that was kind yet strangely cold, sweat started to form on Zoro's head. Jito went on. Should I tell the upper echelons that you have no sense of direction? Maybe that will help them accept your strength more than just calling you a pure non-sorcerer. Do you think those old guys will believe anything Jito says? Gorjo muttered seriously. Even those old men might believe that. Hey, the next day, as Zoro was pushing the swing with Tsumiki and Megumi on it, he pondered deeply. How could he improve the situation for sorcerers? Technically, he wanted to help Jito. But Jito couldn't smile while his acquaintances were suffering. To help Jito, he had to help all sorcerers. Swoosh, the swing, firmly attached to the mature tree of the academy, moved forward. This swing, slightly longer in the seat than others, allowed both Megumi and Tsumiki to sit side by side. Aha uh ha. -huh. We, so high, the clear laughter of Tsumiki and the excited voice of Megumi filled the sky. Zoro watched the swing reach its height and stop pushing. Pushing any harder could make the kids fall off. This was just right. As the tiny siblings screamed joyfully while nearing the sky, Zoro thought, maybe I should cut down on sleep. If he followed along on the missions of the Academy Sorcerers, naturally, the time he could spend with Megumi and Tsumiki would decrease. To make up for that time, he'd have to reduce his sleep. If I only sleep from 4am to 7am like in my past life, and take naps in my spare time Toji would probably lock Soro up at home, and wrap him up in blankets to make him sleep. Toji was quite sensitive about Zoro's health, but there was stuff to do, and he couldn't just fall over and sleep. There's really only one way, to dismantle the upper echelons and establish a new leadership. No matter how hard sorcerers work, if those leading them don't cherish their efforts and lives, it's all just expended in vain. And that dedication could, unfortunately, be exploited in the wrong direction. In his past life, the navy was mostly on the side of good. Controlled by evil at the top of the world, actions loyal to the navy according to justice, have only served to sustain a great evil power. It's still possible to smash the top echelon. The problem is what follows. Establishing new leadership. One might say just promote another sorcerer, right? But it's not that easy. There's bound to be backlash asking, who are you to sit above me? The new leadership will need authority and force to suppress that backlash. But most importantly justification. It is the justification that it should have been us, not them, sitting in these positions. Zoro scratched the back of his head. This is going to be annoying. Justification only has meaning when many people sympathize with it. In other words, a group needs to be formed. Zoro was not incapable of leading others and forming a group. He just hadn't done it because it was bothersome. I'm not free right now. He had two younger siblings to look after, and a father who needed his support. But if the only way to help Suguru was to bring down the upper echelon and establish a new leadership, what choice did he have? I'll have to do it. Zoro, 
who had once declared war on the world government composed of more than 170 member countries to save a single comrade, simply decided he would someday overthrow the upper echelon. If the upper echelon knew it would eventually fall, they would be flabbergasted to the point of foaming at the mouth. The swing stopped. Sumiki's cheeks turned red as she said, push me again. Eek. No. It's January, and the wind is cold. Too much outdoor activity is not good for the children in this weather. Sumiki's nose is already running even from a short time out. Zoro took a handkerchief from his belt and wrapped it around Sumiki's nose. Sumiki blew her nose loudly. Gorjo and Jito came towards Zoro with their long limbs flailing. Zoro, who had just seen Nanako and Mamiko clinging to Jito, asked, where are Nanako and Mamiko? Shoko is treating them. Since they had obtained a medical certificate proving child abuse, there was no need to recover slowly at a non-sorcerer hospital. So, he brought the two children to Shoko for treatment. Gorjo looked down at Megumi. Well, every time I see this kid, his hair sticks out more and more. Ding, ding. Gorjo playfully poked at Megumi's spiky hair with his fingers. Megumi looked up at Gorjo with a sullen expression, and Gorjo stuck out his tongue with a wretch. The more I look, the more he really looks like a clone. Could Mr. Toji have given birth through self-cloning? Could be. Megumi also resembled Cher a lot. Zoro looked down at Megumi in his arms with a slightly bitter feeling. But only Zoro and Toji might realize that. Zoro, what? Teach me about that black power you wield. Zoro looked at Gorjo. You deliberately didn't ask me and just followed dad around. Um, consider it a nice guy's consideration. You're still too young. It doesn't matter. Huh, I knew you'd say that. Up till now, it didn't make sense to discuss age, since Zoro was going on missions with them, right? Gorjo said with a beaming smile. As equals in partnership, Zoro looked back and forth between Gorjo, who was openly expectant, and Jito, who was subtly hopeful. Alright, I'll teach you. Really, is that okay, Zoro? Yeah. If they were to work together on missions, they needed to have at least some understanding of Zoro's powers. Otherwise, the battles would get messed up. Above all, driving out the upper echelon wasn't something Zoro could do just by getting stronger on his own. These guys becoming strong and clearing out the trash to take their place wouldn't be too bad. Of course, Gorjo and Jito becoming the leaders of the sorcerers could mean the sorcerers suffer in a different way. But Zoro hadn't thought that far. However, learning it won't be that simple. Hey, I've been good at everything since I was young. I've never been behind when learning something new either. Hum, would that be the case even when learning Haki? Zoro recalled the painful memory of having to give up alcohol until he had trained his Haki under Mihik and shrugged. Even though he had strong motivation and had grasped the basics of Haki, it took Zoro quite a long time to freely use observation and armament Haki. Sumiki, it's cold, take Megumi inside. I don't want to. I want to watch. Me too. All right. Wonder who they take after being so sharp. Zoro took out a hand warmer from his belt, shook it, and handed it to Tsumiki, then bundled her up well. After doing the same for Megumi, Zoro turned to Jito. Suguru, just bring out one curse that doesn't mind dying. He wanted to see how well a sorcerer could master Haki. Toji came home from work earlier than usual and hesitated when he heard a loud scream echoing through the air. Arg. Then, an even louder scream followed. Arg. Rolling and crashing, Gorjo tumbled from afar and sprawled in front of Toji. Although his school uniform was intact thanks to the protective Limitless he was wearing, Gorjo was groaning while clutching the back of his head. Ugh, even with the Limitless, it hurts. Ah, oh, what happened? Gorilla. Gorjo's face brightened as he jumped up from his spot. It was the first time Toji had seen Gorjo smile so brightly at him. I want to learn Haki from you, not Zoro. Hearing this, Toji understood why Gorjo was in such a state. Did you ask Zoro to teach you Haki? I thought wrong. He's terrible as a teacher. It didn't seem that way to Toji. He thought to himself that learning Haki was just inherently tricky. I was wondering why you hadn't shown up. Yo. Upon seeing Zoro, Gorjo screamed like a girl. Despicable teacher, step aside. Respect the rights of students. Zoro frowned. That's what I said. It's tough. I didn't know learning had to be this brutish and painful. Really? Is this the only way? Gorjo protested. Gaining Haki isn't just about mental strength and experience. You need theory too. Are those nebulous talks about breathing or whatever supposed to be theory? In everything, there is a breath. The breath of stone, the breath of the sword, the breath of wood, the breath of man. Every element has its own breath, and the swordsman who realizes this can cut through iron at will, and not cut anything when he chooses not to. 
This was nearly as absurd an explanation of theory as Iori's reversal technique, which supposedly works by simply swinging your energy. Before Gorjo, Jito, who had also been flung away by Zoro's sword, staggered towards them. Having been hit by the flat of Zoro's sword and sent flying three times, Jito looked quite dazed. Is this really how Haki is supposed to open up? Up to a certain level, yes. To reach higher levels, one must engage in life-threatening battles with powerful opponents. As often said, Haki develops further in extreme situations. Gorjo sat on the ground, raising his hands in surrender. Ah, forget it. I'd rather learn from the gorilla. Learning from father won't be much different. Toji also learned Haki from Zoro. The teaching method would likely be similar. Still, it might be somewhat beneficial for Toji to teach them Haki. As a sorcerer with a power level of zero, he usually relies on the movement of power to discern opponents which can be difficult for other sorcerers to detect. It's more about relying on intuition than sorcery. As Zoro pondered Gorjo, feeling uneasy, changed his request to, then I'll just learn from you. But it's weird. If what you've taught so far is all there is to Haki, I don't understand how you could have cut me even with my limitless. I understand that armament Haki can be applied to weapons. But even so, shouldn't it be blocked by the limitless? Noticing Gorjo's confusion, Zoro explained. Of course, ordinary armament Haki couldn't possibly ignore your limitless and strike. As proof, even Toji's level of armament Haki couldn't penetrate Gorjo's limitless. It would only be possible with a highly powerful version of armament Haki capable of striking both externally and internally. Gorjo pouted. Aren't you going to teach that? I'm curious about it. Who teaches running to a baby who can't even walk? That was akin to teaching domain expansion to a sorcery student who doesn't know how to handle power yet. Of course, Zoro didn't know domain expansion yet, so it was a moot analogy. Teaching advanced applications of Haki prematurely would only be confusing. If there are no more questions, let's continue wait. I have a question. Not wanting to be hit, Gorjo grimaced as he thought of his next question. Ah, got it. What's the third type of Haki, aside from observation and armament? Toji's eyebrows shot up, but Zoro's face remained calm, as he expected the question. That's still, it's Conqueror's Haki. Toji looked at Zoro in surprise. Zoro shrugged and explained. I just became able to use it recently. Suguru seemed to realize something, that time when, Conqueror's Haki, sounds like a really Chunabu name, but coming from Zoro, it didn't sound trivial at all. Both observation and armament Haki were simple in terms of abilities, detecting an opponent's presence and enhancing attack power and physical strikes. However, when this simple ability combined with Zoro's swordsmanship, it exerted absolute power. Want to see? At Gorjo's polite invitation, Zoro turned to Suguru. Suguru, can you summon as many curses as possible? I also want to test something. Hearing Zoro's request, Jito hesitated for a moment, then released as many curses as he could at once. From special class curses to Shikigami so weak they could hardly be classified. The dense cluster of curses surrounded Zoro. Although it looked like he was encircled, Zoro was not tense at all. Zoro took a moment to breathe, and then release his conqueror's haki. Boom. Feeling the overwhelming aura, Toji reflexively wrapped his hands around the curse weapon on his shoulder. However, the energy of the Conqueror's Haki was not obscured even by Toji's physical curse. Woom! Toji activated his observation Haki. Although invisible to the eye, some form of energy was radiating out from Zoro in a hemispherical spread. The grass at the training ground rustled and bent. Jito covered his face with his arm to block the blowing wind. Gorjo, feeling a tingling sensation in his hands and his heart beating fiercely, laughed. Ah, as expected, just like someone who had hurt me before. The surge of aura ceased. Toji checked his body. There was no harm done to him. It was the same for Gorjo and Jito. Only an eerie silence flowed. Thud. One of the flying Shikigami fell straight to the ground. Then another, and another. Shikigami, fourth class, third class, down to second class. Watching his curses collapse, Jito's eyelids fluttered. Except for first class and special class, all the curses lay sprawled on the ground. They weren't exorcised, but they lay motionless as if knocked out. What is this? Domain expansion. Despite feeling no power, Gorjo had no choice but to say so. Domain expansion. A technique called the pinnacle of sorcery, creating a barrier that cuts off the outside world and ensures fatal techniques hit their mark. Even Gorjo Satori could not yet perform domain expansion. No, domain expansion creates a barrier that separates from reality. This conqueror's haki didn't operate that way. However, it had similarities to domain expansion. Domain expansion. What's that? Zoro cocked his head then began to explain. Conqueror's haki knocks out opponents who are overwhelmingly weaker than the user. How can I learn it? You can't learn this. You have to be born with it. It's not something you can gain through training. Unlike observation and armament haki which can be learned from others, Conqueror's Haki must be innate. 
the ratio of people born with it is one in millions. And that's based on the previous world standards. So it's uncertain if anyone here possesses it. Even if born with it, if the inherent power is weak, it will not manifest, and only grows gradually with the physical and mental growth of the person. In a world not focused on cultivating individual force, even if someone possessed Conqueror's Haki, its manifestation would be difficult. Gorjo seemed briefly disappointed, but then his eyes sparkled. So it can only be obtained if you're born with it, just like a innate technique. In that sense, yes, someone might want an innate technique, but if they're not born with it, they can't use it. The same goes for Conqueror's Haki. No matter how much you might want it, if you're not born with it, there's no way to use it. Suddenly, Gorjo perked up, raising his head. Wait, if you keep using this while moving around, could you catch all the curses without fighting? Zoro made a wry face. Of course, if he kept Conqueror's Haki activated continuously, he could knock out any curses he encountered. However, ordinary people would collapse too. Not just sorcerers but also considering the levels of the curses that had collapsed even 4th and 3rd class sorcerers would be in danger. Due to the high level of sorcerers Zoro associates with, many sorcerers find it hard to even reach 2nd class. It wouldn't be right to recklessly omit Conqueror's Haki. That could threaten both ordinary people and numerous sorcerers. Ah, can't you target specific ones? It's possible with a few, but with too many, it's difficult. Zoro was quite adept at controlling Conqueror's Haki, but even he couldn't specifically target just curses to knock out on the bustling streets of Tokyo, filled with people and curses. And Conqueror's Haki only knocks out, not kills. It's convenient to be non-lethal when dealing with people, but curses need to be killed. Even if curses are exposed to Conqueror's Haki, they eventually recover from being knocked out, so they must be found and killed before the effect wears off. Haki is not all-powerful. It has its limits. Even if one possesses Observation and Armament Haki, or Conqueror's Haki, they can only be effectively utilized when the owner's physical abilities or unique talents supplement them. Even if Observation Haki allows one to read all of an opponent's movements, without the agility to dodge, its useless armament Haki, no matter how powerful, must still hit the target, and Conqueror's Haki, if weak even if born with it is impossible to use. Haki is not omnipotent. Gorjo could understand to some extent what Zoro meant by his words. Yes, to some extent. Each type of Haki has clear limits. Even if one has Haki, if their body or main strength is weak, or if they only possess one of the three types of Haki, they might be somewhat bothersome, but not terribly difficult to deal with. But what if someone has a unique ability, not just Haki? What if they possess at least two of the three types of Haki? It's not omnipotent, but it seems like you can do quite a lot with it. There was a reason why Gorilla tried so hard to prevent Zoro from stepping forward. Gorjo thought to himself, it's too conspicuous and a powerful force. Especially the Conqueror's Haki among the three was well suited when cooperating with Suguru. It was a tricky task to drain someone's strength without killing them. Even Gorjo occasionally mismanaged his strength and accidentally killed the curses meant for Suguru. However, if Zoro and Suguru were ever to fight, Suguru would be overwhelmingly disadvantaged in terms of compatibility. Against Zoro, any deadly technique held by curses below second class would be practically meaningless. How much of the Conqueror's Haki can you use? How much is the total amount? It varies depending on the person's strength. Since Conqueror's Haki does not deplete merely by being emitted outwardly, measuring its total amount precisely is extremely difficult. It's just a rough guess. The range within which Conqueror's Haki can be spread, the presence felt when subjected to Conqueror's Haki, the strength of the people it can bring down, and the power when Conqueror's Haki is wrapped around. Zoro had not yet reached the stage where he could wrap others in Conqueror's Haki. He was just at the level of controlling its usage. It means my body is still not strong enough. It's not surprising. If he couldn't freely use his spiritual powers, how could he wrap others in Conqueror's Haki? Currently, Zoro was compensating for his relatively weak physical abilities with a high level of Haki. If it had been a real fight to the death with Satoru, not just sparring, it would have been much harder. If Satoru had kept using his power from a distance, it would have been difficult for the current Zoro to counter. Still, he would have never given up. Gorjo thought deeply as Zoro considered. How about you? How strong is your Conqueror's Haki? Still lacking, Zoro answered promptly. It's natural given his current childlike body, and even in his past life, Zoro's Conqueror's Haki was insufficient, both in range and in how it was utilized. Compared to Luffy, it was certainly the case. What about the other two Haki? I'm confident in Armament Haki. Observation Haki still has a long way to go. Even though you're learning various Haki, 
it seems they don't all improve at the same rate. That's right. Being a master of observation Haki doesn't automatically make one a master of armament Haki. For Zoro, armament Haki was his specialty among the three. He needed to improve his proficiency in each type of Haki. From a distance, Shoko approached. Seeing her peers, a smile appeared on Yeri's face with slight dark circles under her eyes. She threw her arms around Gorjo and Jito, jumping between them. Hi there. Ah, uh, Shoko, are you done with work? Yes. Tired. What she had done wasn't really something to talk about with her peers. She looked back and forth between the two men. What were you guys up to? We were learning something called Haki from Zoro. Haki, do you want to learn it too? Sensing a trap in Gorjo's subtle tone, Yeri sharply declined. No, thanks. Damn. Beep. Toji's phone rang. He checked the message on his open phone. It was time to go. Gorjo, Jito, you each have a mission. Really? Jito's expression brightened. Though he hadn't said it, Jito didn't want to continue the Haki training either. Zoro, who had been quietly observing, asked Toji. Dad, do we have a mission in the next few hours? No. Then, I want to go on a mission with Gorjo. How wouldn't it be better to go with Suguru? Of course, if it was just about subduing curses, Zoro and Jito would be more efficient than Gorjo and Zoro together. But that didn't mean he wanted to go on a mission with just Suguru. Zoro said thoughtlessly. It might not be good for Suguru to subdue too many curses. Why? Oops. Zoro clamped his mouth shut, but Gorjo had caught onto something and looked at Jito. He had made a mistake. He hadn't meant to blab about Jito's business. Zoro bowed politely to Jito in apology. Sorry. No problem. Jito hadn't expected to say this but he felt it needed to be said at least once as he scratched the back of his head. Actually, the curse orbs taste terrible. How bad? Jito considered beating around the bush, but then he spoke honestly. It's like wiping up vomit with a rotten rag and then swallowing it. What? He had been swallowing that every time he subdued a curse. For Gorjo, who couldn't live a day without something sweet, it was truly a horrific ordeal. Why didn't you tell us? Just there's nothing that can be done about it. If you want to collect curses, you have to swallow the curse orbs, and there's nothing that can be done about their taste. Actually, he had tried pouring teriyaki sauce over them before, but it had no effect. It just tasted like he had eaten teriyaki and then thrown it up. Gorjo suggested seriously, what about coating it with sugar? You sound just like Zoro. Zoro said that too. Let's try it. It might get stuck in my throat. The curse orbs were already a mouthful. Adding a sugar coating might increase their size and make them impossible to swallow in one gulp. What about sprinkling some sauce? I already tried that. It just tasted like sauce and vomit. You. Gorjo stuck out his tongue. Yeri patted Jito's back in a comforting manner. I'll see if there's a drug or something that can temporarily numb the taste buds. No, thanks Shoko. He'd rather swallow the rag than use some unknown drug or concoction. Gorjo put his hand on Jito's shoulder. After the mission, let's come back and try coating the curse orb with sugar. I told you, it won't work. What if we apply it very thinly? Despite the absurdity of the serious suggestion, Jito was flabbergasted. Still, there was no harm in trying. So he reluctantly nodded. Let's give it a shot. Okay, leave it to me. We'll definitely make it sweet. Encouraged by Gorjo's bold promise, Jito found himself laughing without realizing it. That evening, after finishing their mission, Gorjo and Jito completed the sugar solution for coating the curse orbs in the kitchen. Now, all that was left was to briefly dip the entire curse orb into the hot sugar solution, and then let it harden. Gorjo nudged Jito aside. I'll do it. No, I want to do it. What are you talking about? I cook better than you, Suguru, but I'm the one who has to swallow it. Obviously, I should do it. Here they go again. Familiar with the atmosphere, Shoko slowly moved away from the kitchen counter where Gorjo and Jito were. Crunch, crunch. Sitting in a corner of the kitchen, Megumi and Tsumiki were nibbling on a piece of thick, transparent hardened sugar coating. They had received just one each promising to brush their teeth afterward. I'm going to do it. No, I'm doing it. Satoru, do you want to get hit? Hey, you'll never get it from me. Gorjo triumphantly lifted the curse orb and dropped it towards the pot filled with sugar solution. Watch to coat it thinly. You just dunk it like this bang. Crash. The curse orb slipped from Gorjo's hand, hitting the rim of the pot with a clear clang. The teetering pot then fell to the kitchen floor, and the curse orb rolled under the counter. A silence fell between Jito and Gorjo for a moment. Megumi and Sumiki, who had been crunching on sugar pieces, watched the scene and cheerfully exclaimed. He caused a mess. A mess. Jito, laughing brightly, grabbed Gorjo by the scruff of his neck. You did that on purpose. Oh, did I? Gorjo knew the curse orb was slippery. He thought it would land nicely in the pot. 
not knowing it would hit the rim and overturn the pot. Forebodingly, Jito laughed even brighter after hearing Gorjo's answer. Actually, it doesn't matter. Whether intentional or not, they were bound to clash. Jito put Gorjo in a rear naked choke. Gorjo choked out. Huh, I surrender. I surrender. Not yet. Gorjo's face turned pale as he tapped on Jito's arm. But Jito, with a smiling face, did not let go. Crack. Meanwhile, Zoro at another table had sliced Jito's curse orb in two with a knife. As soon as it split, the orb disintegrated like a subdued curse, turning into black ash. Ah, the black ash that was once a curse orb remained on the cutting board. Watching Zoro look bewildered, Toji shook his head and briefly commented, What a mess. One day, as she passed by, Sumiki casually asked Zoro, Do you think there are impossible things in the world? Pausing his window cleaning, Zoro hesitated after Tsumiki's question. After a long silence, he answered, I guess. That's unlike you. I thought you'd say everything is possible. Zoro laughed involuntarily. If it's a living being, then yes. As long as it lives, the possibilities of existence are infinite. One can become strong enough to defeat an opponent who seems unbeatable. Past glories can become so diminished they're hard to believe. One can dream new dreams, or live a life completely different from before. That is what it means to live. On the other hand, death is the complete conclusion of all things. Whether the life lived was good or bad, nothing more can be done. In this world people leave curses as they die, and these curses continue to circulate within the cycles of reincarnation, perhaps it's a concept that doesn't quite fit with this world. As for Zoro, he's a reincarnated being who has lived a second life after dying once. Zoro stopped his thoughts and firmly wrung out the wet rag. As he diligently cleaned the window, Sumiki set down a bowl of freshly washed grapes. Maybe it's possible. You always told us that the world is vast. To not limit oneself on the path forward to live freely doing whatever one desires. Zoro has always tried to ensure that Sumiki and Megumi live such lives. He constantly reminded them of the possibilities and freedom of being, of existence. Meanwhile, he found it amusing to speak of death as something insurmountable. Even if the god of death came, you'd cut him down. I've cut down something like that before. See, the world cutting swordsman is Zoro. Would death be an exception? Sumiki didn't think so. It's just that he chooses not to cut it. Perhaps there might be a way if he really wanted. However, Zoro has never sought to encroach upon the realms of life and death. It's more about respect than a sense of defeat. Respect for the beginning and the end of an existence. That's typical of Zoro's stubborn nature. But Sumiki said with a smile, Stop cleaning the window now, and come eat some fruit. And no more sneaking cooking wine. Or it won't just end with window cleaning like this time. A while later, Zoro confronted a group of necromancers. Having operated primarily outside of Japan to evade Gorjo and Zoro, they were discovered by Zoro as soon as they entered Japan. When their hideout was raided, the chief necromancer was found barely alive, having exhausted all his magic and necromantic rituals. Zoro quickly surveyed the location. Nothing. There were no bodies possessed by summon curses. Zoro grabbed the old chief necromancer by the collar and lifted him up. Hey, where are the bodies you've necromanced? And, who exactly did you necromance? The chief necromancer chuckled upon hearing Zoro's question. We weren't sure we could do it. They hadn't expected such a target to exist for this monster. But there was one, and they had succeeded. They would probably die as a result, but it was worth it. If it could end this monster's era. Hey, answer me. Under Zoro's intense pressure, the chief necromancer trembled and confessed truthfully. Someone you believe without a doubt is stronger than you. That person we summoned here. Toji? Gorjo and Zoro followed the traces left by the necromancers and entered a building. Then, a sound was heard. Dong do dong dong. Dong do dong dong. As the sound of drums reached their ears, Gorjo and Toji frowned. What is this sound? Under different circumstances, they might have found the rhythm quite lively. Zoro stopped abruptly, unknowingly. Toji turned to look at him. What's wrong? However, Zoro couldn't respond to Toji's question. He hadn't heard it at all. Dong do dong dong. Dong do dong dong. Once again, the drum sound echoed, and a fierce wind blew. A powerful conqueror's haki, like blood red lightning, exploded from deep within the building, sweeping over the three men and spreading far and wide. Question mark exclamation point what is this Toji's body tingled. Wow, this is no joke. Gorjo whistled. It was an enormous conqueror's haki. If they hadn't evacuated all the non-sorcerers from the nearby village beforehand, they surely would have all fainted. Without realizing it, Zoro clenched his fist tightly. Ash dong do dong dong. Dong do dong dong. Many called this sound the drum of liberation. But to Zoro, it was the heartbeat of just one person. It was the sound of Luffy. Deep inside an underground building, the body of a boy, 
tightly bound in chains, moved with a thud. After moving, it made another sound, thud. Then again, it bounced like a rubber ball. Dong do dong dong. Dong do dong dong. Following that rhythm, the body that should not have moved bounced like a rubber ball. The chains touching the boy's body stretched like rubber, and then contracted repeatedly. The boy's body turned completely white. His hair, eyebrows, and clothes were as white as a freshly drawn picture on a blank canvas. His eyebrows curled like whirls, and his hair twisted like burning flames. His closed red eyes slightly opened. The boy blinked dumbly. Where am I? His eyes popped out like stretched rubber, then retracted. The boy flexed his arms. Here goes. Crack. The boy inflated his body like a balloon, breaking the chains binding him as if they were rubber bands. With a foggy mind, he looked around. He was in an unfamiliar place, and there was no one around. The boy, wearing a cloak made of steam, scratched the back of his head and said, Am I not dead? He had said goodbye to everyone last time. People were coming. The boy, sensing this with his observation haki, turned his gaze towards the door. His observation haki naturally focused on the presence of the person standing in the forefront. The presence of a very powerful person who seemed to wander for a short distance before finding the way was familiar to Luffy. No. More precisely, very familiar the door creaked open. There stood a man the boy could not possibly fail to recognize. His first mate, who had started the pirate journey with him. Luffy. Zoro called the boy's name. His grey eyes were dilated to their limit because it was unbelievable. After all, Luffy was supposed to be dead. But that was something Zoro realized a bit too late about himself as well. Is this real? That small doubt disappeared completely when he saw Luffy's grinning mouth stretching up to his ears. Luffy, smiling brightly enough to show his gums, cheerfully shouted, Zoruju. Luffy's arms stretched like rubber bands, wrapping tightly around Zoro before Toji could even intervene, and with a snap, Luffy flew towards Zoro. You who? Slap. Luffy stuck to Zoro's body. Zoro didn't fall over, but he staggered a few steps back from the impact. Luffy hugged Zoro tightly and laughed loudly. Ah ha ha ha. It's been so long, Zoro. Toji, who noticed Zoro late, silently observed Luffy clinging to Zoro without malice. What was even more astonishing was the power emanating from Luffy. What kind of power is this? The strength felt through his observation Haki was incredibly immense. He had never felt such a presence except from Gorjo and Zoro. It was as if the earth danced along with every beat of the boy's heart. Each time the boy bounced, the ground too bounced like rubber. Toji carefully observed this and roughly figured out the nature of the power. Does he impart rubber-like properties not only to himself, but also to his surroundings. It was a ludicrous ability, but if a person with such a massive presence had this power, it told a different story. Keeping his guard up, Toji quietly tolerated Luffy's antics and asked Zoro, Son, do you know him? Zoro paused for a moment, wondering how to explain, then said the first thing that came to his mind. He's my captain. The only one, no matter how many lives he lived. The Straw Hat crew had disbanded, so strictly speaking, Luffy was no longer Zoro's captain. However, Zoro had no intention of introducing Luffy as anything but his captain. Captain, of course, to Gorjo and Toji, who knew nothing of this situation. This came out of the blue. Zoro is my mate. Luffy interjected with a bright smile on his face. Mate, we were pirates. Oh, are we not anymore? Luffy tilted his head in confusion. Zoro, didn't our crew disband? That's why... Do you have a problem with me calling you Captain Pirate King? No way, SSSHHH. Luffy's arms and legs stretched like rubber, wrapping even tighter around Zoro. Happiness, joy, affection. The boy's red eyes, gazing at Zoro, were tender. Affection that would never change overflowed in his expression and gestures. Toji remembered the only person who had once looked at him with similarly affectionate eyes long ago. It was Chie. Gorjo made a sound. Hmm. If you're pirates, are you bad guys? Hey. Who are you? I'm Gorjo Satoru. Luffy nodded as if he understood. Ah, Sato, it's Satoru. Zoro facepumped. Sorry, our captain is an idiot. Luffy, this is Gorjo Satoru. He's my friend. Upon hearing the word friend, Luffy exclaimed oh, and his eyes sparkled. Zoro's friend, nice to meet you. Hey, and who is this guy? He's my father. His name is Zenin Toji. He's my precious family, Zoro added. Luffy blinked his large eyes and asked. Zoro, you have a father. Well, yeah, strictly speaking, it just happened. But anyway, I have siblings too. Sumiki and Megumi. Really, I want to meet them. I want to meet them. Hold on. Hold on. What about my question? Aren't you going to answer? Gorjo reminded him of his question, which seemed to have been sucked into the depths like it had gone under the sea. Luffy finally turned his head towards Gorjo, as if he just realized it. Ah, what did you ask? You said you're a pirate. Yeah, 
So, pirates are bad guys. Usually, pirates are indeed bad guys. Luffy responded in a matter-of-fact tone to Gorjo's question. Hum, Gorjo paused, lost in thought. When he had met Zoro, and how he had taken Zoro under his command there, were mountains of questions he wanted to ask. But there was one thing he needed to ask first. So, are you planning to do bad things here too? Gorjo, like Toji, recognized Luffy's strength at a glance. It would take both Gorjo, Satoru and Zoro to fully block the boy in front of them. But Zoro definitely called Luffy his captain. Unbelievable as it was, it meant Zoro acknowledged Luffy as his superior. Even if Gorjo and Zoro were friends, if Gorjo and Luffy's intentions conflicted, Zoro was likely to follow the person he recognized as his lord. He's quite stubborn that way. Even if you are Zoro's captain, I can't just sit back and let pirates plunder and rule this place. Gorjo said in a playful yet chilling voice. Hanging onto Zoro's upper body and listening to the conversation, Luffy burst into a clear laugh. I don't do stuff like ruling. I'm the Pirate King. Pirate King. The freest person in this world. Like air escaping a balloon, a mysterious white aura seeped out from Luffy's entire body. His hair returned to black, and in an instant, Luffy looked like he had aged like an old man. Gorjo was taken aback. What's happening? Zoro clicked his tongue and lifted Luffy onto his back. It's because it's a technique that consumes a lot of life force. He'll be like this for a while. Isn't it dangerous? There's nothing medical science can do. We have to wait. It wasn't a disease or injury, but a consumption of life force itself. So there was no way to heal it. Luffy whined from Zoro's back. I'm so hungry. I'll buy you some meat. Just wait. It was payday three days ago. And all that money would go into feeding Luffy. Sensing what was to come, Zoro sighed deeply. Chomp, 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 chomp. Nabara rubbed her eyes as she watched the scene of arms stretched like rubber, wrapping around and pulling a tray piled high with food. What's going on? Have I lived too long? So, the energy leaks out from those who can't control their power and creates curses. Are you listening, Luffy? No. All right, just eat then. The restaurant, which Zoro had fully booked and was only occupied by sorcerers and a rubber man, resembled a battlefield. As soon as dishes filled with food were served, they disappeared into a mouth, and as soon as they appeared, they vanished. Zoro, accustomed to this, just ate while Gorjo filmed Luffy with his smartphone. Toji was counting the plates, calculating how much this was going to cost. Gorjo exclaimed, well, are his insides rubber too? It seemed so given how his body swelled like a balloon. Nom, 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 Luffy kept stuffing chunks of meat into his mouth regardless of what Gorjo was saying. Itadori Yuji rubbed his eyes. Hey, Megumi, this isn't a dream, right? It's not. It might have been better if it were. Megumi, calculating how much Zoro's money would be depleted by this single meal, felt his consciousness wane and closed his eyes tightly. Yuji asked worriedly, is it okay? That guy seems like he's eaten food for 50 people. Brother said he could eat for 100. He said he was prepared to use up his entire salary. Wow, how much is a special grade sorcerer's salary that he could spend it all in one day? And on just one meal. But looking at the towering stack of empty plates, Nabara thought that perhaps that much money was indeed needed. A boo boo, what boo boo boo, what boo boo. Luffy mumbled something with his cheeks full of food. Of course, everyone except Zoro couldn't understand a word. Zoro poured water into Luffy's glass and said, finish eating, then talk. Should I? Whoosh. Luffy scooped up food into his mouth voraciously. The restaurant owner was sweating, proud of having seen much as a non-sorcerer born into a family of sorcerers. This was still a first for him. Excuse me, what did that person just say? It's delicious. Especially this. At Zoro's explanation, Luffy vigorously nodded. Toji shook his head, unable to understand. How do you even understand him? Just do. Since they first met, Zoro had somehow been able to roughly understand Luffy's heart without much spoken word. How? Well, who knows? Sumiki rushed into the restaurant breathlessly. Sorry, I'm late. Oh my. Sumiki's eyes widened as she took in the scene inside the restaurant. Seeing Sumiki, Zoro's expression softened. Sumiki, Megumi. Come over here. He had someone to introduce them to. Sumiki and Megumi approached the table where Zoro, Luffy, Gorjo, and Toji were sitting. Zoro pulled Luffy's cheek to turn his attention and said, Luffy, these are my siblings. The girl is Sumiki, and the boy is Megumi. Gulp. Luffy swallowed the meat he was chewing. After thumping his throat twice, the meat stuck in his throat slid down. His stomach, which had been inflated like a balloon, deflated back to its normal size with a gurgling sound. Regardless of Megumi's stunned look, Luffy grinned and said, Hello, I'm Monkey D. Luffy. 
the Pirate King. What's your relationship with my brother? Despite Megumi's gaze that seemed to view Luffy as something draining his brother's wallet, Luffy just beamed. He's my precious crewmate. Megumi looked at Zoro, and sensing what that gaze meant, Zoro confirmed, it's true. He's the one I follow. My brother. Yes. It was hard for Megumi to believe. Zoro was someone who never bowed his head to anyone. Not even their father, Toji. The idea that Zoro would follow someone was difficult for Megumi to accept. Why? The question slipped out of Megumi's mouth before he realized it. He looked at Luffy, who hadn't heard him and was busy stuffing more meat into his mouth. Zoro shrugged. Because he's worth it. Despite being a total troublemaker who can't sit still, a parasite that makes no sense, and a fool with an empty head. Zoro had never once thought that Luffy wouldn't become the Pirate King. If he wasn't cut out for it, he wouldn't have followed him in the first place. The world's greatest swordsman. Sounds about right. If I'm going to be a companion of the Pirate King, I need to be at that level. Luffy's response to Zoro's declaration that he'd have to atone with his life if his ambitions were thwarted was. Luffy is going to be the Pirate King. In the end, it was Zoro who had forsaken both ambition and promise in the face of Luffy's life. Luffy doesn't know about that day's events, and has no intention of ever telling him. A few of the crew might know, but they've also kept silent. It wasn't a deed done for recognition or to show off. Luffy was just someone who shouldn't have died. With his mouth full of food, Luffy asked, So Zoro, you've really become strong. What happened? Hum. Oh, a lot has happened. Tell me. Zoro asked nonchalantly, and Luffy replied, Not now. Later. As he continued to stuff more meat into his mouth, Zoro nodded and then, without looking, used his fork to stab at the hand reaching for the meat on his plate. Of course, Luffy dodged it with his observation haki. That's too much. You have your own. Yours looks tastier. Anyway, Tsumiki watched the scene quietly for a moment. Having lived in the same house as Zoro for over a decade as siblings, she knew him too well. Zoro dislikes having people around. It wasn't that he hated people or couldn't socialize, he just found it bothersome. Thus, even though he mingled well once he was in company, he rarely initiated interaction. His expression was intimidating, and his manner of speaking was very direct and blunt, so people outside the Sorcerer Society seldom approached Zoro casually. The same goes for people in the Sorcerer Society. He was infamous in the sorcerer world from a young age as someone who knew nothing but cutting curses. Of course, Zoro had his family including Tsumiki, and he formed his own groups with people he got along with. He was indifferent to people's murmurs, but Tsumiki felt sad about it. He's a good person. However, since Zoro seemed fine and not lonely as he was, Tsumiki didn't press further. For Zoro to have someone he followed meant more people for him to protect and care for. And that was worrying yet a good thing for Tsumiki. Zoro always had to protect and be responsible for others. But now there was someone to look after and take responsibility for Zoro. Following his captain would naturally lead Zoro to meet many people. Of course, this depended on Luffy being a good person who would actively protect Zoro. But Tsumiki had no doubts about that. The person brother Zoro decides to follow couldn't be bad, right? You said your name is Luffy, right? Yes. Please take good care of my brother. He's a good person. I know. Zoro is a good guy. Luffy grinned broadly as his rubber arms stretched and wrapped around Zoro. Sumiki hesitated for a moment and then said to Luffy, My brother might think he doesn't need protection because he's the strongest, but please fight alongside him anyway. Being the strongest doesn't mean he can't get hurt. Being the strongest doesn't mean he doesn't need help from others. In the end, no one can live in this world alone. Luffy chuckled. Of course, Zoro is my crewmate. Luffy can't sword fight, navigate, lie, cook, practice medicine, study archaeology, build ships, play music, or steer a ship. Despite having so many shortcomings, Luffy could rise to the position of King of the Sea because he had many friends and crewmates. Crushing the enemies of his friends and crew was the only thing Luffy was good at. He never considered the identity or strength of the opponents, nor the circumstances behind their actions or who was at fault. Even if his crew tried to stop him or refused to come to his rescue, Luffy didn't care. He never intended to listen to the circumstances, and even if he did, he wasn't smart enough to understand them. Luffy simply crushed his crew's enemies and protected his crew. In that sense, there was something Luffy had to ask Zoro. Let's go, Zoro. Where to? Anywhere. Hold on, wait. Luffy wrapped his arm around Zoro and darted out of the window. Toji immediately tried to follow but paused when he saw Zoro's mouth shake the word, wait. By then, Luffy and Zoro had already disappeared into the distance. Gorjo peeked out the window. They're gone. Where did they go? They're idiots, so probably somewhere high up. Whatever those two idiots would discuss was anyone's guess. Toji sighed as he looked at the card Zoro left behind and the long bill. 
Seeing the restaurant owner timidly approaching, Luffy, with a yup, pulled himself up to the rooftop of the building using his hand. Zoro also jumped up and landed softly next to him. Looking out over the city filled with dense buildings from the rooftop, Luffy exclaimed, Awesome. Yeah, it was a place Zoro also liked. The view of Tokyo from the rooftop of the tallest building nearby was indeed impressive. Zoro calculated the chances of Luffy being caught on CCTV or smartphone cameras as he stretched his arms up the building. Then just let it go. It would be strange if there wasn't some commotion with Luffy around. Rules of sorcery or whatever controlling Luffy was impossible. And as a crewmate, it shouldn't even be attempted. The authority to decide what the crew does belongs solely to the captain. As a crewman, Zoro's role was merely advisory at best. Even then, Zoro hardly ever thought of advising. Leaving it to Chopper, Yusup, and Nami to hold him back has always been the way. A faint smile appeared on Zoro's face as he remembered those dear faces. What did you come all the way here to say? Zoro easily realized that Luffy had something to discuss privately, hence this escapade. Luffy turned to Zoro with a rare serious expression. Hey Zoro. Yeah, were you dead? Blink. Zoro closed his eyes briefly, then reopened them. It wasn't that he thought Luffy wouldn't notice. After all, compared to his past life, the scar on his chest had disappeared, his age was different, and both his eyes were intact. And Luffy had good intuition. There was no way he wouldn't notice such a fundamental change in his crewmate. Luffy's face was unusually somber. Unlike usual, his face was expressionless, showing no emotions. But Zoro knew. He's angry. Extremely so. The Conqueror's Haki was boiling with deep anger and hostility. Uncontrolled flashes of dark red lightning from Luffy's Conqueror's Haki appeared and disappeared around his arms. Crackle, crackle, sparks of black lightning flew. Zoro was unfazed, but with such a level of Conqueror's Haki, any ordinary person would faint from a great distance away from Luffy, if he weren't consciously suppressing it. Considering Luffy's current intensity, if he were to fully unleash his Conqueror's Haki, everyone in Tokyo's Minato ward who wasn't a sorcerer might faint. It wasn't good for Luffy, nor for Zoro. Zoro didn't really want to talk about it. Talking about his death would only make Luffy feel guilty. But seeing Luffy's face demanding an answer, he couldn't lie or remain silent. Yeah, I was dead. I told you to live as you wished. That final command to live as he wished was something Luffy had said only to Zoro among all the crew. Why he had said that only to Zoro, Luffy himself didn't know. It just felt right to say it to Zoro at that moment. Zoro shrugged. I lived as I wanted to. He had never aimed to die. There were just things that had to be done with the readiness to die. And he did them but ended up dead. You did too. Luffy pursed his lips. He seemed to have a lot of grievances, but couldn't figure out how to express them. His pouting look reminded Zoro of Megumi and he let out a small laugh. From the rare bits of conversation that stuck in Luffy's mind, he knew that this place was very different from their past life. After dying, were you reborn here? Yeah. When did you die? At 23. Not an old age, but such was the life of a swordsman and a pirate. From the moment Zoro aimed to be the strongest swordsman, he had been prepared for death, and he faced it calmly. The irony of a person like that living a second life was absurd. Zoro sighed. Explaining how it all happened was complicated. It's not like I ate a devil's fruit like Brook. It just turned out this way. While he lived with no regrets and to the fullest, he had no intention of defying death. Zoro, who should have met an ordinary end, was pulled from the cycle of death due to someone's interference, and was reborn in another world. Who killed Zoro? Not who but whose. And I took care of them all. All of them. All of them. An alliance of remnants from the old era, displaced by the new era Luffy had ushered in. Zoro faced them alone, and his sword thoroughly destroyed them. The main officers were defeated in battles with Zoro, and were left unable to fight again, while the lesser ranks were knocked out by his conqueror's haki, and swept away by rough waves. Even if the lesser ranks survived by luck, with the officers in that state, reassembling was impossible. Complete annihilation. That was the end they met. I'm not sure exactly how many there were. Probably tens of thousands, maybe even millions. It was several times, perhaps dozens of times, more than the 100,000 troops I saw in Fishman Island. But in front of Zoro with Conqueror's Haki, it hardly mattered. What about the others? They're all safe. It was just that there was no time to call them. Although the Straw Hat crew had disbanded, they still kept in touch periodically. If Zoro had called, they would have gladly come to help. But after the disbandment, they were living in their respective hometowns and regions. It would have taken time for them to reach where Zoro was. The situation at the time was too urgent to wait. The remnants of the old era were about to execute a plan that would ruin the entire world, along with the new era. And naturally, 
Zoro couldn't just watch. So, Zoro fought alone and defeated them all. He smashed each of their members, permanently thwarting their plans, and saved and protected what he wanted to save. It was something even Whitebeard had not accomplished. It was certainly a victory for Zoro, both as a battle and a war. No shame, no regrets, no lingering attachments. For a pirate, as well as a swordsman, it was a fitting end. So don't cry, Zoro said, looking at Luffy's face, twisted from forcibly holding back tears. It wasn't bad. Luffy leaped up and wrapped his arms around Zoro as if cocooning him. It seemed like a gesture meant to comfort Zoro, but it also seemed as if he was clinging to a lifeline. The memory of his brother dying right before his eyes while trying to save him was a wound Luffy would never forget in his lifetime. The thought that Zoro too might have died defending his dream felt heart-wrenching. Luffy buried his face in Zoro's reliable embrace and mumbled. I'm sorry Zoro. Protecting the era wasn't Zoro's job. It was something Luffy was supposed to do. Zoro scoffed. Don't apologize. Pirates don't apologize for acting on their beliefs. Both Luffy and Zoro. They just lived and died that way. Luffy hugged Zoro's neck a bit tighter. Was it okay here? Somewhat. He had to let go of all his connections from the previous life. But here too. He found precious people, family, friends, those who had either disappeared without leaving memories or died leaving painful ones in his past life. They weren't the same people or the same meanings as before, but now, Zoro's family and friends are alive and by his side. There had been various incidents, but it wasn't bad, really. Luffy spoke in a trembling voice. I'm glad that you're okay that we could meet again, Luffy. I'm so relieved. Luffy, bursting into tears and snot like a fountain, hugged Zoro's face so tightly with his legs that it was almost suffocating. Zoro, caught off guard, also hugged Luffy back with his arms to support him. Luffy, crying profusely, tightened his embrace around Zoro. It was the first time Zoro had seen Luffy cry this much, which left him a bit stunned. For some reason, there was a tightening in his chest. I'm sorry. I missed Yao Yu. Yeah, me too. You way are. I'm glad. I'm glad. Luffy repeated these words. Zoro, feeling Luffy's heart thumping like a drum and his warmth like the sun in May, said, it is fortunate that we could meet again. The next day, Zoro was sound asleep, leaning against a giant tree in the old schoolyard. Luffy was sparring and playing around near Zoro with Yuji. Is it really okay to hit? Yeah, go for it. Here I come. Yuji clenched his fist surrounded by a blue aura. His fist wrapped in energy, struck Luffy who was standing still. Converging strike. A second surge of energy shook Luffy's body with a loud bang. Yuji hesitated, feeling like he had hit a sturdy rubber doll. Luffy laughed with a hiss. It doesn't work. Thunk, Luffy countered Yuji's punch and swung his arm. My turn. Gum gum gatling. Ratatatat. Yuji, terrified by the rain of punches, rolled frantically on the ground to dodge them. Megumi, observing the scene, muttered, he uses the properties of rubber to distribute the impact of the hits throughout his body. As Megumi was assessing the ability, a question occurred to him. But with this method, wouldn't slicing or stabbing attacks cause damage as they land? Yeah, that's tough. You talk about it so casually, Nabara. Standing nearby, rolled her eyes at Luffy's naive affirmation. Were there times you faced swordsmen as enemies? What did you do then? I left it to Zoro. And what do you do? I blow away those who need to be blown away. And when you're not fighting? Yep, I play. Luffy was both reliable and carefree. Nabara looked at him with mixed feelings. Luffy turned his head to one side. Following his gaze, Nabara noticed Toji, who had silently approached and sighed. Make some noise when you arrive, teacher. Sorry, I was born this way. Toji gestured towards the back. Gorjo is calling the first year students in the classroom. Go check. Having been fooled by Toji's pranks before, Megumi narrowed his eyes. Really? Unfortunately, it's true. Go to the staff room. Yuji waved cheerfully at Luffy. I think I need to go. Thanks for the training, Mr. Luffy. The three first year students left the scene. Toji looked at Zoro, who was fast asleep leaning against a large tree, and then shifted his gaze to Luffy. Luffy asked, Sir, did you come to see Zoro? That too. He also wanted to check on Luffy. It was clear that there was a deep trust between them. However, what made Toji uneasy was probably because he had experienced and dealt evil from his very nature. Luffy stretched his neck to examine Toji. Disliking the attention as if he were a spectacle, Toji frowned, prompting Luffy to sheepishly pull back. Sir, you're Zoro's dad. But you don't look much like him. Toji chuckled. Dad. Huh. That was a term he had never heard even when Zoro was a baby. So, is that strange? No. I don't look much like my dad either. Luffy wasn't very close to his biological father, Dragon. He had fought alongside Dragon's revolutionary army. But that was more for Sabo than for Dragon. It seems you're different from my dad. Luffy was aware that Dragon was his dad. But he rarely considered him precious. After all, he had barely seen his face. 
What's different? Zoro said you're his precious family. I've never called my dad that. Luffy muttered. He had no bad feelings, but no particularly good feelings either. Luffy's attitude towards Dragon was strictly neutral. Precious family Toji momentarily felt a surge of emotion, but suppressed it. I'm not the kind of person who deserves to hear those words. I haven't done much for him. Zoro had grown up mostly on his own. Toji hadn't really done much. Toji's gaze returned to Zoro, who was sleeping peacefully. Luffy suddenly asked, Sir, are you worried about Zoro? Toji, realizing that Luffy was as adept with observation haki as Zoro, said, because he suffered a lot because of me. He just hoped that Zoro wouldn't have to go through such hardships this time. Anyone would be better than that. Please take good care of my son. I hope he can be happy. Because Luffy is a good and strong person, I finally want Zoro to be happy without any worries. But Toji, knowing that happiness thought to be free of obstacles can also collapse in an instant, could only offer a warning instead of encouragement. If you ever betray my son's trust, I don't care who you are or what powers you have, I will come and kill you. It didn't matter whether Luffy was a good or bad person. Whatever the reason, if Luffy ever abandoned Zoro, Toji would do whatever it took to retaliate. Luffy listened to Toji's words without getting angry. With no change in expression, he nodded. Okay, thank you sir, for being there for Zoro while I was away. Being alone is really unpleasant. It was fortunate that Zoro didn't have to be. Creek. Sensing a powerful presence, Luffy and Toji quickly turned their heads towards the sky. Zoro also snapped open his eyes and got up from his spot. The blue sky was turning into a blaze, and a giant red curtain seemed to be forming. Suddenly appearing via high-speed movement, Gorjo joined them with a flick next to Zoro. What's that? Not sure. It was still unclear. But one thing was certain, something was definitely happening. Luffy focused his observation haki on the red curtain. Faint voices penetrated through the thick barrier, caught by his haki. Fluor. Jean. After coming all this way, I will it. Prepare the goods. Catching these presences, the corners of Luffy's mouth lifted almost to his ears. A clear excitement also appeared on Zoro's face. Luffy and Zoro exchanged glances. No words were needed. Just that was enough to know what each was planning to do. Luffy asked with a grin, 3000. Do as you like. If he could fight alongside Luffy again, the name of the technique hardly mattered. Zoro drew his three swords, and Luffy swung his arms round and round. Bang. Powerful armament Haki and Conqueror's Haki enveloped both their weapons and hands. A golden aura surrounded Luffy's body, while a green aura radiated around Zoro's. Crack. Pop. The two simultaneously leaped into the air. As they reached the front of the red curtain, Gum Gum 3000 grip. Both their weapon and fist moved at the same time. Cannon. Cannon. Their powerful combined attacks struck the red curtain. The rippling barrier shattered, and a red ship with a sun-like prow burst through the broken sky. Toji, with his superior vision, saw the figures of the people falling from the ship in the sky. Two women, two men, and four unidentifiable things. Robots, raccoons, and pink hats. Something big and blue, could that be a skeleton? Toji couldn't quite process the sight of the skeleton laughing and crying with a yo ho ho ah ha 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 Regardless of Toji's astonishment, as Luffy and Zoro fell from the sky, they beamed with joy taking in their precious crew. Luffing, Zoruro. From a distance, a young woman with long tangerine-colored hair cried out. A slightly older-looking woman with black hair smiled and crossed her hands over her chest. Mil Fleurs, Gigantesco Mano. Numerous hands bloomed like flowers from the ground, intertwining to form two giant hands. Before the airborne ship landed on the school building, the giant hands gently caught the colorful red ship and carefully set it down in an empty lot. Then, like a lie, they disappeared leaving behind pink petals. The people aboard the ship disembarked and rushed down in a swarm. A man with a long nose ran, tears and snot streaming down his face. Luffing, Zaruro. It's been a while, everyone. The skeleton waved its hands, running so fast its legs seemed to disappear. I'm so glad to see you, Mr. Luffy, Mr. Zoro. Yo a ho ho. A blonde man laughed, cigarette in mouth, always getting into trouble. The raccoon transformed into a deer-like shape, then sprinted from the ship. Luffing, Zoro. I've really missed you. From the deer-like shape, the small raccoon with the hat leaped towards Luffy. Following him, the long-nosed man also jumped into their arms. I was so worried, missed you. Sorry, calm down, Usopp. You think you could calm down? Huh, Zoro. Usopp, tears and snot flowing, grabbed Zoro's collar and shook him violently. Nami, tears in her eyes, wore a stern expression. Always making us worry. You all just racked up another 100,000 berries in debt. Nami. How did you get here? We found you with your Viva cards. Sanji showed Luffy and Zoro's Viva cards. When Luffy and Zoro were presumed dead, 
the crew had seen their Viva cards burn and disappear completely. After the disbandment, the crew each had their own Viva cards made to keep track of each other's safety even if they couldn't contact one another. Luffy had personally taken care of their bodies, and while Zoro didn't handle the bodies, he did confirm the two of his swords that survived, except for his Wado Ichimonji. However, unbelievably, their Viva cards regenerated later. Zoro's first, then Luffy's. Although Luffy's Viva card was worn and creased, it was different from before, it was clear that Luffy was alive. The reappearance of Zoro's Viva card had already prompted the crew to search for Zoro's whereabouts from their respective locations. The resurgence of Luffy's Viva card gave them a definite reason to come together. Finding the dimensional gateway where Luffy and Zoro were and pinpointing the time took some effort, but none of the crew members minded the trouble. Sanji took a drag on his cigarette, removed it from his mouth, and exhaled the smoke before saying to Luffy, if you're alive, why should we stay put, Luffy? Shishishi, thanks. Luffy extended his arms to embrace all his friends, bouncing around happily. I'm so happy. Chopper, who had been giggling, suddenly snapped to attention. Ah, this isn't the time. Luffy, Zoro, come to the medical room, right now. Hey, I'm fine, Chopper. Stop talking nonsense, Zoro. You both, just once Chopper's eyes welled up with tears, looking like they might burst any moment. The reindeer-like chopper then hoisted Luffy up. Zoro, you come here too. I'm going to examine you. Sanji moved next to Zoro, teasing him. Listen to Chopper, Marimo. Before you dry out like a piece of seaweed. Hey, what did you say, curly eyebrows? Think you can take me on, stupid swordsman? Should I go easy on you? Bring it on. Zoro and Sanji began charging at each other to start a fight. Unlike the straw hat crew, who were used to such scenes, Gorjo and Toji were mentally overwhelmed at that moment. It was the moment when the straw hat pirates, who had changed the world, came together once again. UG. If Mr. Luffy's nickname was Pirate King, what was Senior Zoro's nickname? Nami. He had more than one or two. The most enduring nickname was probably Pirate Hunter used from before and after he became a pirate. In East Blue, where Zoro and I are from, he was also called the Beast. Brook. Yo a ho ho. After defeating that person, Zoro was often called the world's strongest swordsman or Enma, King of Hell. Frankie. Because he's super right. Sanji. Stupid Marimo. Zoro. You wanna die? Toji. What's this? Robin. It's Zoro's bounty poster. Toji. He counts the endless zeros with his eyes. Toji. How much is this amount? Robin. Well, I'm not sure about the currency system here, so it's hard to say. Robin. But apart from some organization heads, Zoro is the only one with a bounty over 4 billion berries in our entire world. Toji. I must look like a small-time criminal in comparison. Shoko. Reports of babies being born unusually large or small or with horns on their heads, are coming from all over the world. Genetic tests show they're perfectly human, and they're related to their parents. Zoro, we have such humans in our world too. Jito, a newborn the size of a three-year-old. Jin, I don't know about this world, but in the world we lived in, such humans are quite common. There are also many non-human intelligent species. I myself am a fish man, not human. Gorjo. Can fish men breathe underwater? Swim as fast as fish. Jin. Ha ha ha. Exactly right. Gorjo. Really? Jito. The world is turning upside down. Gorjo. It already was where Zoro and I were born. Shoko. Thanks for cooperating. I was curious about the structure of a cyborg. Frankie. Or, if you want to know more about my super features, just ask anytime. Shoko. The remaining one is this person, Brooke. I don't understand how he functions physiologically with nothing but bones. Maybe I should detach each bone for examination. Brooke, could you please not talk about such scary things? Despite how I may appear, I am older than you by at least 60 years. Unless you show me your panties, perhaps. Shoko? Ah, uh, I'd rather not. Brooke, that's too bad, Chopper. I've researched necromancy with Yeri. It seems that the person used as Luffy's host was specially modified to be suitable for necromancy. The ego was already dead. That's why Luffy's condition is relatively stable. Chopper. If I have my medicine, he could last about 10 years in this necromant state. Chopper. What will you do, Luffy? I want to adventure again. Luffy said brightly in front of his crew. Zoro's world seems interesting too. While it wasn't a world as mysterious and unpredictable as their previous lives, there were adventures unique to this place. I'm not your captain anymore, so I'll say it once more. Luffy shouted with a wide smile. Become my crew. The straw hat crew exchanged glances. Typical, thought Nami. All right. All the crew members responded in unison. A week later, on a brightly sunny day, the straw hat crew once again raised their anchor and set sail. Not long after their departure, 
A 5 minute and 56 second video of the straw hat crew and sorcerers sent from the upper echelons, using devil fruit powers and haki in combat, was live streamed across various internet sites and social media platforms worldwide. As internet communities and the media debated the authenticity of the video, news broke in South Korea about the discovery of a new fruit marked with a strange swirl pattern. Soon after, reports of bizarre fruits with swirl patterns being found in several other countries were also broadcast. It was the connection of two worlds that should never have met. The exposure of the sorcerer world, unknown to the sorcerers, under entangled truths and laws, nothing could be assured anymore. Ash in the future, this would be regarded as the beginning of the great age of abilities, a change as impactful as the Industrial Revolution. Epilogue, the sun, the drum, and rubber completed. Zoro walked alone down the hallway of an empty high school. In the corridors of this ordinary high school, not a teacher or student was in sight. It was to be expected. Today was Sunday, and access was restricted under the pretext of interior construction, just in case someone might come. Step, step. Zoro walked past the women's restroom. Creek, a small, Blurry pair of lips appeared in the air near the women's restroom. It quietly made a sound. Did you hear? Pop. The air split again, revealing another translucent mouth. This time inside a classroom near the window. Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? As the mouths exchanged words, the lips multiplied. Above desks, in front of lockers, near the teacher's desk. Whisper. 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 Whisper, whisper, whisper. Numerous mouths moved in unison, producing an indecipherable sound. As the whispering continued, the lips proliferated endlessly. Initially, it was nearly indistinguishable noise. But as more mouths appeared, they began to produce clearer voices. A mouth spoke softly behind Zoro's back. Why? Like that? What's happening? Who? Ah, that one. It makes sense. That one. It was the same. Before. Now that you mention it. Now that you mention it. Now that you mention it. Zoro turned around. In that moment all those numerous mouths vanished as if they had never existed. Whisper. Whisper. Only vague, indistinct sounds brushed past his ears. Zoro looked at the space where the mouths had been moments before. As he turned back, the mouths timidly reappeared in the void and resumed their conversation. So annoying. A nuisance. Why do I have to be in the same class as him? It'll be heard. Let it be heard. That's the only way to fix it. He deserves to be embarrassed. Don't go near him. Don't talk to him. Ignore him. The more they talked, the more the mouths multiplied. One became two, two became four, four became eight, eight became sixteen. With each sound that came from the mouths, their color became more vividly red, resembling that of living humans, and they gained a clearer form. Soon, the hallway was completely filled with mouths. Hundreds, thousands of them clustered together, swarming like insects in a red mass, and Zoro found himself surrounded. Zoro, unable to see spirits, couldn't see them, but he could hear them. Whisper, 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 whisper. Like the wings of night insects rubbing against each other, producing small and dirty noises. Not yet. He still needed to wait, until they gained a complete physical form. Screech. The sound was like a scream or the scraping of a chalkboard, and from Zoro's right ear, a trickle of blood ran down. His ears felt blocked, but Zoro remained motionless. Drip. One of the many mouths split open, spilling black blood onto the floor. As a single drop of ink black blood hit the ground, Zoro's eyes gleamed with recognition. Now was the time. He lowered his hand that had been covering his ear, and grasped the handle of his sword, Wado Ichimonji. Despite the blood trickling from his ear due to the tearing noise, Zoro unsheathed his sword. Slice. Then, the largest and most vivid mouth whispered, still as weak as ever, Zoro, in a voice identical to that of a chartered friend who had shared Zoro's early years. The ripple effect occurs. Like throwing a stone into water, his mind wavers. Confusion, humiliation, and anger shook Zoro's mind. Just like when he first heard those words, the largest mouth opened wide right under Zoro's feet. The enormous mouth seemed ready to swallow him whole, and began to mutter something, insignificant. Quung, seeing Zoro's fiery red gaze, the numerous mouths froze in place, unable to make a sound. They attempted to vanish into the void again but remained rigid, unable to move. With eyes shimmering red, Zoro coldly gazed at the spot where the numerous mouths gathered. He could distinctly sense the shape of the lips through his observation haki. If any of these make a sound, their numbers increase. If he aimed for them when there were only a few, 
their form would change into something that couldn't be killed by cutting. Therefore, he had to deliberately increase their numbers, forcing them to take a physical form as mounts. Silencing them first, then cutting them all at once was necessary. Like now, gripping Wado Ichimonji with both hands, Zoro, with his menacing grey eyes lit, announced one sword style, judgment. Shying, his pitch black blade swung down in a judging slash. Like being struck by lightning, the vision of the spirit split in two. The mouths attempted to speak, but were cleaved in half vertically and fell apart. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Every single mouth-shaped spirit was cut, turning into black ash and disappearing. Slush. Zoro sheathed his sword again. Whether it was a curse left by the purification or a characteristic of the spell itself, the negative emotions that had surfaced earlier did not dissipate. With a forced surge of irritation, a single tear, almost physiological, dropped. Zoro calmly wiped away the tear. It was like stepping into a hot spring on a cold winter day. His heart was indifferent, almost cold, yet it seethed with emotions felt long ago towards Kuina negative ones like anger, humiliation, and confusion. It's so transparent. It wasn't that all emotions felt towards Kuina were negative, but that only those were selectively remembered was too obvious. Zoro sneered at the pettiness of the spirit. Maybe losing composure supposedly enhances one's power. Or perhaps it was just in the nature of the spirit to mess with humans. From either perspective, it was something that should not have happened. Zoro's training was not so superficial that he would succumb to outdated anger. It wasn't only Kuina who had turned Zoro's insights with words. But considering that only Kuina's words come to mind, it seems that the spirit was born from the negative emotions in their friendship. A spirit that turns others insides with words. There was no fun in fighting, and it was annoying. Zoro stopped his thoughts and looked around. So where do we go now? Where had Yutom gone? While thinking, he heard her shouting from a distance. Zoro, Zoruro, where are you? Answer me. Yutam appeared at the stairs and was delighted to see Zoro. Zoro. Yutam hurried over and hesitated as she looked back and forth between a red mouth spirit disintegrating into black ash, and Zoro's face, which was calmly shedding tears. Don't be sad. It doesn't hurt. It's because of the ritual. Before Yutam could misunderstand, Zoro quickly wiped his tears with his sleeve and explained. Was there a spirit? Yeah. What grade? I don't know. The spirit wasn't very powerful in itself. It was just difficult to exorcise. Are you really okay? Of course. Looking at Zoro's face, which seemed more irritated than sad, Yudham felt a bit relieved. Still worried, she checked his condition and noticed blood stains on his ear. Wait, you're hurt. Yudham exclaimed loudly in surprise, but then closed her mouth. Zoro remained calm. Oh, right. It was a bit muffled, but he could still hear well enough. Yutam gasped and stopped Zoro's hand as he casually tried to touch his ear. Not oh, right. Are you really not in pain? Not much. Yutam, who had come close, carefully wiped the blood that had trickled to Zoro's ear with her sleeve. Zoro, noticing Yutam's white clothes, nonchalantly said, Blood doesn't come out of white clothes easily. Is that what's important? It's important. It's a hassle to wash. When he was a bounty hunter and couldn't find a clothes shop, Zoro had the experience of scrubbing a blood-stained white shirt in a stream, so he seriously advised her. Yutam looked at Zoro with astonishment, then whispered softly so as not to strain his ear. Don't worry, we can just buy a new one. Ah, in the 3D industry, work-life balance is ruined, the management is terrible, and being a shaman is a job you honestly can't even talk about what you do. But there was one good thing, and that was a generous salary. The base monthly wage was high, and there was a bonus for each high-grade spirit subdued. So the income was substantial. After Yutam had wiped off all the blood, she straightened up from her crouched position and stood up. Let's go show Shoko quickly, for just this little injury. You had blood coming from your ear, didn't you? Stop complaining and let's go. Yutam was holding Zoro's hand when she suddenly asked, But why were you here? The mission location is the middle school next door. Wasn't this the middle school? As Shoko Yeri was about to take a break after finishing her work, she sighed upon seeing Yudham and Zoro entering through the swinging doors of the infirmary. It had been over two months since Zoro had followed another sorcerer on a mission. During that time, Zoro had been frequenting the infirmary almost daily. Without even glancing at Yudham, Shoko looked straight at Zoro. Where did you get hurt today? Zoro, why do you automatically assume I got hurt? Experience. There hadn't been a single instance where the sorcerer Zoro was accompanying got seriously injured during a mission. It's nothing serious, don't talk nonsense. Yeri cut him off sharply. It was just as frustrating dealing with people who came asking for reversal rituals for trivial wounds as it was with someone like Zoro who underestimated his own injuries. Yutam pulled Zoro to a patient chair and explained. Here, he's bleeding from his ear. Let's see. Shoko inspected Zoro's ear with an otoscope a tool for examining the inside of the ears. 
She saw the Idrum covered in clotted blood. She calmly stated, your Idrum has burst. How did this happen? Zoro, a spirit made a noise. Today wasn't supposed to be an exorcism mission. It was supposed to be a simple task at the middle school, checking the condition of the protective charms, and replacing them if they were in poor shape. Shoko tilted her head in confusion. If it had seemed like a dangerous mission, she wouldn't have sent Yutem and Zoro alone. Yutem wasn't the right kind of sorcerer to be paired with Zoro on a mission. Actually, it's the worst combination. Yutem's spell was solo forbidden area. It amplifies the total power output of those within its range, including Yutem herself, for a certain period of time. It was a decent spell. Even without direct offensive capabilities, it was good for supporting allied sorcerers. That was as long as it was used to support sorcerers. The problem was right there. Zoro isn't a sorcerer. What good does it do to chant spells, form hand seals, dance, and sing to activate the spell? If Zoro isn't a sorcerer, the total power a non-sorcerer has compared to a sorcerer's is nothing more than a speck of dust. A speck of dust remains a speck of dust, no matter how much you try to expand it. No matter how hard you don't try, boosting Zoro's power to the level of a sorcerer was impossible. Similarly, even if you don't cast her spell on Toji, who had zero power, Toji didn't gain any power. Shoko, curious, had them try it out once. But the result was disappointing. While Zoro's power increased slightly, absolutely nothing happened to Toji. Gorjo burst out laughing at the sight. But after taking a hit from Toji, he stopped laughing and explained the reason. Yutaham's spell doesn't grant power to those who have none, it only amplifies the existing power. But multiplying zero by anything still gives you zero. In other words, all that had just been a pointless spectacle of Yutaham's dance and song. Yutaham, ticked off by the lively comment, chased after the fleeing Gorjo but couldn't manage to hit him. At that point, Shoko stopped thinking. So, really, why did Zoro get hurt on a simple mission that only required checking and replacing charms? This time, Yudham explained instead of Zoro. While I was replacing the charm, he went to the high school next door, not the middle school where the mission was. Wow, he really is a subject for study. How could that even happen? Shouldn't he be registered as directionally impaired by now? Despite such thoughts, Shoko didn't really think of Zoro as someone who should be classified as utterly devoid of directional sense. He did run well when focusing on the enemy, although sometimes he failed. Being directionally impaired isn't something that changes based on the situation or personal condition. It's an inescapable curse. Concentration or having a crucial enemy to defeat doesn't mean it can be overcome or ignored. It might make sense to consider him directionally impaired. Shoko put away the otoscope and, sitting in the chair, asked Zoro, who was blankly staring back at her. How's the pain? Bearable. You always say everything is bearable. Even when a curse that set Zoro's hand on fire was cast using a talisman by an enemy sorcerer last time, he had said it was bearable. The expression on teacher Toji's face at that time Shoko shook her head in dismay. I understand why the teacher is overprotective. Because he's unusually detached about his own injuries. That kid. If you used armament Haki, you wouldn't get hurt. But I don't know why you keep getting hurt on purpose. I need to practice using my sword, not just Haki. And this time, there was no other way. The spirit was essentially sound. Sound. More precisely, it was like human speech. The spirit Zoro encountered this time had sound as its substance, until the number of mouths increased enough to be physically cut down and destroyed. Armament Haki isn't a technique like an impenetrable shield that prevents attacks from reaching at all. It enhances physical defense and allows one to grasp the substance of the opponent. Sounds like a voice can't be blocked with Armament Haki, nor can they be killed by cutting. It was similar to Big Mom's living flame, Zeus. Though it's alive, its essence is still fire. So even if it's cut with a sword enveloped in Armament Haki, it won't die. Shoko muttered while putting a cigarette in her mouth. That was a tricky spirit. How did you get rid of it? Waited until its substance could be physically cut and killed. Yutaham noted down what Zoro said in her notebook. Since she was originally in charge of the mission, it was also her responsibility to report the mission details to the assistant supervisor. What grade do you think it was? Not sure. Maybe a second grade. If we're generous, it might be considered a first grade spirit. The spirit had the power of a second grade, but exorcising it was as difficult as a first grade spirit because of the numerous mouths that had to be dealt with all at once. Listening to Zoro's story, Shoko cheerfully said, let's report it as a first grade spirit, Senior Yudahim. That way, at least we'll earn more money. You sound like Senior Mei, Shoko. Yutem responded with a mixed expression. She grimaced and pressed her pen against her forehead. It was a second grade spirit. It was unusually strong for appearing at a school. Why a school? Places like schools and hospitals. 
where many people gather and negative emotions accumulate, are equipped with powerful charms to prevent spirits from arising. For instance, like the fingers of Ryom and Sukuna. This mission was also meant for that purpose. Although Zoro had ended up at the high school next door and dealt with an unexpected spirit, it seems we need to check the charms at that school. Senior. I agree, Shoko. Yutam looked down at her notebook with a troubled expression. Shoko silently finished the treatment. As she reached out her hand to perform a reversal ritual, Zoro stopped her. You don't need to. It'll heal if I just sleep. Yeri looked down at Zoro, incredulously. To some extent, he was right. Zoro had very high self-healing and resistance to curses. Whether it was because he was the son of Toji, who was famously resilient, or because he naturally had high recovery powers, was unclear. Ordinary curses or injuries would heal quickly just by resting. Even the eardrum he had injured today was already healing. With a swoosh, Shoko ignored Zoro's words and applied the reverse curse technique to his ear. I'm fine. You'll be going on another mission, right? If you get more injured then, I'll have to use more reversal rituals. Using the ritual now was cheaper in the long run. Yeri completed the reversal ritual and carefully checked if there were more injuries. Knock, knock. Someone knocked on the infirmary door. The voice of the assistant supervisor was heard from outside. Ms. Yori, are you there? Yes, come in. Yori hurriedly responded. The assistant supervisor entered the room, sliding the door open. I've been looking for you for a while. The assistant supervisor, who appeared tired and irritated, saw Zoro sitting in the chair, and his eyes widened. Fatigue, annoyance. Those emotions swept away from the assistant supervisor's face, leaving only one emotion in their place. Fear. A bead of sweat trickled down the young assistant supervisor's forehead. Yutaham looked at him, picturing a question mark above her head. The assistant supervisor bowed his head, unable to meet Zoro's gaze, and stuttered as he spoke. Why are you here? Because I got hurt. Unlike the assistant supervisor, who was sweating profusely, Zoro remained calm and tilted his head. Are you sick? No, I'm not. You look pale, and you seem to be shaking a bit. If you're sick, you should get treated before leaving. I'm, I'm fine. Really? Shoko quietly observed the assistant supervisor, who was shrinking, and Zoro, who was unfazed, then spoke evenly. Didn't you come here for something from Senior Yutam? Go ahead and speak. No, I, I can check it later. Excusing himself, the assistant supervisor hurriedly fled the infirmary. Zoro watched the assistant supervisor's retreating figure and tilted his head in confusion. Yutam scratched her head and turned to Zoro. Hey Zoro, what did you do to that guy? Nothing. But why did he fear you? Yutam swallowed her words. Shoko explained. He went on a mission with Zoro recently. Just as Zoro said, he hadn't really done anything to the assistant supervisor. It was just the process of dealing with the spirit that was a bit intense. It was supposed to be a simple mission to eliminate a third grade spirit. Indeed, there was a third grade spirit at the location. There was also a first grade spirit, which was the problem. Zoro had realized this as soon as they arrived at the mission location. Thus, he had the third grade sorcerer and the assistant supervisor wait outside and entered the mission site alone. When Zoro did not come out after a long time, the impatient assistant supervisor entered the building and fainted as soon as he saw Zoro. Honestly, it was understandable. The state of Zoro when he returned was so shocking that even Shoko was at a loss for words. He looked like he had been dipped into a giant ketchup bottle. Covered from head to toe in sticky, bright red blood, it was impossible to tell what color his clothes had been originally. Even his hair seemed coated in blood, obscuring its distinct green color. The only thing not red, his grey eyes, still shone brightly, as if the heat of battle lingered. There was no malice, hostility, or evil intent, yet people couldn't bring themselves to approach him. Even seasoned shamans were taken aback by his rough appearance. At that moment, Shoko, showing no sign of fear, approached Zoro while smoking a cigarette. When Shoko stopped in front of him, Zoro looked up at her. His calm grey eyes were not much different from usual. You're a mess. No place to wash up. Typical response. Shoko flicked her finger toward the infirmary. Let's go to the infirmary. Thinking it was impressive he could still move despite all the blood he had lost, Shoko considered this. Zoro calmly said, It's not my blood. It's not mine. Later, after Zoro had cleaned up, Shoko realized that he was right. Not a single drop of the blood Zoro was covered in had come from him. It wasn't the blood of a curse. It was human blood. Zoro had reported that there were no curse at the site, so it was probably the blood of a victim. It wasn't certain. The victim's body found at the scene was too damaged for even Yeri to analyze. Shoko thought of Jito and Gorjo. They were scum, but they were strong. But even they felt very different from Zoro. Because he's a sorcerer. Well, some people might think so. But Shoko disagreed. Even Toji 
who was not a sorcerer, couldn't invoke the same terror as Zoro. It just seems to be because it's Zoro. Zoro didn't particularly oppress or torment people. He only eliminated curse or curse users, and if someone asked for help, he generally helped willingly. Yet, there was something inescapable about him. It was a chilling sensation, like being prey in front of an overwhelming predator. It was incomprehensible how someone not a sorcerer could be so powerful at such a young age. It was an instinctual fear. It's not incomprehensible why one would want to avoid him. Though it wasn't a pleasant sight to see someone run away pale face from a person who had just saved their life. Fortunately, or unfortunately, Zoro didn't care that others feared or shunned him. He didn't mind if people feared him without reason or didn't thank him after he helped. It was both a blessing and a curse. People murmured when they saw Zoro. It was indeed a blessing that such a powerful being was on the side of the sorcerers, helping them. But the turmoil and fear that followed each time Zoro took action could only be described as a disaster. Of course, Shoko didn't think so. What disaster? He just liked helping people he cared about. Everything else was of no interest to him. Indeed, Zoro had been a great help in the battle. Shoko knew this better than anyone. In the two months that Zoro had been attached to the sorcerer's mission, no sorcerer's body had come to Shoko. She handled the post-mortem work to prevent the sorcerer's body from falling into the hands of the black market, or curse users for misuse as magical materials. Shoko, a reverse sorcerer and doctor, though unlicensed, had taken charge of this task. Recently, however, the frequency of these post-mortem operations had noticeably decreased. Instead, healing Zoro's wounds had taken its place. Yeri Shoko was neither foolish enough not to understand the significance, nor shameless enough to be pleased about it. Don't overdo it. She would have liked to say that it wasn't necessary. Knowing how many sorcerer's bodies would pile up in Zoro's absence, she couldn't say that. She knew that Zoro had saved several sorcerer's lives during the two months he was active. That's why she couldn't stop him. She didn't stop him. She silently applied a reverse sorcery on the injured Zoro. It's hypocrisy. Seeing that, she could fully understand why Toji disliked Zoro getting involved in the sorcery world. There were plenty in the sorcery community who thought of exploiting Zoro even more than Shoko did. Yutam stood up from her seat. I'll be going. Thanks for joining the mission today. Zoro, I'll share the bounty for exorcising the curses when it comes in. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Anything you want to buy. Swordsmanship gear. Like bamboo swords or training dummies. Things like that. You might find some of that in the arsenal already. Really? Perhaps he could even use the empty buildings of the arsenal to set up a dojo for sword training. Zoro was excited at the thought, reminiscing about the dojo in Shimatsuki village, where he had spent his childhood in a previous life. It wasn't long after Yutom had left the infirmary that the sound of chatter was heard. Click. The infirmary door opened, and Zoro's siblings appeared. Mezieri. Have you seen my bro or oh, big brother? When did you get here? Sumiki's face brightened up, and Zoro's expression softened. He jumped down from the patient's chair. Sumiki, Megumi, have you been having fun? Yes. But why are you here? Are you hurt? No, I'm not hurt. Sumiki and Megumi looked at Yeri as if questioning Zoro's statement. Zoro looked pleadingly at Shoko, but Shoko immediately told the truth. He's lying. Eek Shoko. Sumiki's expression darkened. Seeing her face, Zoro flinched. Big brother, it's all healed. Even if it's healed, you shouldn't get hurt. Megumi toddled over and poked Zoro on the nose with his finger. Big brother, lying is bad. Your nose will grow really long. Remembering the Pinocchio story they had read a few days ago, Megumi imagined Zoro with a nose that kept growing, with his hanging on like a sloth. That won't do. I'll treat you, big brother. I told you. I'm healed. I'm the doctor, Megumi's the nurse. You're the patient. Lie down here. Are you listening? No. Sai Tsumiki laid Zoro down on an empty bed in the infirmary. Ding. Her cell phone rang. A text message had arrived. The sender was Toji. Is something wrong with my son? Yeri frowned. Toji usually called Zoro directly when he was worried. He didn't typically send messages to Shoko. Zoro, do you have a phone call? Hum. Here. Oh, where did it go? Ah, uh, patients aren't supposed to talk. Well, I'm not a patient, am I? Had he lost it during a mission? Yeri quickly figured out the situation as she watched Zoro rummaging through his bandages. She rapidly typed a message on her cell phone. He's currently at the arsenal. His eardrum burst. Treated with reverse sorcery, Toji had to exert all his strength not to crush the cell phone he was holding after reading Yeri's message. What on earth happened? Well, he probably encountered a curse or curse user somewhere. Strangely, Zoro often got involved in troublesome situations whenever he went on missions. Even when it was a mission not supposed to be dangerous, something strange always happened. Like encountering a curse of higher grade than expected, 
coming across other curse users or curse during the mission, or finding not just one curse but several. It's that damn sense of direction of his. Cursed with a terrible sense of direction, Zoro always ended up taking paths that others avoided. There were reasons those paths were not frequented. They were filthy, had been the site of bad incidents or had bad rumors circulating about them. Negative emotions gathered places where curses also tended to gather. There was a reason Zoro frequently encountered curse. He has to go to school in a few weeks. Toji was extremely worried whether his son would even find his way to his class. I chose a private school where it would be easy to cover up any mishaps, just in case. He was already scared of what might happen. His eardrum burst. While Yeri's reverse sorcery was excellent, and he shouldn't worry too much, it still made him uneasy. Usually, if Zoro had been assigned a curse extermination mission, he would have quickly finished and rushed back to the arsenal. But that wasn't possible today. Because it was the day to meet with the first year students newly enrolled at the Jujutsu High, Toji sighed and shuffled through some papers. Two this year, neither too many nor too few, an average number. Normally, one or two, maybe three first year students enroll at Jujutsu High, Yaga had said. That was at enrollment. The number of students who died before graduation in this field was substantial. Creek. The cafe door opened, and two male students entered. They paused when they saw Toji, then approached cautiously one graciously and carefully, the other with a grin, lively. Toji scanned the two of them. The one with black bowl cut hair seemed completely unguarded, while the blonde seemed somewhat cautious but looked like he wouldn't be able to defend or counter if Toji attacked. Both need to be pushed hard, Toji thought internally. You're the one I talked to, yes. I'm Zenin Toji, the physical education teacher at Jujutsu High. Hello. While the bowl cut head student bowed deeply in greeting, the blonde student still had a suspicious look. Toji pulled out his teacher ID from Jujutsu High and showed it to them, after which the blonde also greeted him. I'm Nanami Kento. I'm Hibara Yu. Nice to meet you. On the first day of school, Toji left home with Megumi and Tsumiki, escorting Zoro to the school gates. From the beginning, there was no thought in Toji's mind of making Zoro go to school alone to foster independence. One can't have a missing child from the first day of school. Zoro was already excessively independent as it was. At the school gate Toji gave Zoro one last look over. Zoro, dressed more neatly than usual, furrowed his brow, uncomfortable in his clothes. Got your books. In the bag, how about your indoor shoes? Right here. The presence of mind not to get lost in school. Listen, I'm not a three-year-old, you know. Right. You're six. Toji adjusted the straps of Zoro's brand new Randaseru, barely believing it. Zoro was actually going to school. I'm taking you today, but from tomorrow, take the shuttle bus home. You'll take it to come here too. Where do I catch it? In front of the house. Ask the teacher when you leave school. Though it's rare for a shuttle bus to run right up to one's home in private schools, Toji had made arrangements beforehand. Unless that school didn't have a shuttle bus to begin with. It wasn't difficult for Toji to slightly alter the existing shuttle routes with a little persuasion. If you can't find your classroom, make sure to tell a teacher. I've already given them a heads up. Who do you think I am? Ah, big brother, you can't even tell left from right. Make sure you help. You need to. Sumiki, you, he. While Toji had a response for anything, he found it hard to say much to the beaming Tsumiki. Toji squatted down to look Zoro in the eye and spoke earnestly. My Marimo, you're supposed to stop fights, not start them. You can only hit one person, and if the police or teachers catch you, it's a hassle. Better to break it up and hit both sides. Is that what you say to your son on his first day of school? Zoro looked at Toji incredulously, while Tsumiki blinked innocently beside them. Is that so? No, absolutely not, Tsumiki. Zoro was horrified and covered Toji's mouth. Don't fight. What's with these kids? Whether they were first graders or the oldest students in sixth grade to Zoro, they were just little kids. Fighting them wasn't even a possibility. Toji made a muffled noise, and Zoro removed his hand. Don't fight with the teachers either. That would be a bit tricky to handle. Got it. I don't expect you to stay quiet. Just stay safe, please. You're overprotective, you know that. Toji didn't respond. He couldn't not know. Zoro had grown a lot over time. While not as robust as Toji, he was well built and significantly taller than his first grade peers. He looked more like a 10 year old than a 6 year old. To anyone else, Zoro seemed like no easy target. But that was just the surface. Toji tilted his head. As someone who had been an assassin, he was acutely aware of the recent changes in Zoro. He doesn't show any weaknesses. While the new students and even the likes of Gorjo Satoru had weaknesses, Zoro showed none. What appeared like weaknesses were no different than jumping into a beast's maw. 
It was lethal to walk in unaware. Centuries of instincts warned Toji. Disliking his own physical weakness, Toji knew his strength well. There were few sorcerers who could stand against him. The only one who could definitely beat him was Gorjo Satoru. And Zoro had grown strong enough to be a threat to Toji's life. And he was still growing. With every mission, every wound, his movements became more fluid. Toji watched all this keenly, aware. Yet he couldn't let go of his worry. My Marimo is directionally challenged. Even in a safe place, he could walk into danger. On missions, he had encountered curses and sorcerers in just such a way. And to Toji, Zoro's fighting style was risky and nerve-wracking. In fact, Zoro was frequently injured on missions. Partly because he restrained his use of cursed energy to improve his physical strength and sword skills, and partly due to his fighting style. Zoro's style of combat is different from mine or Gorjo's. Unlike Gorjo, who used Limitless to ensure most attacks didn't even reach him, or Toji, who gathered extensive information on his opponents to force them into disadvantageous positions, Zoro did not adopt these strategies. Stubbornly straightforward in battle, his only method of attack was the sword strike. He's slower than the technique merits, so he chooses to block rather than dodge. Since he often couldn't dodge in time, he'd take or block enough attacks, until he could deliver a powerful strike. He gets hit a lot until he can land a strike. Of course, this was only true when facing an opponent with skills or traits comparable to his own. The likelihood of encountering such an opponent in school was very low. But Toji couldn't be complacent. The world had never been on Zen in Toji's side. Zoro paused, sensing the desperation and anxiety barely concealed behind Toji's playful facade. I'll be careful. Please do. There wasn't much left in Toji's world that had collapsed once. It might seem excessive to others but clinging desperately to what little meaning remained was natural for him. Another loss was not something Toji could endure. Take care. Bye bye, big brother. Bye bye, Megumi murmured as Zoro hugged her tightly. She giggled in response to the usual words of affection whispered by Zoro. Sumiki, you too. I love you. Sumiki's brown eyes widened, then softened at those words. Zoro turned to look at Toji, who shook his head. No need to say it to me. He knew without it being said. Seeing Zoro whisper the same words to Toji that he had to his siblings, Toji smiled. Such a stubborn kid. Wish. Toji ruffled Zoro's neatly combed hair. Annoyed, Zoro pushed his hand away. Have a good day. Yeah. Zoro turned and walked away confidently. Sumiki suddenly exclaimed, watching Zoro go. Brother, not that way. Turn right. Ah. The school Zoro attended turned out to be ordinary. Perhaps because it was an expensive private school. The class sizes were smaller, and the students all wore costly clothes. But beyond that, it wasn't much different from any other school. He wandered a bit looking for his classroom, but fortunately, a homeroom teacher found Zoro in the hallway, and kindly led him there, so he avoided being late on his first day. Since it's our first day, how about we all introduce ourselves? Yes, I am. Six years old. My name is Miyaki Fuzuki. Ah, uh, I like Dango and Strawberries. Well done. Everyone, let's clap. Now, who's next? Yes, my name is Sato Ayako. The children took turns introducing themselves. Their voices squeaky like little ducklings. Fighting with these kids. Ridiculous. Zoro secretly clicked his tongue. It seemed they would burst into tears with just a poke. Next is Zen and Zoro. Would you like to introduce yourself? Zoro stood up at the teacher's request. With all eyes in the classroom twinkling at him, he said calmly, I'm Zoro. Nice to meet you. After his brief introduction, Zoro sat down again. The homeroom teacher, taken aback by the succinctness, suggested... Um, Zeninkan, maybe you could tell your classmates a little more about yourself so they can get to know you. Something else? Zoro tilted his head, unsure what else to say. A nearby child boldly asked, What do you like? Swords. So, um, are you good at fighting? Yeah. I wouldn't be doing it with you guys though. Zoro kept that thought to himself. Then, can you beat a T-Rex? A cheeky question from someone. Zoro nodded, having actually slain a dragon in his past life. But that child stuck out his tongue at Zoro. Liar. E Rezas are super strong. I'm stronger. Okay, that's enough from both of you. The teacher intervened in their conversation. She seemed exasperated but managed to smile when her eyes met Zoro's. It seems Zenin Kun knows how to use a sword. That's impressive. Everyone, let's give him a round of applause. Now, who's next? She quickly moved things along getting the next child ready for their introduction. After the introductions, the children didn't really speak to Zoro. They seemed awkward and a bit scared. Understandable. Zoro, too big to be just six years old, looked more like he was eight or ten. His size and slight muscular build would seem immense to children his age. He knew well that his appearance could even unsettle adults. Unconcerned, Zoro watched the teacher try to explain things as simply and clearly as possible. 
and then he yawned loudly. There really wasn't much for him to do or learn, so he used his arms as a pillow and took a nap. Zoro, want to try this problem? 64. That was quick. Have you already memorized the multiplication table? Yes. Despite often blatantly sleeping through class, when teachers asked Zoro questions about the lesson, he answered without hesitation. Zoro wasn't particularly bright, but elementary school first grade problems were a breeze. After several such instances, the teachers stopped questioning him much. And so, his first day at school passed without incident. If only he hadn't spotted a curse on the roof of the cafeteria at lunchtime, it would have continued that way. While waiting in line to enter the cafeteria, Zoro sensed the presence of a giant centipede curse. It was big, but not particularly strong, probably a grade 4, at most grade 3. The centipede curse hadn't noticed Zoro yet and was hissing at other children. Zoro clicked his tongue. It'll charge if it sees me. It was one thing to grab a curse in front of unknowing non-sorcerer kids and teachers. They'd think he was punching the air. But I can't just ignore it. Just as he thought that, the centipede curse's eyes met his. It leaped off the roof and scurried towards him. Can't help it. Zoro stepped out of line and charged at the approaching curse, his hand wrapped in cursed energy. Crack. The centipede's head split cleanly in two, killing it instantly. Of course, since the kids couldn't see the curse, it looked as though Zoro had suddenly run forward out of line. Teacher, he's cutting in line. Zenin Kun, you can't do that. It wasn't cutting then, what was it? I was. Never mind. Zoro quietly moved to the back of the line, explaining he had been catching an invisible centipede would be pointless, no one would believe him. Looks like I'll be eating late. Not that he minded. Whether he ate early or late didn't really matter. Just then, a child poked Zoro's back with a finger. Turning around, he saw a short-haired girl wearing glasses and a hairpin decorated with flowers. She opened her mouth with a clear voice and chatted. Hey, what did you just do? It wasn't cutting in line, was it? Zoro studied the girl slowly. Her hair was cut short like a boy's, adorned neatly with a flower pin, and her eyes, visible beyond her glasses, matched the deep brown of her hair. The hairstyle gave her a tomboyish and mischievous appearance. She was a face completely new to him, unlike anyone Zoro had known in his past or present lives. Beneath her bowl cut hair, her forehead was flawlessly clear, unmarred by any scars. Her primary strength was somewhere between a sorcerer and a non-sorcerer. The strength she possessed was typical of a non-sorcerous child. Zoro flicked his fingers towards where the curse had been. Do you see that? Yes. What was it? Ah, uh, a huge centipede. It was right to see the curse. A non-sorcerer who can see curses. He had seen it occasionally. Although not a sorcerer, there were some assistant supervisors who had this ability. The child asked innocently, Do you see that monster too? Looking into her earnest, sparkling deep brown eyes, Zoro chuckled. No. How do you catch it if you can't see? There's always a way. Her eyes widened, and she clapped her hands. Well, that's cool. I've only seen my brother catch them before. Your brother? Yes. He's different from me. He can see and eliminate them. With a naive gesture, the child punched the air. Evidently, her brother was a sorcerer. She declared boldly, My name is Hibaruyum. What's yours? Zen and Zoro. Z-Ring. Zen. In. That's hard. Zeren. Zenin. No, you can just call me by my name. It doesn't really matter. Anything was better than Marimo. Zoro thought to himself. Accustomed to creepy nicknames and the creative titles given by a perverted chef, he didn't mind bypassing Japan's formal naming customs. Yoon jumped up joyfully. Really? Thanks. You can call me Yoon Chan too. Just Yoon was not okay. That was reserved for her brother. Yoon stated seriously. Zoro found it simply adorable and chuckled. All right, Yoon Chan. Dreeing. Zoro's phone rang. Who was calling and what they wanted was unknown, so it was awkward to answer in a crowded place. Realizing the situation, Yoon smiled with a missing front tooth. You're in class two, right? I'm in class one. Let's eat together tomorrow. Okay. But make sure you eat lunch. Because I'm hungry. Preferably with rice. Nodding to Yoon, who was patting her belly, Zoro slipped out of the lunch line and headed to a secluded area. Walking aimlessly, he quickly found himself in front of an empty storeroom and answered the call. Hello, Marimo, where are you? With the lively voice of Gorjo, veins popped on Zoro's forehead. Don't call me Marimo. Or, don't be so cold. You're not like that with the teacher. 
Well, that's because he's my father. And I've told Toji not to call me Marimo several times too. They never listen, so I just let it slide. Whatever. It wasn't important. What do you want? Just checking. Thought you got lost again. I'm at school. Hey, you're not at the usual one. The other one? Ah, the elementary. You wouldn't find it fun. You're just relearning what you already know. Maybe. There was some significance to it. Not through the lessons, though. Zoro thought of the young girl. Habara Yume, with a missing front tooth. If it's boring, come to the classics. We have a new student enrolling today. Got everything ready. What preparation? Gorjo laughed mischievously. It made one worry about the new students. Come and see. Shoko is the dunce cap ready. Here. Cheeto, you should stick it a bit more to the right. Is this good, Shoko? Hum, looks great. Should we add more balloons? Hey, kids. That whistle isn't yours. It's for the new students, so put it down. Yeah. Beep. What on earth are they doing? Zoro listened to the various voices and whistle sounds over the phone and felt overwhelmed. Beep. 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 Zoro, come and stop your siblings. It's not their birthday party today. I wanted to do this for my cute juniors. Zoro pressed his temples with his fingers. It's because it's a party in front of the kids. Who it's really for, the kids wouldn't understand. It's just exciting because it's a party. Zoro's siblings might be mature for their age. But they were still kids. This is the age they love to play. Beep. 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 Ah, really stop blowing that whistle. Kids, are you out of breath? Let's take a break. Yes. Thankfully, Jito had calmed the kids down. Or at least the whistle sounds had stopped for a moment. Elephant nose, elephant nuos. Following Megumi's voice, Zoro heard the whistling again and made up his mind. He would go to the classics before Megumi and Sumiki caused more trouble. After all, he was supposed to go home after lunch anyway. So it wouldn't be a problem to leave now. Probably. I'll be there soon. Okay, did you hear that, kids? Zoro is coming. So behave brother is coming. Big bro? Brother. How was school today? Was it fun? I hope it was fun. Big bro? Bye bye, Satoru. You really can't stand kids. Shut up. Like, I need to deal with kids. Why? You could just look in a mirror. Shoko, Zoro chuckled softly. I'm on my way. Good. You should look after your juniors too. That how it goes. Since Zoro came to the classics first, they indeed were his juniors I guess. Better think about it when I get there. Zoro shrugged. Just in case, you better take a taxi. I'll pay for it. Don't pull any stunts like taking a bus. Do I look like I can't take a bus? Yeah. A male student with a bowl cut, Hibara Yu walked up the forest-rich path of the classics, remarking, the trees are really big. It must be refreshing to live in a place like this. Don't you think so, Nanami? Nanami Kento, carrying a large bag with a sword, looked at his recklessly cheerful classmate as they climbed the mountain trail. What should I call you? Nanami-san. Ah, is that too stiff? Then, Nanami-kun. Or just Nanami. Surely not Kento. Just tell me anything. Oh, I should just call you Habaro, right? With his eyes as clear as a calf, he had given permission to call him Nanami. Well, better this than being pessimistic about soon dying. Nanami sighed softly. I wonder if you'll even have the spirit to enjoy that. Nanami remembered what the large teacher, Toji, who had introduced himself, had said. Sorcerers are busy. This industry is always short of manpower. I only take on local missions, but other sorcerers often go on business trips. That wasn't any different for students, Toji had explained. You'll learn what's taught in typical high schools, but you'll spend a lot of time on missions. Prepare yourself, the world of sorcery is truly insane. Both the people involved and the work they do are anything but normal, Toji had explained. Hibara stepped forward cheerfully. I'm curious about the seniors. I wonder what they're like. From what I've heard, there are only three in the grade above ours. Three in a grade seemed ludicrous, but there were only two in their own grade. When Nanami Kento and Habara Yu arrived at the front of the classics, a brown-haired female student stood alone at the entrance's Tori gate, holding a cigarette. Ah, it's you guys. The new students, right? Already in my second year. How nostalgic she muttered. Hibara Yu stood at attention and bowed deeply. Hello, senior. I'm Hibara Yu. Nanami Kento, nice to meet you. Hum, Shoko watched the two politely greeting. You're quite different from my peers. You pass. Excuse me. You'll understand soon. Let's go. Oh, I'm Yeri Shoko, a reverse sorcerer. She tossed her cigarette to the ground and stamped it out. Then, she led the two students inside the building. Hibara asked excitedly. What should I call you? Yeri-san, Yeri-senpai, 
or call me Yeri Senpai. Yes, at the sharp response from Yeri, Hibara readily accepted. I should have handled it that way too. Nanami glanced at Yeri. Where are the other seniors? They're getting scolded by Yaga Sensei for fighting while waiting for you. Excuse me. Ah, don't worry about it. It's not your fault. They're always like that. Yeri waved her hand dismissively. Shouldn't it be more concerning if that's the norm? Nanami, who seemed utterly normal, glanced around the desolate classrooms of the classics. If it's not too much trouble, could you tell us who else is in the classics? There are three of us in the second year, including me, no third years, a senior in the fourth year, Yudam, and a senior in the fifth year, Mei Mei? That's few. There's always a shortage of manpower in the world of sorcery. They had fewer deaths of sorcerers lately because Gorjo, Toji, and Zoro were actively eliminating high-grade curses. But that was too dark a topic to discuss on the first day of school. There are two teachers, Toji Sensei, who teaches physical skills, and Jaga Sensei, our homeroom teacher. Both are incredibly strong, so don't mess with them. People even Gorjo hits, Shoko said. Hibara Yu's eyes sparkled. Are both of them waiting for us then? No, just Jaga Sensei. Toji Sensei is returning from a mission. He said he'd be here soon, so he might already be here. We didn't see him on the way here. That makes sense. If he decides to hide, there are hardly any who can find him, except for Gorjo and Zoro. It was probably time to mention Zoro. Shoko spoke slowly. There's a boy who's sort of your senior. He's still young, but he helps the sorcerers in various ways. A boy? You'll see when you meet him. Yeri stopped in front of a classroom. The door, covered haphazardly with colored paper to block the view from outside, had a large sign that read welcome. Inside, faint sounds of arguing could be heard. Yeri slid the door open. In front of Gorjo and Jito, who were kneeling with their hands up, Yago was shouting with a vein popping on his neck. Even in the first year, you kept fighting, and now on the first day the new students arrive. You're more trouble than Megumi and Tsumiki who couldn't even enter school. Really? We're sorry. We're sorry, Sensei. The new students are here. What? At Jito's words, Yaga abruptly turned around. Shoko casually said, Yaga Sensei, I brought the new students. Hem hem, Yaga coughed and signaled with his eyes to the two kneeling men. They sprung up like lightning. Jito sat down, and Gorjo approached the two new students with a paper made fancy dunce cap. First, wear this. What is this? Gorjo Satoru's special dunce cap. Megumi wanted it. But I didn't give it to his. Accept it with gratitude. Is this some kind of new bullying? Nanami half doubted as he put on the holographic paper dunce cap. That was so shiny it hurt his eyes. And this too. Seeing the paper sash that read not the best in Japan. But the second coolest new student Nanami was convinced. This was bullying. If it wasn't, his head would hurt more. Nanami impassively draped the sash over his shoulder. A sign that read welcome, new students filled the chalkboard. Pop. Confetti rained from the sky. A boy and a girl with tousled brown hair, apparently too young for elementary school, climbed onto a desk and vigorously threw paper made flower petals around. It looked more like they were seasoning food. Poo poo. The two children merrily blew their whistles. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, seniors. Unaware of Nanami's discomfort, Hibara laughed with the dunce cap and sash on. The two new students stood side by side in the cleared space. Megumi, Sumiki, stop and come here. Nanami turned towards the unfamiliar voice. On the lap of the teacher known as Toji, a green-haired boy, Zoro, was sitting. Nine years old, maybe ten. At the command of the green-haired boy, whom the children called Megumi and Tsumiki, they ran over without a word. They hopped down from Toji's lap and sat next to the other boy. That kid is, ah, he's your senior. His name is Zenin Zoro. He's currently six years old. Jito Sugura stated in a calm tone. Nanami Kento finally understood Toji's description that the world of sorcery was insane. Are you saying you have captured curses before? No, I mean he's going on a mission. Nanami's common sense which had tried to interpret the young sorcerer's comment about catching one or two curses, was shattered once again by Jito's calm statement. Jito, having glanced at Shoko as she flopped down into a chair, continued, He's not officially assigned missions. He mostly just follows other sorcerers on their assignments. It's unclear whether Jito was reluctant to discuss it further, or simply chose to ignore it. But after the mission in the village of Gukoku, no specific tasks had been assigned to Zoro. Of course, he hasn't been assigned a rank either. Thus, Zoro had been accompanying other classic sorcerers on their missions as a support over the past few months. Nanami opened his mouth to speak several times, but ended up closing it each time. If I heard correctly, you said the senior is six years old. Yes. Does the world of sorcery employ six-year-olds? 
Nanami's voice was as cold as ice. He thought it was abnormal when he heard that even high school students were assigned missions. But as corrupt as the industry might be, shouldn't there be some lines that humans just don't cross? Assigning such dangerous duties to a child who has just started school. Satoru widened his eyes, then burst into laughter. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Well, it's the first time since Suguru I've seen someone get seriously angry about Zoro working as a sorcerer. It's the usual here, Shito muttered. Logically, how could a six-year-old accompany others on missions and fight when necessary? Yet, despite being a non-sorcerer who can't see curses, Zoro was able to work as a sorcerer because he possessed strength acknowledged even by the top figures in the sorcery world. Even if he has the abilities, it's not something that should be happening. Six years old is no age to bear any kind of responsibility. It's well below the age of 15, which is the legal working age in Japan, and even below 14, the age at which criminal charges and youth detention become possible. It's only possible because this is the sorcery world. Outside the law, with chronic manpower shortages because only those aware of and able to see curses can enter the industry. It's also why Toji, once known as the Sorcerer Killer, can operate as a sorcerer, and why Zoro, still a non-sorcerer at six, needs to keep active. Ultimately, it's due to a lack of personnel. Because of the past, because of his age, because he's a non-sorcerer. Reasons like these naturally shift tasks that should be handled by lower-ranked sorcerers to people like Toji and Zoro. There aren't enough high-class or first-class sorcerers. The more challenging missions keep coming their way. While some sorcerers grow through these missions, most are either physically or mentally hurt or even die, leaving the sorcery world. As the number of sorcerers decreases, the manpower crisis worsens, and the remaining sorcerers face increasingly burdensome tasks. It's a vicious cycle. Essentially, the manpower shortage is the root of all problems in the sorcery world. Ah, maybe it's not the root of all problems. There are higher ups after all. Someday, they'll need to be dealt with. Cheeto made a chilling vow. He'd do it now if he could, but doing so would likely lead to sorcerers dying from curses or overwork. Not yet possible. Do as you wish. That's what Zoro told Jito in the stalactite cave. For the first time since becoming a sorcerer, Jito Suguru thought about what kind of society he wanted not just a right society. A society where he could laugh with friends even if some things were not perfect. It was still vague, often shifting its definition and appearance. In essence, Jito was deep in thought about what he truly wanted. One clear thing was that the society Jito Suguru envisioned included Gorjo Satoru and Zen and Zoro, along with their loved ones. Hibara Yu stared blankly at the pensive Jito, blinking his large, calf-like eyes. What's the matter? You couldn't grasp the current situation at all. In his mind, the idea of a six-year-old taking on missions was unfathomable. Zoro scratched his head as he stared at Hibara's face. I feel like I've seen you somewhere before. Where had he seen him? Zoro tilted his head, almost remembering. Do you not consider labor laws at all? Nanami's question made Shoko chuckle before she removed a cigarette from her mouth and exhaled smoke. Sorry, Junior. This is the sorcery world, where illegality and injustice are commonplace. She stated in a matter-of-fact tone. Hibara's face turned pale as he digested the words of Nanami and Shoko. So you're saying a six-year-old goes on missions? Yes. My little sister is six years old, Hibara Yu mumbled in dismay. His sister, Hibara Yum, was also six. She loved watching Pretty Cure on TV, playing with robot toys, and eating popped rice at home with her brother. His sister, the same age as a child who takes on missions, and a senior who has been active as a sorcerer. Hibara couldn't believe it. A frightened Hibara asked, Does my little sister have to work in the sorcery world too? She's six as well. No. It's rare for someone to start working in the sorcery world at six. Only a few, like Satoru and Zoro, started at that age. Even Satoru had other sorcerers from the Gorjo family with him at that age. Well, Zoro doesn't go on missions alone either. So why him Zoro is strong? Gorjo stated matter-of-factly, very strong. Zoro himself wanted to be active as a sorcerer, but more importantly, he was able because he's strong. Strong enough to handle unexpected situations during missions and return safely. If Zoro had been only moderately strong around the level of a second-class sorcerer regardless of what the upper echelon said, or whether Zoro wanted it, he wouldn't have been allowed to work as a sorcerer. No one other than his father, Toji, would have enforced it. Locked up at home, or created reasons he couldn't go on missions. It would probably be the latter. Even Toji would avoid using force against family as much as possible. Maybe even used himself as a hostage. Pretending to be hurt by a curse and bleeding profusely at home. Zoro, despite appearances, was deeply caring. 
and would treat even such a gorilla with the utmost respect. In any case, all possible means would have been employed to prevent Zoro from being active in the sorcery world. Better to restrict his actions than to lose him. The reason it hadn't come to that was because Zoro was strong enough to take care of himself in most situations. More. Specifically, strong enough that even Toji would find it difficult to restrain him. Nanami and Hebara looked at the others in the classroom incredulously. The female senior with a cigarette, the male senior with bangs, the two muscular teachers, and the white-haired senior, didn't respond to their words. As if they had just been told the night sky is dark. Everyone here had no doubts about the little green-haired boy's strength. Feeling like a two-eyed person who had fallen into a land of cyclops, Nanami finally managed to say, A six-year-old is strong. He could probably beat the two of you with a box cutter. Really? Hold on. Yes, definitely. Gorjo lowered his sunglasses to confirm the new student's powers, before declaring decisively, Not bad, and it seems both have some techniques. Neither was at the exceptional level of sorcerers like himself or Suguru. Not even close to a first-class sorcerer like Mei Mei. Nor did they seem to have unique abilities like Shoko's reverse techniques. Perhaps ordinary third-class or almost second-class sorcerers. To Zoro, that's a piece of cake. Maybe even beat my father. Gorjo's casual remark made Zoro and Toji turn their heads towards him simultaneously. The atmosphere tensed slightly, and Gorjo chuckled. Why? No. Of course. It wouldn't be easy. But in a one-on-one -on -one fight, Zoro could definitely out. Bang. Yaga delivered a huge blow to Gorjo's head causing him to hiss. Shut it, Satoru. Our as Gorjo held his head and groaned, the new students didn't know what to do. Nanami's eyes were glazed over. He was halfway out of his mind already. Toji-sensei is Zoro's father. The children in Zoro's arms, they're all Toji-sensei's kids. The girl was Tsumiki, four years old. The boy was Megumi, three years old. Jito kindly explained for the uninformed new students. Due to a series of shocking revelations, Nanami, unprepared to absorb any more information, simply nodded. Meanwhile, Hibara turned to inspect the faces of the two children clinging to Zoro like cicadas on a tree. The boy called Megumi, indeed bore a strong resemblance to Toji. The girl called Tsumiki, however, did not resemble Toji at all. Catching Hibara's gaze towards Megumi, Gorjo excitedly rambled. Megumi is a spitting image of the teacher, right? Even though he's his own son, Zoro doesn't look much like Toji-sensei. It's peculiar. Listening to Gorjo's endless chatter, Jito smiled warmly. It was clear they had failed to make a good impression on the new students. They prepared a welcome party for the new students in the classroom. Caps, sashes, a giant paper on the blackboard, and flowers cut from paper all, planned by Jito. Apparently, the new students were too shocked by what they had heard to even notice the classroom decorations. Only Megumi and Tsumiki, who had busily blown whistles and cut paper for decorations, benefited. Unable to stand it any longer, Jido covered Gorjo's mouth with his palm. Then he said, Satoru, can you stop with the inappropriate comments? You're frightening the new students. M-M-P-H? M-M-P-H? Haven't we even heard the new students' names yet? Maybe we should let them introduce themselves. Forcing Gorjo's head to nod, Jito smiled kindly at the two new students. Now, would you two like to introduce yourselves in turn? This doesn't seem like the right time for introductions, no. I'll tell you. Nice to meet you. I am Nanami Kento. Feeling as if the conversation would never end, Nanami introduced himself and bowed slightly. Clap, clap, clap. Gorjo and Jito smiled, while Shoko and Zoro appeared somewhat indifferent. Following that, Hibara Yu straightened his torso and spoke in a cheerful voice. I am Hibara Yu. Nice to meet you. Upon hearing the name Hibara Yu, something clicked in Zoro's head. Hibara Yu's face, with his dark brown bowl cut hair and large eyes, overlapped with that of Hibara Yume, who had similar brown hair and big eyes. Unlike Yume, Yu did not wear glasses, was much taller, and obviously differed in age and gender. But the overall impression was strikingly similar to that of Hibara Yume. Zoro murmured, Hibara Yume. Hibara Yume's eyes widened. Do you know my sister? I met her at school today. It was indeed a family connection. Zoro found the coincidence intriguing and stroked his chin. Until now, except for scolding Gorjo, Yaga Masamichi had only been listening. Now, he spoke up. I have a question for you too. Yes. Ask anything. While Habara responded immediately, Nanami pressed his fingertips against his forehead. The information he had heard so far was overwhelmingly burdensome. Yet, he eventually sighed and said, please ask. With an unusually stern expression, Yaga asked seriously, Why did you come to the school of sorcery? Silence flowed through the classroom. Gorjo spoke in a disapproving voice. Was that something everyone asked when they enrolled in the Jujutsu High? It was asked even in our time. Satoru, this is an important issue. Yaga knows. 
Most sorcerers who enroll in the Jujutsu Hai do so because they have no other choice. If they don't come, they would either have to train under their own sorcerer family or another sorcerer, or be classified as deserters, and be pursued by other sorcerers. Especially for sorcerers from non-sorcerer families, many have only recently discovered that there are others in the world who can see spirits like themselves. Nowadays, people from the Gorjo family like Satoru, Zoro, and Toji are common in the Jujutsu High. Originally, the Jujutsu High was a place where many came from prestigious sorcerer families or non-sorcerer families. Famous sorcerer families like the Gorjo family do not send students to the Jujutsu High, but train sorcerers within the family. While the Gorjo family is familiar with the sorcery world, those from non-sorcerer families often find out about this world for the first time. Asking such students why they came to the Jujutsu High would feel ridiculous. Still, it must be asked. It's not about elimination. Yago Masamichi doesn't have the authority to reject students from the Jujutsu High. That authority only comes with higher ranks. Yago, merely a teacher in the Jujutsu High, has no such authority. But he wants them to think what they will gain from this school. Those who step into the world of sorcery without meaning or purpose do not live long. The enemies are too abhorrent, and it's a place where you cannot confide in others, and where comrades die. Without even a vague purpose, like a rock eroded by the waves, they eventually disappear without a trace. If one was pushed into enrolling without thought, they must start thinking now. Why they came to this school? Amid the silence, Sumiki, held in Zoro's arms, suddenly spoke. I came following brother Zoro. With her lively voice, the mood momentarily lightened. Nanami smiled faintly, and Hebara burst out laughing. Did you say Tsumiki? You really like your brother? Huh? My sister likes me a lot too. Tsumiki nodded vigorously several times. Yes, Zoro may be a Marimo, but I like him. Hey, listen, he, Kukuku. Zoro, laughing and shaking, glared at Toji who added fuel to the fire. Megumi then murmured softly, Marimo brother. Well done, Megumi. Zoro really is a Marimo. What do you mean, really? This is all your fault. What are you going to do about it? It's because you keep calling me your Marimo. Now even the kids are calling me Marimo. Toji chuckled, looking at the indignant Zoro, and then leaned back in his chair with a relaxed gesture. Well, maybe aim for the next life. Maybe you'll be born with black hair like mine then. It's hard to imagine Zoro with black hair. Green suits him perfectly. Shmph, Zoro snorted. If there's a next life, I'm definitely not coming back as your son. Maybe a brother or a father. Oh, that'd be fine with me. Zoro was a brother or father well. Either way, he could be loved and respected. Unlike someone who left him alone, no matter what happened. Unlike someone who said he should just die and then threw him into a warehouse full of curses after beating him up. But he didn't expect that much. After all, Zoro had already done a lot for Toji as a son. Toji then stood up and lifted all three kids at once, then sat them all on his lap. With a blank face, he stroked Zoro's head as Zoro looked up at him. Why? Don't you like it? No. Toji, who can't lie well, stroked Zoro's head even faster. It felt like touching a rock covered in thick moss. Gorjo, watching Zoro's hair becoming increasingly like a new nest, asked. Zoro, did Yaga teacher ask you that question too? No. Hum, not a formal student. Huh. If asked why you came to the Jujutsu High, what would you answer? I came to become stronger, until I'm the strongest. Ultimately, whether in a past life or this one, Zoro's ambition remains the same, to be the strongest. Whether he's called a saint or a villain, it hardly matters to him. Shoko made a curious sound. Is that all? There are other purposes too. Such things naturally arise the longer you spend time together. Just as when he was a pirate, those purposes are not easily explained in words. When the time comes, he will show it through actions. When Yaga teacher asked me that, I said, if my body isn't in the world of sorcery, who else would be? At Gorjo's words, Jito couldn't help but laugh. That's so you, Satoru. Isn't that just a middle school syndrome? Hey, that's too harsh, Shoko. My words aren't wrong, are they? If not us, then who would be in the world of sorcery? Gorjo looked around at Jito, Toji, Zoro, and Shoko and smirked. With the strongest after all, proudly proclaimed by Gorjo, the faces of Jito, Yeri, and Toji soured. Ah, why the long faces, everyone? Yaga pressed between his eyebrows with a finger. I think that's enough of a demonstration from the seniors. Your responses? Hum, Hebara rested his chin on his hand and thought. I'm not usually one to think deeply about such things. 
But I want to do what I can do here. Doing what you can with all your might feels good. He replied cheerfully. Nanami looked at Hibara with a strange expression. To be able to say that's the reason for entering such an unconventional school. As if asking, what about you? Everyone's gaze turned to Nanami who sighed. Honestly, he wanted to say he enrolled because he would have been treated like a criminal otherwise. As his eyes widened behind his sunglasses, Gorjo chuckled. Wow, that's honest. Better that than saying something that isn't true. Toji felt satisfied. Right now, the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College was a gathering of the craziest elements in the sorcery world, including Toji himself. Watching the reactions of those around him, Nanami blinked. Did I just say that out loud? Yes. The first impression was terribly messed up. Nanami thought internally. In this already narrow society, he might be ostracized. Preparing mentally for a fall from grace and scolding, Yaga said calmly. You're both past. Really? Thank you, Satoru. Suguru, show them to the dorms. Yes. Yes. Both men rose from their chairs. Nanami. Hibara. Both pairs of eyes turned towards Suguru. Shito smiled kindly. Welcome to the Tokyo Jujutsu High. After the dormitory introduction, second year and first year students of Jujutsu High, along with Toji's family, went to the dining hall to eat. Sizzle. The sound of meat sizzling with juices and oil on the grill filled the air. Clank. Two pairs of chopsticks charged with magic clashed above the grill, sparking small flames. Satoru glared at Suguru, who had blocked his chopsticks. What? What are you doing? Satoru, that's the meat I was grilling. Did you write your name on the meat? I'll eat this one, and you can order more. Nanami watched the scene with blurry eyes. So, you could infuse chopsticks with magic too. It was a new piece of knowledge, although it might have been better not to know it for life. Below the chopsticks of the two, Yeri's chopsticks swiftly appeared and snatched the meat on the grill. Don't fight over something like that. We're not kids. Excuse me. Can we get three more servings of meat here? Yes. Hibara was already stuffing his face with meat and rice until his cheeks bulged. When Nanami gave him a stern look, Hibara gave a thumbs up. Ah, the meat in this place is really delicious. Try this. Swallow what's in your mouth before you talk. It was more surprising that not a single grain of rice flew out of his mouth despite it being stuffed. Shank. Zoro wielded a knife and swiftly sliced the meat. Thud thud. The neatly diced meat piled up in the bowls of Tsumiki and Megumi. Sumiki giggled at the sight of the cute characters on the yellow children's dinnerware, and the meat piled on it. After receiving the bowl from Zoro, Sumiki pondered seriously. Toji, noticing this, asked gruffly, What's wrong? I want to eat the biggest piece first, but brother cut them all the same size. Sumiki wanted the largest piece of meat, but thanks to the world's strongest swordsman, all pieces were cut uniformly. Toji looked down at the meat, which looked all the same size to him as well. Finally, he just picked a piece with a fork and offered it to Tsumiki. Eat this first. Okay. Tsumiki took the fork obediently and put the meat in her mouth only to start hopping around. Because it was hotter than expected. Hot. Hot. What? Zoro quickly assessed the situation and handed Toji a napkin. He couldn't reach Tsumiki himself. Let her spit it out. Otherwise, she might burn her tongue. Unlike Zoro and Toji who seldom burned themselves on freshly cooked meat, Tsumiki and Megumi often did. This was something Zoro had learned while raising his younger siblings. Regardless of whether the meat was freshly cooked and hot, it was best to pop it in your mouth, before it could be snatched away pirate crewmates, and normal children differed in that. Real normal children needed their meat cooled down before eating. Tsumiki, reluctant to spit out the meat, kept blowing on it. Even if it's a waste, spit it out. You'll hurt your mouth and tongue. Ugh. Eventually, Sumiki spit the meat onto the napkin that Toji held under her chin. Toji threw away the wrapped meat and offered her some cold water, which Tsumiki drank with gulps. I'm sorry. Toji silently stroked Sumiki's head, which was bowed in shame. Zoro, while grilling the meat, glanced at Nanami and Hibara's grill. Aren't you ordering wagyu? Oh, should we know? Thanks. I don't have enough money. Nanami quickly interrupted Hibara. The amount they had already ordered seemed to cost a fortune, and adding wagyu would really stretch their budget. Zoro blinked. It was the first time he had heard someone mention a lack of money while eating. Maybe it's because they're family or sorcerers. Sorcerers generally earn well. Thus, unless there were special circumstances like loving to save money, as Mei Mei did, they usually didn't skimp on food. Even Zoro, only six years old, was making quite a bit of money. Not directly from the headquarters. The headquarters pretended not to know that Zoro was going on missions, so they didn't pay him directly. Instead, the sorcerer accompanying Zoro on a mission would be considered as having handled it alone and would receive the reward for both, which they typically shared with Zoro. 
Because the creatures Zoro dealt with were often of a high rank, he received a significant sum when the reward was split. Some wouldn't share a penny, while others, like Hutam, would give more than half of their fee. For example, Satoru gave all of his fee to Zoro. He didn't need the money, being the head of the Gorjo family, which was already wealthy. Even the stingy Mei Mei, when on a mission with Zoro, would meticulously calculate the contribution and roles they each had and split the fee precisely. I'm not foolish enough to give up a long-term investment for a short-term gain. That was what Mei Mei said. While distributing the exact amount of the fee to Zoro, Zoro wouldn't have minded if she had given him a bit more or not shared at all. I already make enough money. But this didn't apply to freshmen just starting their sorcerer life. Zoro thought for a moment and then spoke calmly. Then I'll pay. Order what you want. Nanami's chopstick movement halted abruptly. He felt terrible, like trash for letting a six-year-old pay for Wagyu. Thank you, senior. Sure. Zoro called a waiter and ordered more Wagyu. The waiter looked at Toji as if to confirm the order, and Toji nonchalantly nodded. Toji had no intention of stopping Zoro's spending. Compared to the billions of yen Toji could blow in gambling in a few months or even weeks, Zoro's generosity towards his juniors was utterly reasonable. The amount was also significantly less. Hibara, senior is six years old, Nanami. That was the problem Nanami was about to mention, but he paused when Habaro whispered something else. You might not understand the other implications behind the refusal. If it were an adult, Nanami's refusal might have been understood as concern for Zoro's financial situation. But Zoro was six, too young to grasp the politeness or the implications behind a refusal. He might think they didn't like him or didn't want to be friends. Yume felt the same. Let's buy something more expensive next time. Nanami nodded at Habara's whisper. It was a subtly different understanding of the truth. The wedgie they eventually ordered was really delicious. If he hadn't been in the awkward position of being treated by a six-year-old senior, even the usually not greedy Nanami might have wanted to order more. Nanami placed a well-grilled piece of wedju on Zoro's plate and spoke. You said senior right. I'm not officially enrolled. It was more like they were business partners. Zoro chewed on the wedju and said, If you don't like calling me senior you can call me something else. I don't really mind. That wasn't the problem, and Nanami held back his urge to say more. Because he was a child, and because he was a senior, the fact that these two things could coexist revealed the absurdity of the sorcery world. What does a senior do? I go with sorcerers and cut down curses. Hibara, who had swallowed a mouthful of meat, said earnestly. So you mean you go on missions with sorcerers and help them? Yeah, that's right. Zoro often handled things alone too. But when a spirit's rank was too high or their numbers too many for a sorcerer to handle alone, they would step back to avoid getting hurt. As Nanami thought of all the vicious curses Zoro had faced alone, his head spun for a moment. To just leave that be, Nanami's piercing gaze turned to Toji. No matter how he thought about it, it was hard to understand a father who would let such things continue. Toji noticed Nanami's gaze and its meaning and grinned crookedly. Look at that. The presumptuous blonde, not knowing the heartache of having a strong child like a Marimo. Nanami flinched and turned his gaze to Zoro. Wasn't it dangerous? I was prepared for that. Discussing danger while aiming to be the strongest was nonsensical. To reach the pinnacle of strength, one had to overcome numerous dangers and battles and grow stronger. But these kids might be different. Not everyone aimed for strength or to be the strongest. While Zoro's dream is to grow through fighting others, not everyone shares that same dream. Some might reach their dreams faster by doing other things instead of fighting. Zoro believed there was no need to force those people to fight. Whether he's a pirate or not, he adheres to his own principles. Or maybe it's because he's a stubborn owner of a conqueror's haki. Zoro hated being oppressed. He also despised the oppression of others' freedom. As Zoro ate the wedju, he told Nanami and Habara, let me know if you ever want to leave the sorcery world. There should be the freedom to become a sorcerer and the freedom not to. Zoro thought to himself, if there's no freedom, you can't hold anyone accountable. If someone knew enough about the sorcerer world, had prepared in advance, and had chosen to enter it on their own, Zoro would listen to their complaints with equanimity. It was their responsibility. But if they never had a choice in the first place, it's hard to discuss responsibility. You can't blame someone for taking a path when no other paths were available. I'll find a way. Is a six-year-old senior going to find it? There are some circumstances. Physically, he's six. But mentally, he's almost 30. Toji gently tapped Zoro's cheek. Even the rookies say that. You need to take care of yourself. Hey, if Zoro doesn't do it, who will? Quiet, young master. You're not treating him like a son. That's why you say that. Toji was always anxious every time Zoro went on a mission. Was he injured? Did he lose his way and encounter the wrong opponents? You should be with Megumi. Your sea urchin of a brother gets soaked in tears. You're his father, aren't you? Megumi likes you more than me. 
Look, when Toji lifted Megumi onto his lap, Megumi's expression instantly sulked. Gorjo said with a wry face, too similar to Toji's, every time I see it, I can't believe how similar they look. Teacher, did you use cloning to have him? Megumi resembles his mother a lot too. Of course, Gorjo has never met Chia, nor will he ever, so he will never really know. Zoro thought bitterly. Sumiki curiously asked, where does Megumi resemble mom the most? Their hair? Ah. Sumiki understood immediately. Megumi's spiky hair was indeed unique, she had tried to thread beads into it a few times. Toji carefully handed Megumi to Zoro. Megumi looked at Zoro, his green eyes sparkling. Hey, where are you going again? No. Zoro realized he hadn't spent much time with Megumi and Sumiki lately, due to his missions. Maybe I'll stay in the sorcery well for a while. He also had to train the new recruits. Of course, that's if they stay in the sorcery world. As Habara stuffed his face with food, he choked and pounded his chest. When Nanami handed him water, Habara gulped it down and said, I'm not thinking about leaving the sorcery world yet. It'd be stupid to leave when I know nothing. Even if the time to leave came, Habara wouldn't tell Zoro. A child isn't someone to rely on. Of course, he didn't say this out loud. Being young doesn't mean you know nothing. That's why a child can feel bad if they are treated like a child. Hibara clenched his fists and shouted, We'll become stronger than our senior and protect you. Gorjo burst into open laughter at this. Yeri and Jito's expressions turned awkward and Toji crossed his legs dismissively. Hum, stronger than my Marimo. What an ambitious kid. Zoro seemed quite interested. Gorjo teasingly said, Teacher Toji, he's going to be stronger than Zoro. Shouldn't you help him, Satoru? Jito exclaimed in horror at Gorjo's suggestion to directly expose the junior to hellish training. Toji nodded. Of course. He intended to train them hard. After all, Hadn't they said they wanted to be as strong as Zoro? He wasn't sure yet what their sorcery techniques were, but as a teacher, he planned to train them thoroughly, at least in physical combat. I need to stock up on medical supplies. Shoko thought this, seeing Toji's burning ambition. These two would probably frequent the infirmary. Do you two have a preferred weapon? I mainly fight with physical combat. I have techniques. But there aren't many suitable situations to use them. Blonde, you. I usually use a sword Zoro's eyes sparkled. Nanami felt a foreboding sensation. He might have said something wrong. A swordsman. Not exactly a sword is just the weapon I find most comfortable to activate my techniques. Really Zoro propped his chin. Then, want to train with me instead of my father. I am a swordsman, after all. Maybe he should spend more time in the sorcery world, especially because of Megumi and Tsumiki. Zoro thought. Gorjo and Toji's faces turned solemn at the thought of Zoro training Nanami. Sure, his skills would improve quickly under Zoro's tutelage. But Toji, with a serious look, placed a hand on Zoro's shoulder. Let's just watch him, my son. Why? Can't I teach? It's not that, just let it go. What do you mean? Zoro was not incapable of teaching. In fact, he was quite good at it. However, the learning process could be quite harsh. Of course, Toji had learned not his swordsmanship, but his haki from Zoro. Would Zoro really go easy teaching swordsmanship? Probably not. If the blonde ran away from the sorcery world, it might be because he couldn't endure Zoro's hellish training, Toji thought. That's tough. Jito moved to stand behind Nanami and Hibara, comforting them by patting their shoulders. Hang in there, both of you. Yes, we'll do our best. Hibara responded without knowing what he was agreeing to. Gorjo looked at the two newcomers with a pitying expression, then picked the meat off Jito's plate as he said, I'll buy your meal today. Is that okay? Yeah. You won't have to worry about that, will you? Nanami and Habara looked puzzled, not understanding. Gorjo didn't bother to explain. They would find out soon enough. Gorjo stood up briskly. I've eaten well. Let's go now. Shoko, how about ice cream for dessert? Sure. I want strawberry flavor. Shoko smiled faintly as she watched Tsumiki call out brightly, then patted her head. Okay. I also want strawberry. Jito, you're buying this time. Me. You lost the bet last time. Right, I did. I'll buy the dessert. Dad, what flavor will you have? Well, if there's marimo flavor, I'll have that. Stop teasing me. Zoro lunged at Toji as if to headbutt him. Of course, Toji easily dodged Zoro's playful attack. Whack. Toji leisurely blocked Zoro's hand strike. Sumiki, not particularly surprised, held Megumi's hand, who was looking at Toji with a disapproving expression. Let's go, Megumi. Papa, if the marimo hurts, it's because you hit him. Got it. 
Really? You're only fast? You're still far from surpassing me. My Marimo child. Stop calling me Marimo. Nanami blankly watched the fiery father-son altercation. Zoro's attacks were unusually heavy for a child. Surprisingly, Toji's blocks were barely visible. They were too fast. Gorjo tapped Nanami's shoulder. What are you waiting for? Let's go? Shouldn't we stop them? Yeah. He hasn't drawn his sword, has he? If Zoro really wanted to fight Toji, he would have drawn his sword. Zoro avoids using his sword against loved ones unless it's a formal spa. Senior, I'll buy the ice cream. No, it's okay. You don't have to pay this time. Cheeto cut off Hibara's words. As a senior, he couldn't take money from juniors who were about to face hardships. Speak up if you want to leave. Is it that tough? Yes, especially for you. Cheeto had only trained with Toji. But Nanami would likely train with both Zoro and Toji. Moreover, since Hibara had declared he would become stronger than Zoro in front of Toji, it was frightening to think how Toji might teach him. With compassion, Jito smiled as kindly as he could. Witnessing his smile, Nanami and Hibara shivered with an ominous feeling. Something foreboding was looming. Three weeks after entering the Jujutsu High, Nanami Kento and Hibara Yu realized why Jito Suguru had reacted the way he did. Inside a building of the school, designed like a kendo hall, Nanami Kento stood in a spacious classroom. In front of him was Zoro. As Nanami looked at Zoro, who was dressed just like him in kendo attire and holding two swords in his hands. He futilely smoothed a wrinkle on his own kendo uniform. After all, once he started rolling forward in combat, such a small wrinkle would mean nothing. Knowing it was a meaningless gesture but unable to stop because of his nerves, he felt like a student biting their nails before an exam, unable to shake off the fear. Sai taking a deep breath, Nanami firmly gripped a wooden sword with both hands. Even though Zoro was not directly in front of him and there was a fair distance between them, Nanami couldn't relax. He knew from experience that such a distance meant nothing to Zoro. It's like standing in front of a mountain. A massive rock mountain whose summit was too high to see clearly. Sumiki, standing some distance away, was sweating profusely as she swung her wooden sword from above down. Seeing Nanami, she clenched her fist in encouragement. Fight on, Mr. Nanami. Thank you, Ms. Fushiguro. Try to get hit less than yesterday. I'll try. Nanami swallowed the rest of his words, unsure if it was possible. Facing him, Zoro bowed politely in greeting. Nanami bowed in the same manner. As they straightened up and their eyes met, Nanami firmly gripped his wooden sword and aimed it directly at Zoro. The duel began. Ha! Huh. Nanami charged with a shout. Aiming for the head, Nanami swung his wooden sword down. But Zoro easily dodged by twisting his body. Whoosh, Nanami's wooden sword sliced through the air where Zoro had been. However, it hit nothing as Zoro had ducked. Thwack. Nanami blocked Zoro's wooden sword aiming for his calf. The immense force from the clash of their swords contorted Nanami's face. Crack. Zoro easily pushed aside Nanami's wooden sword and struck his thigh sharply. Nanami let out a small scream but did not falter and charged again. Zoro's lips curled into a smile. It wasn't the first time Zoro had smiled during a duel. Nanami was hardly surprised. Zoro enjoyed the fight, especially when his opponent wielded a sword. Thwack, thwack, thwack. The exchange went back and forth endlessly. Neck, arms, shoulders, stomach, solar plexus, thighs. Zoro's wooden sword lightly touched Nanami's weak points. In contrast, despite hundreds of strikes, Nanami's wooden sword barely grazed Zoro's clothing. Pant, pant. Dripping with sweat, Nanami breathed heavily. Seeing this, Zoro smirked and said, Tough, isn't it? Even a wooden sword has its weight. Swinging it for a long time could be exhausting. Nanami, who had not trained in kendo for very long, was advised not to rely solely on physical strength during swordsmanship training. Meanwhile, Soro, wielding two wooden swords, was not sweating at all, and looked fresh. His strength was remarkable, but it was also due to minimizing his movements. Zoro swung his two wooden swords with great force. Faced with an unavoidable attack, Nanami hastily raised his sword to defend. Crash. Aug. Sweat droplets fell to the floor, and both Nanami and his wooden sword were sent flying, suspended in mid-air. When he fell backwards and hit the ground, feeling dizzy, he opened his eyes to find Zoro already pointing his wooden sword at Nanami's forehead. You've practiced a lot. His voice was subtly proud and boastful. If the master in front of him hadn't been only six years old, Nanami might have been moved as well. Unfortunately, Nanami wasn't foolish enough to be unaware of the implications that a six-year-old had deeper practical swordsmanship skills than him. Damn it. As if being a 15-year-old sorcerer wasn't enough, the cursed world of sorcery also exploited a six-year-old sorcerer as a child soldier. Nanami habitually cursed the world of sorcery as he got up. There's still a long way to go. That's obvious. Though diligent and talented, Zoro saw Nanami as a swordsman who had just started taking his first steps. But the difference between someone who can take those steps on their own 
and someone who cannot is greater than one might think. One step at a time is enough. That's how Zoro did it. The problem is that sometimes in real situations, you need to run. Not just walk, but Toji had prepared for that. He trained them to instinctively move and run when necessary, in a very practical manner. He trained them harshly but meticulously, ensuring not to cause permanent injuries. You've also polished the basics. It's all thanks to the senior who taught me. How to grip the wooden sword, movements while holding the sword, downward strikes, upward strikes, horizontal slashes, diagonal slashes, techniques to predict, dodge, and block an opponent's attacks. Methods to seamlessly transition between dodging, defending, and attacking. Nanami diligently learned all the basics of swordsmanship under Zoro's guidance. Zoro taught him step by step, like a master instructor at a kendo dojo. He's not quite like an ordinary kendo instructor though. Zoro gave no protective gear to Nanami, and the training was incredibly rigorous. The swordsmanship taught was specialized for actual combat, particularly for striking down enemies. Unlike the usual dojo training, Nanami had no complaints. That was what he needed. Indeed, after learning swordsmanship from Zoro, Nanami could actively invoke spells against spirits. I have a question. Go ahead. You didn't get hit by my attacks at all earlier. According to Gorjo, Zoro has a unique skill called Haki. That allows him, even as a sorcerer, to sense and kill both spirits and people. Is it because of this Haki that you were able to block and dodge all my attacks? No, I don't need to use Haki to handle you. Zoro stated the fact calmly. In fact, he hadn't used Haki in this duel. Maybe against Toji. But he could see all of Nanami's sword movements just by intuition. Nanami hesitated, then laughed bitterly. It hurts. Did it? Sorry. It's not something you should apologize for. It's better to be bluntly shown the reality than to be falsely praised and led into thinking one is stronger than they are. Above all, Nanami was not so immature as to speak ill of a mentor who had supported him wholeheartedly. This kendo hall too, was something Zoro had helped fund with his own money and the school's budget. It was heart-wrenching. Such is the cursed world of sorcery. I'm sorry. For what? for not being able to do anything in return. Both Nanami and Hibara were third-grade sorcerers. And as third-grade sorcerers, there really wasn't much they could do in the harsh world of sorcery. Instead, they had to rely on a six-year-old, calling him senior because they were weak. That's why the world of sorcery is so cursed. It doesn't protect a six-year-old child, instead, it burdens them even more. As Nanami bowed his head in shame, Zoro calmly said, I didn't do it to receive something in return. People being happy and smiling, that's what he likes. He wants to drink in such an atmosphere. I'd be even happier if friends and family were happy too. He definitely didn't want forced smiles like those he saw in his previous life in Abisu Village. The world of sorcery, where his friends and potentially his brother will join and where his father is already involved, is a place that piles up bodies if Zoro doesn't intervene. Even in a place filled with the deranged like the world of sorcery, where colleagues die day by day, there aren't many who can genuinely smile. That's why he cuts down spirits and saves sorcerers. For a world where his friends and family can smile. That's all he wants. I hope my father can be happy too, if possible. Zoro laughed bitterly. That would probably be very difficult. Since there's no cheer. If there's anything I can help with, please tell me. Senior. Zoro's eyes sparkled at Nanami's words. Buy me a drink. Absolutely not. Nanami flatly refused. He wasn't so depraved as to offer alcohol to a six-year-old, and besides, he wasn't even old enough to buy alcohol himself. Moreover, if he got caught buying alcohol for Zoro, he'd definitely be beaten to death by Toji. 100%. Bang. Zoro seen you. Hibara. Nanami looked at his classmate who had just burst through the classroom door, covered in dirt, dust, and minor injuries. At best, he looked like a student bullied by thugs and at worst, like a debtor punished by Yakuza for not repaying loans. What's wrong? I also want to learn swordsmanship from Senior instead of Teacher Toji. Being beaten with a wooden sword by Zoro and flying away was a hundred times better. At least then he'd be wearing a cool kendo uniform. Getting hit by Toji was neither cool nor just painful. Seeing Hibara sniffling, Zoro chuckled playfully. Father is also good at swordsmanship, perhaps because he learned from watching Zoro. Among weapons, Toji handled swords the best. Though that's only relative to other weapons, he was truly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And you're more suited for hand-to-hand -hand combat than swordsmanship. Although Zoro liked swordsmen, he wasn't thoughtless enough to make every student entering the academy wield a sword. For Hibara you? Hand-to-hand -hand combat was more suitable considering his talents and how they meshed with his techniques. Hibara, with dark circles under his eyes, shook his head vigorously. No, I want to learn swordsmanship from Senior Zoro. He's better at it than Teacher Toji. 
That's true. Teacher Toji can mimic any martial arts he sees. Can't he copy your swordsmanship? At Nanami's question, Zoro shrugged. Maybe, but it'll be difficult. It's not just that Toji's understanding of swordsmanship is shallower compared to Zoro, but fundamentally, the styles they use are different. I use three sword style. Currently, due to a promise with Toji, he's only using two sword style. But Zoro's swordsmanship is essentially based on using three swords. A style that's complete when wielding three swords. Toji, having strong jaw muscles, could use the three sword style if he wanted to, but would he really choose to? By the way, Zoro currently had only two baby teeth left. Once those two are gone, he could use the three sword style. Suddenly, Toji opened the classroom door. Found you. Ayala. Hibara screamed and hid behind Zoro. Toji crouched behind Zoro and made a beckoning gesture like a grim reaper toward the trembling Hibara. Come here. Senior, can't you help me? I'm going to eat and then go to school. What? It's 7 p.m. now. It's morning 7 a.m. Nanami corrected the sense of time for his classmate who had fled due to an all-night mission and excessive training. Zoro would soon eat and then catch the school shuttle bus. Accepting his fate, Hebara stood up and said to Zoro, Have a good day, senior. And please get along well with my little sister too. Hebara Yum could see spirits, and he worried she might be bullied. With Zoro around, he felt reassured. Toji glanced at Zoro. You keep getting along with his sister? Yeah. There's a sports festival soon, and we're doing tug of war with her class. We'll practice that and eat together. Yesterday, he was all fired up about his class winning the tug of war unfortunately for Yume. With Zoro in his class, it was a foregone conclusion that Zoro's class would win. He didn't plan to go all out, though. What if the kids got hurt? Yume, with a keen sense of direction, could always find Zoro wandering around places like storerooms during school excursions. She would then guide him on the right path. Yume was good at finding new paths and walking in a straight direction. In many ways, she had a sense of direction opposite to Zoro's. Knowing this well, Toji said seriously, Yeah, keep being friends. Ah, from a corner of the dojo, Megumi, who had been nodding off while watching Tsumiki, shuffled towards Zoro. Brother, hug before I go to sleep. Me too. Zoro set down his two wooden swords, and hugged the two children who jumped into his arms. Between the smell of sweat and milk, there was the warm scent of spring. A few days later, after Zoro had dominated most of the events at the school sports festival, except for running, he returned to the Jujutsu High. Zoro took off the paper crown he had won as a prize, and looked at the building, or what had been won. Before he went to school, the building had been intact, but now it had a huge, donut-shaped hole through it. Inside the hole, a few bricks that once formed a wall rolled around. The forest behind it also had a round hole, just like a donut. Using his observation haki, Zoro felt a clear trace of sorcery. Having recently attended basic theory classes on sorcery with Nanami and Habara, Zoro knew what to call this. Remnant impurity. A trace that inevitably remains at the scene when someone possesses a strong cursed object for a long time or uses a sorcery technique. Zoro recalled Yaga's explanation. Naturally, the remnant impurity left behind varies with each sorcerer and technique. Zoro knew well whose and which techniques remnant impurity this was. The technique itself is new to me. Clearly, it was a trace created by Satoru's limitless sorcery. Fortunately, there's no sign of anyone being hurt. Such an impact would be difficult to block even with Zoro's armament haki. If it was Zoro, he wouldn't block, he'd choose a different method. Raise your hand properly, Satoru. Yaga's voice came from somewhere. Zoro quickly moved in that direction. Well, at least that's what he thought. Why did I end up here? Zoro returned to the Tori gate at the entrance of the school, scratching his head in confusion. From a distance, Nanami and Hibara approached together. Hibara, drinking a can of cola, waved energetically at Zoro. Senior Zoro, are you heading home already? Yeah. Yume was so sure she'd win at the sports festival today. Did you let her win? No. The world of competition is harsh. Zoro had tried hard in all the events, winning most of them as long as it didn't harm the other children. Because Yume was teary about her class losing at tug of war, I eventually gave the prize to her. Seeing her tears stop as soon as she received the prize, made it seem like she just wanted the prize. It didn't matter much. After all, it was something Zoro wouldn't use anyway. Where are you going? I heard Yaga's voice. From where Satoru, 
The faint roar of Yaga echoed from a distance, and both Nanami and Hebara immediately grasped the situation. Nanami muttered something. It looks like Senior Gorjo caused another incident. There's a hole in one of the buildings. That's serious. And the forest behind it too. Really Nanami shook his head in dismay inside. Now that something had happened, they had to check it out. Do you know what used to be there? Not sure. There are only a few bricks left. I see. Nanami made a mental note. If it turned out that the demolished building was his room, he would grab Gorjo by the collar, senior or not, and slam him into the ground. He wasn't sure how he would break through Gorjo's limitless technique, though. Nanami grabbed one of Zoro's hands, and Habara grabbed the other. Caught between the two, Zoro blinked. You can let go. No, you can't. You can't, senior. Nanami and Hibara firmly stated together. To Zoro's questioning look, Hibara confidently explained. Because, if we let go, you'll get lost. What? As they walked briskly, the trio finally reached the scene Zoro had discovered. Wow, really, only bricks are left. Nanami looked at the gutted building with a nauseated expression. What on earth had happened here? Could someone have been hurt? There's no sign of that, Zoro stated firmly. If there had been, they would have checked the safety of their families and the school students first. As Nanami scanned the surroundings, he saw Toji walking toward them, holding hands with Megumi and Tsumiki. Hey, son, did you see this? Just now, the young master really made a mess. Toji chuckled. Curious, Zoro asked, what kind of mess? The guy, he drank. What? Ha! Huh. Zoro jumped on the spot. He drank while I was away. Zoro's outcry echoed through the Jujutsu High. Gorjo Satoru had been curious about the taste of alcohol for a long time. The elders of the Gorjo family, or old fogies as Satoru called them, often drank alcohol. They drank during happy times, sad times, when they were angry, and when there was something to celebrate. They drank when the Zenin family got the better of them, and when the Kamo family did the same. They always drank. As a child curious about everything, young Gorjo Satoru is always boldly told his family members, I want to try drinking alcohol. But even the Gorjo family, which doted on Satoru, wasn't crazy enough to give alcohol to a precious and rare six-eyed sorcerer born once in 400 years. Faced with strong opposition for the first time in his life, Satoru ultimately did not get to drink. So, he resolved that once he was away from his family, he would definitely try alcohol. This morning, Satoru had cunningly convinced a classmate to buy alcohol from a convenience store. The reason for doing it this morning was simple. Yaga, Toji, Nanami, Habara, and Zoro were all away from school. Satoru, who drew attention wherever he went, distracted the convenience store clerk, while Suguri used a curse to sneakily take the alcohol. They did pay for it, though, they left the money on the counter using a curse. Satoru sat in his dorm room, excited about drinking for the first time, and asked his classmate to bring some snacks. While Jito and Yeri went out to get them, Satoru opened a bottle of sake and drank it alone. And, I'm drunk. I'm really drunk. Jito and Yeri knelt, hands raised, coldly glaring at Gorjo, who was face down on the floor in an air raid shelter position. Jito was grinding his teeth. He said we'd drink together. It was unbelievable not only that Gorjo had guzzled down the sake while they were out getting snacks, but also that he had gotten drunk and caused a ruckus in that short time. He hadn't drunk much. Just three sips. Yes, just three sips and he was drunk. Of course, the sake was strong. It was 30% alcohol. Even so, getting drunk after just three sips was not normal. Overwhelmed by the unfamiliar sensation of being drunk, Satoru felt dizzy and screamed at the top of his lungs. Suffering from dizziness and a headache, he made a choice he would never usually consider due to his drunkenness. He decided to eliminate the cause of his misery with the best technique he could manage. Use the purple technique. It combines the lapsed blue and the reversal red sorcery. Gorjo proudly explained, but Nanami frowned. It was a formidable technique. However, did you unleash that on the alcohol? Yeah, and my room too, Yeri said calmly. Naturally, the alcohol was completely annihilated by the powerful purple technique Gorjo unleashed. The problem was that not only the alcohol in Gorjo's room were destroyed, but the forest behind it as well. Thanks to that, Jito and Yeri, who hadn't even had a sip of the alcohol, ended up getting scolded by Yaga who came nearby and witnessed everything. Gorjo winced from the throbbing pain in his head and muttered resentfully. It wouldn't be so frustrating if it had at least tasted good. Keep it down, Satoru. Who told you to drink at that age? I won't drink anymore. It's just bitter and tastes awful. Just makes my head spin. Ugh. Being sensitive to alcohol was bad enough. But what was worse for Satoru was the headache that came with being drunk. Due to his six eyes, not using reverse cursed energy techniques, already made his head hurt just from keeping his eyes open. The alcohol made the pain even worse. Toji, for the first time, deeply empathized with Satoru's words as he too disliked alcohol. 
Though the reason I dislike it is different from that guy. Unlike Satoru, who was weak to alcohol, Toji found it extremely difficult to get drunk due to his constitution. Alcohol is a kind of poison, and his body naturally detoxified it. In that sense for Toji, alcohol was nothing more than a bitter and tasteless liquid. What a waste. Zoro genuinely felt it was a waste. To just blow away the alcohol, when it's so hard for a young one to get it. Click, Zoro smacked his lips. It tastes good. Feeling a sudden unease at the earnest remark, Toji swiftly turned his head towards Zoro. How would you know that? Don't tell me you've tried it. Tell the truth, you rogue Marimo. I haven't. At least not with this body. Nanami knelt in front of Zoro, leveling his eyes with him, and spoke seriously. Senior, you must not become like Senior Gorjo. Never. It's a disaster. What? Nanami. What did you just say? Agreed. Zoro, don't be like him. You were in on it too, Shoko. I never said to drink alone and make a scene while drunk. Yaga, perhaps suffering from a headache, pressed his temples with his palm as large as a pot lid. Sumiki, with wide eyes, asked, Mr. Yaga, does your head hurt? It's okay. Really? Dad also gets headaches because of my brother like that? At the innocent question from Tsumiki, Yaga turned his head to look at Toji. Toji, just like Yaga had done earlier, was pressing his forehead with his fingers. Their eyes met. A strange sense of camaraderie flowed between them. It was the camaraderie of guardians dealing with troublemakers. Yeri surreptitiously lowered his arm, noticing the mood. Seeing this, Jito followed suit. Gorjo stopped the air raid shelter pose, rubbed his head, and stood up, just as Yaga's sharp gaze landed on him. Regardless of being classmates and friends, Jito deliberately addressed Yaga to divert his attention. Teacher, didn't you come to tell us something? Yaga sighed deeply. In two weeks, there's an exchange event. An exchange event. An exchange meeting with the sister school. It's held with the Kyoto Jujutsu High. It hadn't taken place last year. But this time it was essential according to the upper echelons. The reasons for insisting on the exchange were unclear. But when did the higher-ups ever bother to explain their reasons to the sorcerers below? Gorjo, massaging his tingling scalp, said, Isn't that event for the second and third years? Our numbers should match up with theirs. The reason last year's exchange wasn't held was also due to the number of participants. Last year, there was only one third year student, Yutam, enrolled at the Tokyo Jujutsu High. In contrast, the Kyoto Jujutsu High had three second year students. If there hadn't been any deaths or retirements, it was clear that those three second years from Kyoto would have become third years as the year changed. We'd need to have no second years on their side for it to be three against three. I heard there are currently three second year students at the Kyoto Jujutsu High. That would make it three against six. Then, getting cold feet, Suguru. Of course not. Just a simple question. Jito responded calmly. He was confident they could sweep any exchange event, no matter how many came. With not just him, but also Satoru and Shoko around, there was little to worry about. So, this time, the first years will go instead of the third years. Nanami blinked twice before managing to speak. Excuse me. Wow, does that mean we're going to Kyoto? Hibaro asked cheerily, and Jaga nodded. Since Kyoto Jujutsu High won the last held exchange, this time it's our turn to go to Kyoto. Nanami, who had been puzzled, suddenly felt something was off and spoke up. Mr. Yaga, didn't you say there are six on the Kyoto side? That's right, but there are only five of us from Tokyo. There were two first years and three second years, totaling five. That was one less than Kyoto Jujutsu High. Is Senior Yutam or Mei Mei going with us? It's likely. Yutam is currently on a business trip in Tohoku, and Senior Mei Mei is also busy. As Shoko stated the facts, Yaga grimaced. That's why I'm worried. The upper echelons had casually suggested sending a young sorcerer from the Tokyo Jujutsu High, but it wasn't easy. Sending either Yutam or Mei Mei to the exchange did not quite fit with their mission schedules or the purpose of the exchange, which was to expose lower years to a major sorcerer event. Gorjo stopped rubbing his head and turned to Zoro with a sly smile before speaking. Zoro, want to go to the exchange together? Toji grimaced and pulled Zoro into his arms, holding him like a father bear growling protectively with a cub in his embrace. He spoke in a low voice. Don't get the kid overly excited. Over protection, huh? If the exchange is happening, you'll have to go to Kyoto too, Toji. You can't leave Zoro alone. It'd be good for you to participate while you're at it. Toji glanced at Yaga as if asking for confirmation. Yaga understood Toji's intent and nodded. When the exchange took place, all faculty members from both schools were required to go to the hosting school. Zoro, still held in Toji's strong arms, asked, What do we do there? From what I've heard, there are individual and team competitions. The team competition involves catching curses as school teams, and the individual competition is literally fighting until only one person is left. 
Hearing about the individual competition, Zoro seemed intrigued and chuckled, have another go at it. Weren't you left feeling unsatisfied last time? Before Zoro could respond, Toji turned him around to face him. As Zoro tilted his head slightly to the right as if asking why, Toji was momentarily speechless. It was a gesture Cher had shown in front of Toji a long time ago. Why, Toji? Toji cupped Zoro's face between his palms. Seeing his son, who looked like a marimo trap between rocks, and still finding him cute, Toji admitted to himself that his love was indeed blinding. He'll change as he grows. Being cute when small is a trait of mammals. How big Zoro would grow, Toji wasn't sure. But given he had Toji's blood, he wouldn't be small. When he's a big man, he might not be so conspicuous to my eyes. One fact Toji overlooked was that he had never found young creatures particularly cute. It was his love that made Zoro appear adorable to him. True to Toji's nature, rarely loving someone but not changing his heart once he does, his thick love would likely last much longer than he anticipated. Even when the still small Marimo grows to resemble Toji's physique and starts being called another gorilla. Unaware of this, Toji pressed Zoro's cheeks with his palms and muttered, just like your mother. But still, some things can't happen. What can't? What? Don't do anything dangerous. It's not dangerous. While Satoru might not be entirely sane, he was definitely not someone who would use lethal techniques against a friend, let alone a young child. He wasn't careless enough to cause harm by mistake. The same went for Suguru. As for Shoko, she had no interest in exchanging blows with others. As for Nanami and Hibara, frankly, even if they each found a powerful devil fruit somewhere, they wouldn't be a match for Zoro. Neither lacked talent in combat, but they were still too green. I don't know much about the Kyoto side, but Zoro asked Gorjo, are the guys at Kyoto Jujutsu High strong? Who knows? They're probably not as strong as us. If there was someone that strong at Kyoto Jujutsu High, we would have heard rumors by now. At the Jujutsu High, being a grade 2 sorcerer upon admission makes you a genius and anything above grade 1 makes you a monster. It's not for nothing that Satoru and Suguru, who quickly reached grade 1 after enrolling, are called troublemakers, but the strongest. Well, Gorjo and Jito weren't actually the strongest back then, and there could have been strong people who weren't known. Gorjo looked at Toji, the person in question. The overprotective gorilla, still thick-skinned from love, looked anxious even after hearing the earlier conversation. His overprotectiveness was quite severe even considering Zoro was just a kid and prone to getting lost. Honestly, Zoro seems like he could chew up iron. Zoro turned to Toji and said, Did you hear? It's not dangerous. I want to go. Zoro declared firmly. Toji tried to dissuade him again. Even so, I'm not in danger. If anything, it would be dangerous for them. Toji couldn't argue with that. Even with his biased love, Toji knew that if there was a fight, it wouldn't be Zoro who would get beaten up. Toji clicked his tongue. Always have to win to satisfy your temper, my silly Marimo. Who's silly? Megumi, who had marched up with a sulky face, stood in front of Toji, hands on his hips, and tried to sound stern. Brother isn't silly. What? Too jai. Sorry. Done. E-H-K. Fahaha. Jito and Gorjo couldn't help but burst into laughter. Ah, these kids. Shoko shook her head in disbelief as she watched her classmates. He 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 he. Laughing so hard he had to hold his stomach and roll on the floor. Gorjo made Toji so mad he almost stomped on him. But seeing Tsumiki giggling next to Megumi, somehow he just didn't have the heart to do it. Feeling a mix of absurdity, an odd sense of injustice, and a faint warmth Toji tousled Zoro's hair roughly. It's all because of you, you know. My round little Marimo. That's really too bad, Zoro said in a voice not sorry at all. Habara laughed and added, you really have a good relationship with your son. Yeah, Nanami couldn't help but feel relieved. In this crazy world, there seemed to be one or two things that weren't mad. And exactly three seconds later, he regretted having that thought. Toji, who had been tugging at Zoro's cheek in revenge, though he barely applied any force for fear of hurting him, looked at the first-year students with gleaming eyes and said, From tomorrow, you're all starting special training. Excuse me, you have to face third years, right? Then we need to intensify the training right away. I can't stand to see my students losing. Toji said this with a menacing smile. Nanami and Hibara felt a shiver run down their spines at that smile. Toji's reasoning seemed plausible, or at least it wasn't unreasonable. But no matter how you looked at it, this was Hibara's eyes widened and he jumped up. Are you taking out your frustration on us because of what happened with your son frustration? I've already disciplined my Marimo, Toji asserted confidently. Of course, that discipline had involved nothing more than ruffling his hair and fiddling with his cheek, which for Toji was an unusually affectionate form of punishment. And he hadn't even punished the very young and vulnerable Megumi. For Toji, 
who saw a stark difference between family and others as significant as the difference between this world and the next it was a natural course of action. Toji cracked his knuckles loudly. Brace yourselves. For the next two weeks, I'll show you what real combat experience is like. Quick to grasp the situation, Hibara shouted at Zoro. Senior Zoro, save us. Sure. I'll protect you when we're not at school. What? Nanami's mind raced. Zoro, being a good kid, tried not to miss school. So he usually left for school on the shuttle bus by 8am at the latest. And he often returned to the Jujutsu High by around 2pm. That meant they could potentially be at Toji's mercy for at least 6 hours on weekdays. They might be lucky if Toji or they had missions. So that there was no time for training. But seeing Toji burning with enthusiasm right now. The prospects didn't look bright. Nanami stated calmly, we're screwed. Huh. Nanami, what did you say? We're SCR. Watch your mouth. There are kids here, Nanami. Toji warned him. Of course, Nanami felt it was unfair. Who was it that created this swear-worthy situation? After all, Jito glanced at the two juniors trembling in front of Toji, then sneakily looked at Yeri. Shoko, should we intervene? Nah, you'll get dragged into it too. You know what his temper is like. But with their seniors, we should be kind to our juniors. Being too kind might just lead to us losing at the exchange because of them. Ah, that's a point. Hey, hey, hey. Satoru, stop laughing now. Yaga held his aching stomach as he watched the entire chaotic scene. It seemed he might need to switch to a stronger antacid. Two weeks later, on the day they were heading to the Kyoto Jujutsu High. Hello. Hi, senior. Zoro stared at Hibara, who was smiling brightly in front of the chartered bus. Despite his cheerful smile, Hibara seemed to be emanating a dark aura. Nanami was no different. Given what they've been through the past two weeks, that's understandable. The training up to now was like child's play, compared to how mercilessly Toji pushed them. Zoro did his best to protect them, but Toji cleverly exploited the times Zoro was at school to push Nanami and Hibara to their limits. Their training was reminiscent of the days with Mihek in a previous life. I train like that with him too. Of course, Toji was slightly more merciful than Mihek. Unlike Mihek, who, with a somewhat fatalistic view, had slashed Zoro's left eye thinking if the boy died or was seriously injured, that was as far as he'd go, Toji did not inflict permanent physical injuries on them. The flow of their energy has clearly changed from two weeks ago. While they couldn't completely control the flow of their energy like Satoru or Suguru, at least they didn't feel green anymore. It was honestly surprising. Zoro watched Toji adjusting Tsumiki's yellow picnic hat. I noticed this last time too. But you're pretty good at this teacher thing, Dad. Toji shrugged. I have my moments. Hearing Toji's words, Nanami and Hibara shuddered. If being a good teacher twice means risking the students' lives, they really were in danger. For real, Nanami, about to ask if Zoro was serious, closed his mouth upon seeing Zoro's composed face. Of course, he was serious. The boy didn't make idle remarks often, and when he did, it was obviously not sincere. Nanami sighed. I need to graduate and leave this place soon. You can leave now. Then wouldn't I be treated as a deserter? Zoro pondered for a moment before responding. What if I said I was bullying you? Caught off guard by the unexpected suggestion, Nanami was speechless. But Hibara interjected. That's not true. I don't really care what people call me. No, I don't want you to take the blame. Hibara stated his disapproval firmly, and Zoro nodded, choosing not to argue further. From experience, Zoro knew to respect when someone said no and to back off gracefully. We've gotten stronger too. Please rely on us a little, senior. Hibara proudly flexed his slightly more muscular arm. Gorjo, swaggering over with his long limbs, snorted. Stronger. You've barely scraped off the newbie label. Ah, but you're not as weak as before. You've gotten somewhat less weak. Gorjo's harsh assessment was tempered when Jito put a hand on his shoulder. Satoru, that's not nice to say to your juniors. You should encourage their growth. EFFT. Does encouragement make them grow? As the two towering students bickered at the bus door, Shoko, who had arrived with her bag, sighed. Both of you move aside, you idiots. Because of you, no one can board the bus. Shoko then delivered a low kick towards their shins. The bus to Kyoto was bustling with noise. But why are we taking a bus? Nanami suddenly asked. There's the Shinkansen, and although more expensive, there are also planes. Shoko responded with a... Well, Mr. Yaga made an impulse purchase. Excuse me, he had a fight with his wife that day. When Nanami looked at Yaga, he cleared his throat and averted his gaze. There was no denying it. Taking the Shinkansen would have been much faster and cost effective. But as Shoko said, the decision to charter a bus was heavily influenced by Yaga. 
having had a bad day due to a fight with his wife. Shoko shrugged her shoulders. Well, it's good not to draw attention, right? You won't see anyone bothering Gorjo. Why would they bother Senior Gorjo? Because he's pretty handsome. Being in crowded places naturally attracted attention, and though rare, there were people who tried to get Gorjo's number. Toji was also handsome but his fierce demeanor made it difficult for ordinary people to approach him. Moreover, if he felt annoyed, he could erase his presence completely. He often did this, especially when he was with the kids. Gorjo sighed dramatically and shook his head. This darn popularity. As Shoko and Jito grimaced and Nanami looked on, Habara, who had brought a bag of chocolates, raised it high with a cheerful shout. Who wants chocolate? Me. Me too. I'll have some too. Watching the second year students munching on the chocolates, Yaga smiled gently. Though they were rambunctious, they shone brightest when being true students. Me too. Not you. Toji gently grabbed and lowered Sumiki's eagerly raised hand. Megumi, who didn't particularly like sweets, blinked and shook his head. Senior Zoro, do you want some too? No. Oh, don't you like chocolate? Zoro doesn't really like sweet things. Gorjo popped a chocolate into his mouth and said, I don't understand why you wouldn't eat something this good. Hibara asked brightly. Then what kind of food do you like, Senior Zoro? Rice. Especially plain white rice without any mixed grains. He used to like sea creature meat in the past. Since such creatures didn't exist in this world, he couldn't eat it anymore. Anything that goes well with alcohol is fine too. Alcohol is a no-go. Got it. At Toji's words, Zoro pouted. Hibara then spoke to Zoro. I know a great place for food. Let's go together sometime. Sounds good. What do they sell there? They serve rice and noodles. Especially the grilled salmon set and the meat noodles are delicious. Oh, really? Maybe I'll join too. Suguru, me too. Sure. Speaking of which, where will we eat when we go to Kyoto? Gorjo, isn't your family from Kyoto? Know any good places? I don't know. I almost always ate at home. Kyoto. Toji mulled over the name of their destination. He had never thought he would return there on his own accord. Of course, they were headed to Kyoto Jujutsu High, not the Zenin family's place. Lost in thought, Toji felt someone poke his cheek. Turning around, he saw Megumi looking at him. Papa's acting weird. What is? Your face. Smile. Megumi reached out, grabbed Toji's cheeks and pulled the corners of his mouth up into a smile. Of course, even with all her might, the still babyish Megumi could barely move the cheek muscles of the robust Toji. Oh really? Papa, you look uglier when you don't smile. You too, my little sea urchin. I'm not a sea urchin. Stop teasing Megumi. As the bus grew noisy, Nanami noticed that Zoro hadn't buckled his seatbelt and fastened it for him. Ah, thanks. You're welcome. His face looked young and pale. It was hard to believe that this was the person who had claimed to be responsible for harassing someone, as he seemed just like a child. Nanami hesitated for a moment before speaking. You can act like a child, because you actually are a child. A child shouldn't have to do things for adults, nor should they have to bear the responsibility for what adults do. Zoro chuckled lightly. If I acted any more childish here, it would be really troublesome. I don't think you will. Hum, I don't think you're a bad person. It was ambiguous to call him good, but he definitely wasn't bad. If he truly were bad, he wouldn't have suggested claiming he was harassing Nanami, just to help him leave this place faster. Though his methods might be harsh and somewhat unilateral, Zoro always intended to help people. You can rely on others. After all, he was at an age where it was not just okay, but necessary. Nanami sighed as he remembered how recently Zoro had walked in the exact opposite direction he had pointed, especially when walking. Please rely on someone. Huh, maybe you should carry a compass. Maybe that would prevent him from getting lost. Seeing hope in Nanami's expression, Gorjo shook his head in disbelief. You still don't understand. Do you think a compass would keep him from getting lost? That's unfortunate. Shem PH Zoro looked at Toji. But in this matter Toji, who showed no intention of siding with Zoro, said seriously, how about carrying a GPS? Son. That way, Toji wouldn't have to worry every time about Zoro getting lost. Zoro, his face turning red, yelled at Toji, be quiet. Upon finally arriving at the Kyoto Jujutsu High, Toji encountered someone he was not pleased to see. Gorjo, who had gotten off the bus first, frowned. Why is that guy here? As soon as Toji stepped off the bus, he instinctively hid the kids behind him upon seeing a familiar face. Zoro sensed his hesitation, but Toji did not want to expose his child to that person. Toji glared at the person in front of him. The boy with straw-colored hair appeared to be around Gorjo's age and emanated a sense of deja vu, especially his distinctive eyes and the palpable energy. It was a zenin. Hey, are you deaf? Why are you here? Don't tell me you've enrolled at the Kyoto Jujutsu High. 
The boy, ignoring Gorjo's provocative tone, walked slowly out from among the staff of the Kyoto Jujutsu High. His pupils dilated, and his hands trembled as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was clearly a reaction of awe. The boy stuttered a few times before finally managing to ask, Is it really really Toji-san? Faced with a familiar address, Toji scowled. Who are you again? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.